Hey guys, good evening and welcome back, welcome back again to your Unacademy Native English channel. I hope all of you are doing amazing, all of you are doing great. So people, quickly, let me know in the chats if all of you can hear me. If I am perfectly audible and visible to every one of you, quickly let me know in the chats with some fire emojis. Yes, with some fire emojis, quickly in the chats. Let me know quickly in the chats if all of you can hear me, people. With some fire emojis. Yeah. So what's up? How are you all doing? What's happening, people? What's happening? <clears throat> What is happening? <clears throat> I believe every one of you are doing wonderful, are doing great. So my dear students, as you all must be knowing, today it's going to be our day 27, right? It is going to be our day 27 of the series Game of Need. So till now we are done with 26 chapters of your physics, chemistry, biology, right? And my dear students, today it's going to be the 27th chapter which we are going to do. Yeah? Well, it does not feel like that we have almost completed, we have completed 26 chapters yet. <laughs> yeah? Right? And I'm amazed, like, till now, students are following this particular series with 100% dedication with 100% honesty. That's amazing. I would want you guys to have the same Josh throughout this particular NEAT 2024 journey, right? Some four months are left. Let's utilize these four months properly so that we can score really good when it comes to the NEAT 2024 examination, right? So the chapter which I'll be doing today that is going to be solution. One of the important chapters, I would say in your physical chemistry part. You can expect some two to three questions, right, in this year NEET 2024 examination from this particular chapter as well. And as you all must be doing, this chapter again, we are going to start from the basics, from the scratch, right? If you have studied this chapter before, or if you have not studied this chapter before, no worries at all. Everything will be done and dusted in detail, that too from the basics, from the scratch. Whatever theory is involved, whatever problem patterns are involved in this particular chapter, I'll be doing every single thing in this particular session. And people are asking, can J students watch this session as well? Absolutely, you guys are most welcome. You guys are most welcome too. Yeah? Perfect. And people, what is going to be the duration of the daily session? Let me tell you, this chapter might take 7 hours, 8 hours. I have no idea how much, how much time it's going to take. But till the chapter gets completed, I'll be with you. Right? I'll be teaching you and I would want you guys to be with me till the end of the session. So are you guys ready? Are you guys ready people? Are you guys ready? Yeah? Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready with your pen and paper? Yes, quickly in the chats. In the chats people. In the chats, in the chats, I want the chat rate to be super high. I want the chat rate to be super high. Are you all ready with your pen and paper? Quickly, everyone. Let me see the josh of the session first. Let me see the josh of the session first. Wonderful. And the ones who have not smashed that, that like button yet, I would want you guys to smash that like right now. Yes. Yes, smash that like button right now and mark your attendance. Every one of you. 
and you know everyone means everyone yeah everyone means everyone <laughs> people are copying my dialogue everyone means everyone yeah Perfect. Just give me a second and we shall be starting. Just a second, people. Just a second. Just a second. <coughs> All right. So, guys, let me quickly show you the topics which we shall be covering in the today's session. Have a look exactly on the session flow. Right? From where exactly we are going to start until what topic we are going to cover. We are going to cover the whole chapter. We shall be starting with the first topic that is your concentration terms. We shall be discussing the terminologies which are related to liquid solutions, which involves the vapor pressure, boiling point, freezing point, etc. etc. Right? Apart from that, we shall be discussing the Rolls law and its applications. After doing the Rolls law, we shall be doing the ideal, non-ideal solutions, their examples, their problem patterns. Then we shall be moving on to the colligative properties. The first colligative property which we shall be discussing, that's going to be the relative lowering in vapor pressure. Then comes your elevation in boiling point. Then comes your depression in freezing point. And then it's going to be the osmotic pressure. And my dear students, at the end of the session, at the end of the session, it is going to be the most important topic of this particular chapter which we shall be covering that is going to be the Van Hoff's factor. So this is going to be the session flow. These are the topics which we shall be covering in the today's chapter that is solution. So everyone in the chats, are you all ready? Are you all ready with me? Are you all ready with me? Again, I'm repeating the same thing. Duration of the session, I have no idea. I have no idea. It might take seven hours. It might take eight hours. It might take nine hours. It might take six hours also. Who knows? Yeah, it is just you have to be with me till the end. Perfect. So let me have some water and let's get going. <clears throat> All right, people. So let's get going with the first topic of the session that is going to be your concentration terms. Okay. Well, first of all, before starting the concentration terms, let me quickly give you certain basic things which are required to understand the concentration terms. Let me exactly give you some basic things which are required to understand this particular topic that is concentration terms. My dear people, every one of you must be knowing what exactly a solution is, right? As you all must be familiar with the fact, solution, it exactly has got two components. Solution consists of two components exactly. You must be knowing this. This is complete basics. One is called as solute and one is called as solvent. One is called as solute and one is called as solvent. What is a solute? What is a solvent? Let's get to know about that. My dear students, solute is basically that component of the solution which is present in lesser amount. That component of the solution which is present in lesser amount, we call that component of the solution as solute. Similarly, what is a solvent? Solvent is basically that component of the solution which is present in larger amount. Which is present in larger amount. Perfect. So solution, it consists of two components. One is called a solute, one is called a solvent. Generally, solute is present in lesser amount and your solvent is present in larger amount. Point number one. Point number two, related to solvent. Point number two, related to solvent. Do remember, do remember the state of solution, the state of solution is same is same as that of is same as that of the state of solvent state of solution is same as that of state of solvent 
what exactly is meant by this particular term. Let's have a look over this. For example, my dear students, let's say I'm taking sugar. And you know, what is the state of sugar? It is solid. Over here, I'm going to introduce this sugar into water. Let's say this is H2O liquid. Let's say this is H2O liquid, right? First thing, imagine that I have taken some 5 grams of sugar, right? I'm going to introduce these 5 grams of sugar in 100 ml of water. What I'll be getting exactly? When I'll be introducing the sugar into water, I'll be getting a solution. I'll be getting a solution. Now, if you ask me, what is going to be the state? What is going to be the physical state of this particular solution? As I told you, the state of solution will be same as that of state of solvent. So, since the physical state of solvent is liquid over here, so I would say the physical state of solution, it's again going to be liquid only. It is again going to be liquid only. So, do remember whatever is going to be the state of solvent, same is going to be the state of solution. This is one very important point, which I would want you guys to remember from now on. Okay? Perfect. Point number one. Point number two, in this particular chapter, solvent I'll be representing by number one and solute I'll be representing by number two. This is one more important thing and basic thing, right? In order to reduce the calculations afterwards, we'll be using this particular point. Solvent will be representing with number one or you can represent solvent by A, solute by number two or B. The choice is all yours. Again, I'm telling you. Solvent is represented by number one or letter A. Solute is represented by number two or letter B. Correct? My dear students, in this particular chapter, whenever you see a term W written anywhere, W, W, W in this particular chapter, it stands for what? It stands for the mass of substance. W stands for the mass of substance in grams. Point number one. Whenever you see a term E, E stands for equivalent mass of the substance. Equivalent mass of the substance. Similarly, my dear students, whenever in this particular chapter you see a term N, N stands for the number of moles. N stands for the number of moles. Now, if this particular point is clear, if this particular point is clear, then there is one more thing that is mm, which stands for what? Which stands for the molar mass of the substance. Okay. Now you tell me in the charts. For example, if I'm writing something like this, if I'm writing W2, can you let me know the meaning of W2 here? What is going to be the meaning of W2? You know, W stands for mass and 2 stands for salute. So W2, what is its significance? W2 simply stands for the mass of solute. It stands for the mass of solute in grams. Correct? For example, for example, I'm writing N1. What is meant by the term N1? First of all, N stands for moles and 1 stands for solvent. So this N1 will be representing the number of moles of solvent. The number of moles of solvent. Similarly, for example, if I write, if I write E2, what is E2? E stands for equivalent mass, 2 stands for solute. So E2 stands for the equivalent mass of the solute. Correct? I believe these basic things are absolutely clear to you. I believe these basic things are absolutely clear to you. Right? And people, at the same time, let me add up one more thing. Since I told you solution, it consists of solute and solvent. Solution consists of solute and solvent. Do remember, mass of the solution is always equal. Mass of the solution is always equal. The mass of solute plus the mass of solvent. Mass of solution, it is always equal to the mass of solute plus the mass of solvent. This is one more thing which I would want to share with you. I believe this is clear. Apart from this, there are some basic more terminologies which you must know, which you must know. My dear still students, somewhere in this particular chapter, you will come across a term, binary solution. You will come across a term, binary solution. Or somewhere, it will be mentioned that we have got a ternary solution. 
or somewhere it will be mentioned that we have got a quaternary solution. Right? Somewhere in this particular chapter, you will find a term written as aqueous solution. What is meant by these particular solutions? What is a binary solution? What is a ternary solution? What is a quaternary solution? What is an aqueous solution? You should know their meanings as well. My dear students, binary solution is the one which consists of two components exactly. Binary solution, it consists of two components. And in these two components, one component will be solute and one more component will be solvent. One component will be solute and one more component will be solvent. If I talk about ternary solution, in case of ternary solution, how many components exactly do we have? We have exactly got three components. In the ternary solution, we have got three components, among which there will be one solvent and there will be two components of solute. Two solute components and one solvent component, right? Similarly, if you come across the term quaternary solution, quaternary solution is the one which consists of exactly four components. Which consists of how many components? Four components. And among these four components, there will be three components of solute and there will be one component of the solvent. There will be one component of the solvent, right? There will be one component of the solvent. And in the similar way, if you look at this particular terminology, the aqueous solution, what is an aqueous solution? My dear students, you will find such kind of the solution in which the solvent used, in which the solvent used is water. Whenever you see such kind of the solution in which we use water as the solvent, we shall be calling that particular solution as the aqueous solution. So I believe these four terminologies are exactly clear to you. If yes, let me know in the chats with some fire emojis quickly. Let me know in the chats with some fire emojis quickly. Quickly, people. Quickly, everyone. Yes? These are some basic things which you must be knowing before starting this particular chapter. Right? I'll be using this particular term frequently, aqueous solution. Aqueous solution is the one in which the solvent used is water. In which the solvent used is water. Perfectly fine? All right. If this is perfectly fine, then let's get going. Let's get started with the first topic. What is that going to be? That is going to be the concentration terms. That's going to be the concentration terms. Now, my dear students, in the concentration terms, what exactly do we have to study? We will have to study all the types of concentration terms. Number one, we shall be discussing molarity of dilution. We shall be discussing molarity of mixing of ideal solutions, of non-ideal solutions, right? All those things I shall be discussing in detail. So starting with the first terminology, what is that? That's going to be your weight by weight percentage. Weight by weight percentage of solute. I hope you are writing all the things with me. I want you guys to make the running notes with me. Weight by weight percentage of solute or you can call it as the mass percentage of the solute. You can call it as the mass percentage of the solute. Now, how do you exactly define this particular term? How do you exactly define this particular term? There is a simple definition which you need to remember. Weight by weight percentage of solute. It is defined as the mass of solute. The mass of solute in grams. The mass of solute in grams which is present in which is present in 100 grams of solution. The mass of solute in grams, which is present in 100 grams of solution. The mass of solute, which is present in 100 grams of solution, right? You shall be calling that as the weight by weight percentage of solute. What is meant by that? Imagine you have taken 100 grams of any solution. Imagine you have taken 100 grams of any solution, people, right? In 100 grams of solution, if you find 10 grams of solute, you can say weight by weight percentage of solute is 10. If by chance in 100 grams of solution, you find 20 grams of solute, you can say weight by weight percentage of solute is 20. 
in general, if in 100 grams of solution, you find X grams of solute, you can say weight by weight percentage of solute is X. So what is weight by weight percentage of solute? It is basically that mass of solute, which is present in 100 grams of solution. I believe this is clear. Now try to understand. Try to understand people what I'm going to talk about. Imagine this is your container which I have. Imagine I've taken the container. And in this particular container, imagine I have got a solution. Let's assume that in this container, we have got 500 grams of solution. Imagine that in this container, we have got 500 grams of solution. Now, if there is solution in the container, what does it mean? That means in the container, there will be solute as well as solvent. Evident. Since there is solution in the container, that means in the container, automatically there will be solute as well as solvent. Imagine my dear students, in 500 grams of solution, imagine there are 50 grams of solute. Imagine that 50 grams of solute are present in 500 grams of solution. This is a scenario which I've created over here. Now I'm going to write the same scenario in the form of a statement. Try to understand why am I doing it. I'll be writing something like this. 500 grams of solution. 500 grams of solution contains 50 grams of solute. 500 grams of solution contains 50 grams of solute. If I use the unitary method, can you let me know in one gram of solution? In one gram of solution, how many grams of solute will be there? Absolutely, you should be able to let me know that, right? 500 grams of solution contains 50 grams of solute. So one gram of solution contains 50 divided by 500 grams of solute, right? If I ask you, 100 grams of solution contains how much? You will say 100 grams of solution contains 50 divided by 500 multiplied by 100 grams of solute. Now, if I ask you, what exactly did we calculate here? If I ask you, what exactly did we calculate here? You should be able to understand this particular statement. What is the statement? Try to understand. I'll say, this is the mass of solute. This particular term, it is the mass of solute which is present in 100 grams of solution. And as per definition, that mass of solute which is present in 100 grams of solution, that mass of solute, that mass of solute which is present in 100 grams of solution, what do you call that as? You call that as the weight by weight percentage of solute. So indirectly, I would say that I have calculated the weight by weight percentage of the solute in the solution right why did i do this what is the need to do all this because i want to generalize a formula i do not want you guys to do this procedure every time no i just want to derive one formula what has to be the formula try to understand try to understand what has to be the formula if you want to calculate weight by weight percentage of solute one formula you can make try to understand over here in this box how many terms we have? We have got three terms. Numerator 50, denominator 500, multiplied by 100. What was this 50 exactly? This 50 was the mass of solute. So if you make the result in the numerator, you will have to write the mass of solute in grams divided by. In the denominator, what do we have? 500. What was this 500? It was the mass of solution. So in the denominator, you will be exactly writing the mass of solution in grams. And eventually, at the end, you'll be multiplying it with the number 100, right? So this is one direct result, which I would want all of you to remember from now onwards in order to calculate the weight by weight percentage of solute. So weight by weight percentage of solute in any solution is calculated like this. Mass of solute in grams divided by mass of solution in grams multiplied by 100. That's all. That's all. Is it clear, people? Is it clear, people? Is it clear to everyone? Yes. Now, similarly, 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 if I ask you, how do we calculate weight by weight percentage of solvent? You should be in a position to answer me this one. How do we calculate weight by weight percentage of solvent? It is going to be mass of solvent in grams divided by mass of solution in grams multiplied by what? Multiplied by 100. So this particular term is giving you the weight by weight percentage of solvent. As simple as that.
right perfect perfect guys i want you guys to understand how these results exactly come how do we make these results that's very important okay that is very important now people apart from this let me tell you one more simple thing i'm writing one statement over here for example i'm writing 20% weight by weight of NaOH aqueous solution. Can you try to decode this particular statement for me? You should be, you should be in a position to decode this kind of a statement. Have a look. I wrote a statement 20% weight by weight of NaOH aqueous solution. Aqueous means the solvent which we have taken that is water. So in water we have introduced NaOH. Now 20% weight by weight NaOH. What does it mean? It simply means that 20 grams of NaOH are present in are present in 100 grams of solution. Be careful with the terminologies. I'm not writing 100 grams of water. I'm writing 100 grams of solution. Right? Similarly, similarly, for example, I'm writing a statement. You need to tell me the answer in the chats. <clears throat> Let's say I'm writing 30% weight by weight of NaCl aqueous solution. What does it mean? Try to decode it quickly. Quickly people, what does it mean? You should be knowing this. It means that 30 grams of solute, which is your NaCl, 30 grams of your solute is present in 100 grams of solution. I believe every single thing still here is absolutely clear to everyone. Yes? And my dear students, take a note of one simple thing. Take a note of one simple thing. And do remember this from now onwards. What is the note? Note is pretty much simple. If you have got a binary solution, if you have got a binary solution, for the binary solution, do remember, weight by weight percentage of solute plus weight by weight percentage of solvent, it is always equal to 100. It is always equal to 100. So once you get weight by weight percentage of solute, you can easily calculate weight by weight percentage of solvent as well, right? Yes? Okay guys, is that clear to you? I believe this is clear. And these are the things which you are supposed to remember related to weight by weight, nothing else. These are the things which you have to remember, that's all. Let me know once in the chats with the fire emojis, everyone. Then only I can move on to the next terminology. First of all, I'll be giving you a lot of terminologies and then once we are done with the terminologies, then we shall be doing a lot of questions as well. Yeah? So tell me quickly. I'm moving on to the second terminology, second concentration term. What is that? That is weight by volume percentage. Weight by volume percentage of solute. Now, if I ask you how to define this particular statement, how to define this particular statement, you should be able to do it. You should be able to do it. Weight by volume percentage of solute. How do we define it? Weight by volume percentage of solute is defined as the mass of solute, the mass of solute in grams present in, present in. Now here, instead of 100 grams, I'll be writing present in 100 ml of solution. 100 ml of solution. So, so for example, you have got 100 ml of solution. Imagine in 100 ml of solution, you have got 20 grams of solute. Just imagine, in 100 ml of solution, you have got 20 grams of solute. You will say, weight by volume percentage of solute is 20. Imagine in 100 ml of solution, there are 40 grams of solute. You will say, weight by volume percentage of solute is 40. In general, if I say, in 100 ml of solution, there are x grams of solute. You will say, weight by volume percentage of solute is x. As simple as that. Right? Now guys, I am not going to derive its result. I am going to give you the result. I'm going to give you the result. Uh, Kirtana is saying board is not clearly visible. Kirt Kirtana, on my side, connectivity is all okay. Everything is okay. I can see the board is absolutely clear from my side. It is just you need to change your settings. I think you are watching it at very low resolution. Right? Just change the settings. Perfect. So people, 
what is going to be the result by means of which you can calculate weight by volume percentage of solute let me give you the result directly weight by volume percentage of solute is always equal to mass of solute in grams divided by the volume of solution in milliliters multiplied by 100 this is how exactly you can calculate weight by volume percentage of solute this is how you can calculate weight by volume percentage of solute number one number two if you want to calculate weight by volume percentage of solvent if you want to calculate weight by volume percentage of solvent you can easily do that as well you can easily do that as well it is going to be mass of solvent in grams divided by volume of solution in milliliters multiplied by 100 multiplied by 100 this is one more thing which i would want you guys to remember <clears throat> one more thing now dear students now dear students just try to decode this statement i'm writing something like this i'm writing 20 percent weight by volume of naoh aqueous solution naoh aqueous solution can you let me know what is the exact meaning of this particular statement quickly let me know the meaning of this particular statement every one of you everyone means everyone in the charts <clears throat> everyone what does it mean look at this particular terminology it is weight by volume and here I have mentioned aqueous solution. That means the solvent which is used, that is water. Right? So, I can say 20 grams of solute. 20 grams of solute are present in. Here I am not going to use 100 grams. Here I will be using 100 ml of solution. 100 ml of solution. Right? Simple and basic stuff. Simple and basic stuff I am teaching you right now. Simple and basic stuff I'm teaching you right now. Tell me the meaning of this particular thing. 30% weight by volume of NaCl aqueous solution. Quickly, let me know in the chats what is the meaning of this particular terminology. 30% weight by volume of NaCl aqueous solution. What is meant by it? I want you guys to say it. I want you guys to write it in the chats. It simply means that 30 grams of your solute, which is NaCl, is present in 100 ml of solution. So, I'm pretty much sure from now onwards, I'm pretty much sure from now onwards, you should be able to decode these sort of simple, simple statements whenever they are in your questions, right? And people, one direct result, one direct result, which is going to ease out a lot of things afterwards, which is going to ease out a lot of things afterwards when it comes to calculations. Do remember, Weight by volume percentage of solute. Weight by volume percentage of solute is always equal to weight by weight percentage of solute. Weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by density of solution. But this density of solution has to be in grams per ml. I'm not deriving this result, right? Just remember this particular result directly because. I'm going to use this result many a times afterwards. Do remember this particular thing. Okay. Weight by volume percentage of solute is always equal to weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by what? Multiplied by density of solution in grams per ml. Well, I can see we have got one amazing person in the chats. Shitij Kanik, sir. Guys, do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know this guy who is in the chats? You have no idea who is, right? And sooner or later, you are going to get one amazing surprise. Sooner or later, you are going to get one amazing surprise. Be ready for that. Be ready for that. Be ready for that. <clears throat> Be ready for that, yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, no, Ashu, I do not know which Namrata ma'am you are talking about. Can you write the full name? Maybe I would be knowing. <coughs> yeah. Soon, soon you'll get the surprise. Just wait for like 20 to 25 days.
Okay. Perfect, guys. Perfect. Perfect. I think you have guessed it correctly. Right? So let's keep it a surprise for now. Yeah? Let's keep it a surprise for now. And eventually you'll get to know about it. Eventually you are going to get to know about it. All right, people. I'm moving ahead. So I hope you have copied this particular statement as well. I shall be using this statement in the questions afterwards. Weight by volume percentage of solute is always equal to weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by what? Multiplied by density of solution. And the density of solution has to be taken in grams per ml. Yeah? Perfect. All right. Moving on to the third terminology which you must be knowing. What is that? Let's have a look. My dear students, the third terminology which I'm writing over here that is weight by, sorry, that is volume by volume percentage. That is volume by volume percentage of solute. Now, you should be in a position, you should be in a position to define this particular terminology as well. You should be in a position to define this particular terminology as well. How do we exactly define it? Let me know in the chats. It is going to be, it is defined as the volume of solute in milliliters. The volume of solute in milliliters present in present in 100 ml of solution. It is defined as the volume of solute which is present in 100 ml of solution. So imagine that you have got 100 ml of solution. Imagine that you have got 100 ml of solution. Now, my dear students, if in 100 ml of solution Imagine there are 20 ml of solute. In 100 ml of solution, imagine you have got 20 ml of solute. So you'll directly say volume by volume percentage of solute is 20. Imagine in 100 ml of solution, there are 30 ml of solute. You'll directly say volume by volume percentage of solute is 30. And in general, in general, if in 100 ml of solution, there are x ml of solute, you'll directly say volume by volume percentage of solute is x. That's all. That's all, people. That's all. Right? So I believe you can easily make the result over here. Well, I'm not deriving the result. I'm giving you the result. And it's application part. I'll be letting you know in some time. So I'm writing volume by volume percentage of solute. Volume by volume percentage of solute is equal to, is equal to volume of solute in milliliters divided by Volume of solution in milliliters multiplied by 100. Multiplied by 100. This is the result by means of which we can calculate volume by volume percentage of solute. Point number one. Point number two. If by chance you want to calculate volume by volume percentage of solvent, you can do that as well. And how exactly? You will be writing volume of solvent in milliliters divided by volume of solution in milliliters. And you'll be multiplying this particular terminology by the number 100. Eventually, you'll be getting the volume by volume percentage of solvent. Volume by volume percentage of solvent. Now you tell me. Now you tell me. I'm writing something like this. 20% volume by volume of NaOH aqueous solution. Of NaOH aqueous solution. Tell me the meaning of this particular terminology. Tell me the meaning of this particular terminology. Quickly. <clears throat> quickly guys everyone tell me the meaning of this particular terminology what does it mean quickly in the chats it means that <clears throat> it means that 20 ml of solute is exactly present in 100 ml of solution it means that 20 ml of solute is present in 100 ml of solution yes pretty much simple Pretty much simple, right? For example, I'm writing something like this. Try to decode this. I'm writing 30%. 30% volume by volume of NaOH. What is meant by this? Quickly, quickly. What, is it, what does it mean? It means that 30 ml of NaOH is present in 100 ml of solution. That's all. Nothing else. It's pretty much simple. Okay? Till now, we have covered three terminologies. I'm not going to give you the questions yet. We have to cover one more terminology. Then I'll be giving you the questions. Okay, one terminology which you would be knowing from your class 11th, what is that? That is mole fraction. 
that is mole fraction which is represented by chi my dear students tell me how do you exactly define the term mole fraction how do you define the term mole fraction quickly hello sania how are you quickly mole fraction how do you exactly define the term mole fraction so it is defined as the ratio of the ratio of moles of a component the ratio of moles of a component to that of to that of total moles present in the solution to that of total moles present in the solution now what is meant by it have a look this is very much simple and easy to understand imagine that Imagine that we have got a solution in the container. If we have got a solution in the container, that automatically tells you in the container you have got solute. And at the same time, you have got solvent as well. Now, my dear students, let's assume that, let's assume that there are N1, there are N1 moles of solvent in the solution. And there are N2 moles of solute in the solution. Just imagine it. Imagine there are N1 moles of solvent in the solution, N2 moles of solute in the solution. Now, if I want to define the mole fraction of solute, how would you define the mole fraction of solute? Quickly, mole fraction of solute will be simply equal to number of moles of solute in the solution divided by the total moles present in the solution. Divided by total moles present in the solution. Now, Number of moles of solute I'm representing with N2 divided by total moles present in the solution is just going to be N1 plus N2. N1 plus N2, right? So this particular result is going to give you the mole fraction of solute. Similarly, my dear students, if you want to calculate the mole fraction of solvent as well, you can do that. Mole fraction of solvent is equal to, is equal to, is equal to. It is going to be number of moles of solvent, which is N1, divided by total moles present in the solution, which is N1 plus N2, right? So this particular terminology is going to give you the mole fraction of solvent. Now, at the same time, at the same time, whenever you see a binary solution, whenever you see a binary solution, for the binary solution, do remember, mole fraction of solvent plus mole fraction of solute, it is always equal to 1. For the binary solution, mole fraction of solute plus mole fraction of solvent is always equal to 1, right? Perfect. This is something which you need to know. Now guys, in the questions, they might confuse you by some fancy terminologies. They might confuse you by some fancy terminologies. They might give you the data. They might use the term mole percentage. They might use the term mole percentage. Now, once you see mole percentage, you know, You'll, you'll think a lot about it, right? Mole percentage is nothing. What is it? It is mole fraction multiplied by 100. Mole percentage is nothing. It is mole fraction multiplied by 100. For example, for example, I'm defining mole percentage of solvent. It means nothing. It is just mole fraction of solvent. Multiply that term with 100. If I want to define the mole percentage of solute, you can do that as well. It is mole fraction of solute multiplied by 100, right? Whenever mole fraction is multiplied with 100, whenever mole fraction is multiplied with 100, you call it as mole percentage. You call it as mole percentage, right? Right, people? The way I told you, the sum of mole fractions, the sum of mole fractions of all the components of the solution, the sum of mole fractions of all the components in the solution is equal to 1. You know that. In the similar way, do remember, in the similar way, do remember the sum of the sum of mole percentage of all the components. The sum of mole percentage of all the components of a solution is equal to 100. Is equal to 100. This is one more statement which I would want every one of you to take a note of. All of this is clear? All of this is clear? Say yes or no in the chats. All these terminologies are clear? 
If all these terminologies are clear, let's try to solve some basic questions. Question number one on your screen. One basic question this is. One basic question this is. Look at the question carefully. Calculate the mole fraction of salute. Calculate the mole fraction of salute in 10% weight by weight of NaOH aqueous solution. So people, can you tell me what is the meaning of this particular statement? Can you tell me what is the meaning of this particular statement? What does it mean? It means simply that 10 grams of salute, 10 grams of salute are present in 100 grams of solution. That's all, right? That's all. 10 grams of salute are present in 100 grams of solution. 10 grams of salute, that means mass of salute, which we represent with W2, you got to know as 10 grams, right? If mass of solute is 10 grams, mass of solution is 100 grams, what do you think about the mass of solvent? You know, mass of solvent plus mass of solute, that's 100, right? Mass of solute plus mass of solvent, that's 100, right? So mass of solvent is going to be how much? 100 minus 10, which comes out to be 90 grams. This comes out to be 90 grams. What am I supposed to calculate? Look at it carefully. I'm supposed to calculate mole fraction of solute. This particular term I'm supposed to calculate, mole fraction of solute. And as per the result, mole fraction of solute is nothing. It is moles of solute divided by total moles present in the solution. As per the formula, you know it. Now, my dear students, in order to calculate mole fraction of solute, what do I need? I need N2 and I need the N1. N2 and N1 are to be calculated. Now, first thing, what is meant by N2? N2 means the number of moles of solute. Number of moles of solute will be mass of solute in grams divided by molar mass of solute n1 moles of solvent mass of solvent in grams divided by molar mass of solvent simple formula i'm using nothing else right now what is the mass of solute mass of solute is 10 grams divided by what is the molar mass of solute molar mass of any of which that's 40 so the value comes out to be 1 by 4 right these are the moles of solute in the solution similarly moles of solvent will be equal mass of solvent that is 90 grams. Molar mass of solvent. What is my solvent? Solvent is water. And molar mass of water, you all must be knowing that's 18. The value comes out to be 5. So you got N1 as well as N2. If you got N1 as well as N2, you can put it here in this expression. N2 value, you got to know that as 1 by 4. N1 value is 5 plus 1 by 4. The value comes out to be how much? 1 divided by 21. So 1 divided by 21 this is going to be the mole fraction of solute which I was supposed to calculate. Yes. Right, people? This is giving you the mole fraction of solute. Now, for example, in the same question, if they ask you, if they ask you to calculate mole fraction of solvent as well, how you are going to do that? You know, in case of the binary solution, chi 1 plus chi 2 value is equal to 1. Therefore, chi 1 is going to be 1 minus chi 2. It's going to be 1 minus 1 upon 21. The value comes out to be 20 divided by 21. So this is the mole fraction of solvent in the same solution. Right? Is it perfectly clear to everyone? Is it perfectly clear to everyone? Is it perfectly clear to everyone? Quickly. Quickly, my dear students, yeah? I hope these sort of questions you can easily solve from now on. This was our first type of question based on mole fraction. Second type of question. Look at the question carefully and try to solve this. Look at the question carefully and try to solve this. Look at the question carefully and try to solve this, people. Everyone. Everyone. Give it a try. Everyone. Give it a try. The question is saying that what mass of water, what mass of water in grams should be added to 16 grams of methanol to make its mole fraction as 0.25. Make its mole fraction as 0.25. What is meant by this? Have a look. Have a look, guys. Imagine this is your container. Imagine this is your container. In the container, what do we have? We have got... 16 grams of methanol. We have got 16 grams of methanol in the container. Now, as per the question, what mass of water should be added 
what mass of water should be added such that the mole fraction of methanol becomes 0.25. So basically, we have to make the mole fraction of methanol as how much? We have to make the mole fraction of methanol as 0.25 as per the equation. As per the equation, we have to make mole fraction of methanol as 0.25. Now they are asking us, how many grams of water are required to make the mole fraction of methanol as 0.25? Let's assume, let's assume x grams of water are required. Let's assume that x grams of water are required to make the mole fraction of methanol as 0.25. Let's do this assumption. Let's use this assumption, right? Let's use this assumption. Assumption is, I am adding x grams of water. I'm adding x grams of water to 16 grams of methanol. Then only its mole fraction is becoming 0.25. This is my assumption, right? So people, the question is done and dusted. If I ask you now, if I ask you now, if I ask you now, how many grams of methanol are there in the container? You'll say, there are 16 grams of methanol in the container. If I ask you how many grams of water are there in the container, you will say x grams of water are there in the container. We have added x grams of water. Then only mole fraction of methanol is coming out to be 0.25. Now people tell me one thing. Mole fraction of methanol means number of moles of methanol divided by total moles. Divided by total moles in the container. As per the formula, this has to be equal to 0.25, right? Moles of methanol. Do we know the moles of methanol? No. Let's exactly get to know how many moles of methanol are there in the container. Number of moles of methanol will be equal to mass of methanol in grams divided by molar mass of methanol. The value comes out to be 0.5. Right? Similarly, how many moles of water are there in the container? Mass of water in the container. That's x divided by molar mass of water. That's 18. Right? Right, people? Perfect. Now, you got number of moles of methanol, you got number of moles of water. Put these two terms in this expression. So, what will I get from here? Moles of methanol in the container, 0.5 divided by moles of methanol, that's 0.5. Moles of water, x divided by 18, the value is coming out to be 0.25. Do the cross multiplication part and get the value of x. And when you solve this, the value of x comes out to be 27 grams. So, can you let me know the meaning of this 27 grams? Can you let me know the meaning of this 27 grams? Can you let me know the meaning of this particular 27 grams quickly? Quickly in the chats. Quickly, everyone. <laughs> Is it clear, people? So I would say, we are supposed to add 27 grams of water. We are supposed to add 27 grams of water in the container. Then only mole fraction of methanol will become 0.25. Yeah. Perfect. Is that clear people? Is that clear to everyone? Is it clear to everyone? Quickly. Quickly, guys. Let's talk about something called as molarity. How do you exactly define the term molarity? How do you define the term molarity? Uh, you can consult these sort of sessions for J means as well. No worries. Okay. All right, people. Molarity. How do we define it? You should be in a position to define it. Molarity is defined as the number of moles of solute. The number of moles of solute present in present in one liter of solution. This is the definition of molarity. Number of moles of solute present in one liter of solution. Imagine in one liter of solution, there are two moles of solute. You will directly say molarity of the solution is two. Imagine in one liter of solution, there are five moles of solute. 
you'll directly say molarity of the solution is 5. Imagine in 1 liter of solution, there are x moles of solute. You'll directly say molarity of the solution is x. So what is molarity? Number of moles of solute, which will be present in 1 liter of solution. Which will be present in 1 liter of solution. That's all. That's it. Right? And people, how do you... How do you get its results? I'm not deriving the results. I'm giving you the results and I'll show you its application part. Have a look people. Molarity. The first result to calculate molarity is equal to <coughs> number of moles of solute divided by volume of solution in liters. This is the first and the basic result by means of which you can calculate molarity of the solution. Number two. Number of moles of solute Number of moles of solute can be written as mass of solute in grams divided by molar mass of solute. In the denominator, you had volume of solution in liters. Instead, I'll use volume of solution in ml and in the numerator, I'll be multiplying with 1000. This is one more result which you have to remember directly. Which you have to remember directly, right? And my dear students, is that it? No, that's not it. There are a few more results. Okay, molarity is equal to. 10 multiplied by weight by weight percentage of solute. 10 multiplied by weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by density of solution in grams per ml divided by molar mass of solute. Divided by molar mass of solute. This is one more result which you have to remember to calculate molarity of the solution. There will be a lot of questions in which weight by weight percentage of solute will be given in which density of the solution will be given and we will be directly supposed to calculate molarity. If you will remember this result, it will not take you more than 10 seconds to solve the equation. Right? Do we have one more result to calculate molarity? I would say yes. See guys, if you remember, in the beginning only, I have told you. In the beginning only, I have told you. Weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by density of solution. Weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by density of solution. What do you call that as? You call that as weight by volume percentage of solute. So this is 10 multiplied by weight by volume percentage of solute divided by molar mass of solute. This is one more result which I would want every one of you to remember so that we can solve the questions in very lesser time. Yes? Is it clear people? <clears throat> is it clear people quickly? I want to sing, sir, please dance. You should have been in front of me. I would have made you do mujra, not dance. I hope you know what mujra is. Nonsense. Okay, so these are one, two, three, four. Four results by means of which you will be calculating molarity of the solution. Right? <laughs> right, people? <laughs> right? <laughs> Perfect. All right. Look at few more things, guys. <clears throat> Look at few more things. Look at few more things. If I write a statement like this, I'm writing two molar NaCl aqueous solution. Can you let me know what is meant by this particular statement? Two molar NaCl aqueous solution. Two molar NaCl aqueous solution. How do you decode this statement? It is very, very much simple. It means that two moles of your solute are present in are present in one liter of solution. Two moles of solute are present in one liter of solution. Correct? Now, if you ask me, what are the units of molarity? If you ask me, what are the units of molarity? Moles in the numerator volume in the denominator. So, units of molarity will be moles per liter. Units will be moles per liter or you can call it directly as molar. You can call it directly as molar. Now guys, few more things related to molarity which you must remember from now onwards. Sometimes, sometimes in the questions, they will give a statement like this. Semi-molar solution. Sometimes they'll write a statement like semi-molar solution. Sometimes they can write 
डेसी मोलर सोल्यूशन डेसी मोलर सोल्यूशन समटाइम्स दे कैन राइट सेंटी मोलर सोल्यूशन सेंटी मोलर सोल्यूशन एंड समटाइम्स दे कैन राइट मिली मोलर सोल्यूशन you should exactly know what is the meaning of all these particular statements which i'm mentioning over here you should know it you should know it you should know it but your students semi molar solution do remember it is that solution whose molarity is equal to 0.5 what is meant by molarity is equal to 0.5 it means that 0.5 moles of solute will be present in 1 liter of solution right decimolar solution decimolar solution that solution whose molarity will be 0.1 right centimolar solution that solution whose molarity will be 0.01 millimolar solution that solution whose molarity will be 0.001 do remember these terminologies as well do remember these terminologies as well and my dear students do remember one more thing if you ask me whether molarity is temperature dependent or not i would say molarity molarity is temperature dependent molarity is temperature dependent do remember any concentration term if you look at any concentration term in the formula of any concentration term in the formula of any concentration term if you find the term volume you have got different concentration terms you have got their different results if any result if any result of any concentration term you find a term volume do remember that concentration term is going to be volume dependent here if you look at the expression of molarity there is a term volume here there is a term volume here if there is a term volume here that means it's going to be temperature dependent that means it's going to be temperature dependent do remember when we increase the temperature when we increase the temperature i will directly say volume of the solution increases when you increase the temperature of the solution volume of the solution increases if volume of the solution increases that tells you that the molarity of the solution decreases do you remember this particular statement as well right upon increasing the temperature volume of the solution increases which eventually is going to tell you that molarity of the solution decreases i hope this is clear i hope this is clear to everyone people yes i hope this is clear to everyone okay perfect okay one last thing tell me what is the meaning of this particular thing 5 capital m naoh aqueous can you quickly tell me what is the meaning of this particular statement in the chats everyone everyone in the chats <clears throat> quickly 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 everyone in the chat quickly what is meant by it i want everyone to write it it means 5 moles of naoh are present in 1 liter of solution yeah perfectly done perfectly done perfectly done now guys similarly the way we defined molarity in the similar way you are going to define the term molality as well molality which is represented by small m now how do you define exactly this particular term again look at the definition and eventually do everything related to the definition molality what is molality it is defined as the number of moles of solute number of moles of solute present in present in 1 kg of solvent It is defined as the number of moles of solute which are present in one kg of solvent. Imagine you have taken one kg of solvent. Imagine you have taken one kg of solvent in the container, and you are introducing five moles of solute into that. I can say in one kg of solvent there are five moles of solute, right? And number of moles of solute present in one kg of solvent that defines molality. As simple as that, right? That defines molality. Number of moles of solute. which are present in 1 kg of solvent if if in 1 kg of solvent you are introducing 5 moles of solute so molality of the solution will be 5 
in one kg of solvent if you are introducing 10 moles of solute molality 10 in one kg of solvent you are introducing x moles of solute molality x that's it okay be careful with the definition that's it now what is required here formulas are required formulas are required molality which is represented by small m the first formula number of moles of solute divided by mass of solvent in kilograms this is the first formula by means of which you can calculate molality of the solution point number one point number two instead of moles of solute you can write mass of solute divided by molar mass of solute instead of w1 in kg you can write w1 in grams and you can multiply it with thousand here this is the second formula this is the second formula are there some other formulas yes there are some other formulas yes there are some other formulas do remember people Molality can be calculated like this as well. Mole fraction of solute multiplied by 1000 divided by 1 minus mole fraction of solute multiplied by molar mass of solvent. This is one direct result. This is one direct result by means of which you can calculate molality. There will be a lot of questions in which mole fraction will be given and you will be supposed to calculate molality. Directly use this result, solve the questions in 10 seconds. No need to use your brain. Just apply the formula. That's it. Just apply the formula. That's it. There will be a lot of questions in which molality will be given and you will be supposed to calculate mole fraction. Use the formula and kill it. That's all. Yes. Is there one more result? I would say yes, there is one more result by means of which molality can be calculated. Do you remember that? What is that? That is going to be 1000 multiplied by molarity of the solution divided by 1000 multiplied by density of solution in grams per ml minus molarity of the solution multiplied by molar mass of solute. This is one more result. You will find a particular set of questions in concentration terms wherein, wherein molarity of the solution will be given and you will be supposed to calculate molality or indirectly. You will be given molality and you will be supposed to calculate molarity. Do remember this result, kill the question in, question in 10 seconds. Not more than that. Not more than that. Now, if you are thinking, what are going to be the units of molality? Just look at it. In the numerator moles, in the denominator mass. So it's moles per kg. Moles per kg. Or you can write it directly as molal. M-O-L-A-L. Molal. Right? You can... Write it like this and people, for example, I'm writing a statement like this, 2 molal NaCl aqueous solution. Can you quickly let me know what is the meaning of this terminology? 2 molal NaCl aqueous solution, quickly. It means that we have got a solution whose molality is 2. Now, what does that mean? It simply means that 2 moles of solute are present in, as per the definition, as present in 1 kg of solvent. That's it. Is that it? Yes, that's it. Now, if I ask you, is molality going to be temperature dependent or independent? Look at all the formulas. In any formula, do you see the term volume? There is no volume anywhere mentioned. If there is no volume mentioned, of course, it's going to be temperature independent. So, this is temperature independent term. Molality of the solution is temperature independent. Now, 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 if I ask you a question, if I ask you a question, among molarity and molality, which one is preferred? Which one always gives you the correct results? Wait, what do you think? Molarity or molality? Do you remember? Molality is preferred over molarity. Why? Why? Because molality is temperature independent. Molality of the solution does not change when you change the temperature of the solution. But molarity of the solution can change when you change the temperature of the solution. Right? So, I would want you guys to remember this. Molality is preferred over what? Over molarity. Yes or no? Yes or no?
someone is preparing tomato rice while listening to the class that's nice good prepare 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 good for you i believe people whatever i've said till now every single thing is clear to you yeah now before solving the questions before solving the questions there are two more things which i would want you guys to remember what are those things let's see one by one let's see one by one let's see one by one there is something called as parts per million parts per million of solute this is one more terminology ppm of solute ppm of solute how do you define ppm of solute it's simple guys how do you define ppm of solute it is defined as it is defined as the mass of solute in grams present in 10 raised power 6 grams of solution whatever mass of solute in grams will be present in 10 raised power 6 grams of solution whatever mass of solute in grams will be present in 10 raised power grams of solution you will be called that particular term as a ppm of solute ppm of solute now here you need to remember one result directly result is parts per million of solute is equal to mass of solute in grams divided by mass of solution in grams multiplied by 10 raised power 6 multiplied by 10 raised power 6 and in the similar way if you any time want to calculate parts per million of solvent it is going to be mass of solvent in grams divided by mass of solution in grams multiplied by what multiplied by 10 raised power 6 this is the result to calculate ppm of solvent result to calculate ppm of solvent yes now people now tell me one thing tell me one thing can i write this ppm of solute like this ppm of solute is equal to, can i write it like this w2 in grams divided by w solution instead of 10 raised power 6 can i write 100 multiplied by 10 raised power 4 i can do that i can do that right now this particular term we have already discussed what do you call this particular term as i'll be writing it finally ppm of solute is equal to this term is called as if you remember this is called as weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by 10 raised power 4 sometimes you will find some questions in which weight by weight percentage of solute will be given and you will be supposed to calculate ppm of solute use this result solve it that's it similarly similarly ppm of solvent ppm of solvent will be equal to this term i can write it like this weight by weight percentage of solvent multiplied by 10 raised power 4 correct do remember these direct expressions and in some times in some time people you'll understand in some time you'll understand you'll understand exactly Where do I use these direct results? Are these clear? Are these clear? Are these terms clear? Let me know quickly, guys. There is one last concentration term, and then there are going to be a lot of questions which we shall be doing. Then there are going to be a lot of questions which we shall be doing. What is that last concentration? Okay. By the way. A lot of students must be thinking, why he did not teach normality? Yeah, I hope you guys will be thinking that why I did not discuss normality because normality is the topic which we have discussed in detail in the chapter redox reaction, which was done few days back. I hope you remember. Normality was the concept which I have discussed in detail in the chapter redox reactions. Okay. perfect now the last concentration term that is parts per billion parts per billion of solute how do you define it how do you define it instead of 10 raised power 6 you will be writing 10 raised power 9 that's it that's it people so make the result directly it is mass of solute in grams divided by mass of solution in grams multiplied by instead of 10 raised power 6 right 10 raised power 9 perfect 
फॉर एग्जाम्पल एम आस्किंग यू पीपीबी ऑफ सॉल्वेंट पार्ट पर बिलियन ऑफ सॉल्वेंट अब यू गोइंग डू इट मास ऑफ सॉल्वेंट इन ग्राम्स डिवाइडेड बाई मास ऑफ सोल्यूशन इन ग्राम्स नाउ मल्टीप्लाई इट विद टेन रेज पार नाइन टेन रेज पार नाइन कैन यू कन्वर्ट दीज रिजल्ट इन वेट बाई वेट ये यू कैन डू दैट यू कैन राइट इट एस वेट बाई वेट परसेंटेज ऑफ सल्यूट मल्टीप्लाइड बाई टेन रेज पार सेवन यू कैन राइट इट एस वेट बाई वेट परसेंटेज ऑफ सॉल्वेंट मल्टीप्लाइड बाई टेन रेज पार सेवन दीज आर फर्दर मोर रिजल्ट विच यू नीड टू रिमेंबर राइट so these were all the results people which you have to remember related to concentration terms okay perfect the first result was weight by weight percentage of solute w2 divided by w solution into 100 weight by weight percentage of solvent w1 divided by w solution into 100 right second weight by volume percentage of solute w2 divided by volume of solution in ml multiplied by 100 weight by volume of solvent W one in grams divided by volume of solution in ml multiplied by hundred. There was one direct result. Weight by volume percentage of solute is equal to weight by weight percentage of solute multiplied by density of solution. Right? This was one more result. Volume by volume percentage of solute was discussed. V two divided by V solution multiplied by hundred. Volume by volume percentage of solvent V one divided by V solution multiplied by hundred. Mole fraction of solute N two divided by N one plus N two. Mole fraction of solvent N one divided by N one plus N two. right similarly molarity molarity first result n2 divided by volume of solution in liters w2 multiplied by 1000 divided by m2 multiplied by volume of solution in ml right similarly there were other results too 10 multiplied by density of solution multiplied by weight by weight percentage of solute divided by molar mass of solute one more result 10 multiplied by weight by volume percentage of solute divided by molar mass of solute then comes molality n2 divided by w1 in kg W two multiplied by thousand divided by M two multiplied by W one in grams. Right. Similarly, there was one more result. If you remember, K two multiplied by thousand divided by one minus K two into M one. One more result. Thousand multiplied by capital M divided by thousand multiplied by density minus capital M multiplied by M two. I hope you know. I hope you remember. I hope you remember. Yeah. I hope you remember, people. perfect <clears throat> all right people so let's try to do few questions let's try to do few questions now you should be easily killing these questions guys you should be easily killing these questions look at the first question calculate the weight by weight percentage 1.5 molar ch3coh aqueous solution whose density is given what are we supposed to calculate we are supposed to calculate weight by weight percentage of solute what is given we are given with the molarity of solution i'm just writing the data which is given molarity of solution is given density of solution is also given 0.8 grams per ml 0.8 grams per ml look at this particular solution right look at this particular solution ch3coh is your solute so molar mass of ch3coh molar mass of solute when you solve it it will come out to be 60 grams per mole right my dear students do you remember any result which connects all these terms have we discussed any result which connects all these terms yes there was one result molarity of the solution is equal to 10 multiplied by density of solution in grams per ml multiplied by weight by weight percentage of solute divided by molar mass of solute this was one result now use the data m value is 1.5 is equal to 10 multiplied by density of solution 0.8 weight by weight percentage of solute needs to be calculated divided by molar mass of solute is 60 one equation one unknown solve it 
and get the value of weight by weight percentage of solute which was to be calculated that's it and as far as i remember this value will come out to be 11.25 right so what is meant by this 11.25 what is meant by this 11.25 this is the weight by weight percentage of solute it means that 11.25 grams of solute are present in 100 grams of solution yes perfectly done moving on to one more question look at this question guys look at this question quickly look at this question quickly calculate the molality of a two molar NaOH aqueous solution whose density is given look at the question remember the results and kill it molarity is given molality needs to be calculated how do you solve it there is one direct result which connects molality and molarity if you remember molality is equal to thousand multiplied by molarity of the solution divided by thousand multiplied by density of solution minus molarity multiplied by molar mass of solute this is one result which we discussed few minutes back only yeah now molarity of the solution is 2 correct density of the solution is given as 1.2 grams per ml correct this is your solute so molar mass of solute molar mass of NaOH is 40 grams per mole I believe everything is given this is given this is given this is given this is this you know follow it and get the value of molality nothing to do here as well nothing to do here as well right okay guys will you be able to solve these quickly quickly people yeah perfectly done try to solve this question try to solve this question it's a nice it's a nice one <clears throat> it's a nice one people the question is dissolving 120 grams of urea dissolving 120 grams of urea in 1000 grams of water right dissolving 120 grams of urea in 1000 grams of water so as per the question 120 grams of urea 120 grams of urea are to be dissolved in 1000 grams of water and when 120 grams of urea is dissolved in 1000 grams of water what do we get we get a solution we get a solution and density of this particular solution is given to us density of this particular solution is given to us 1.15 grams per ml what are we supposed to calculate we are supposed to calculate molarity of this particular solution we are supposed to calculate molarity of this particular solution how exactly you're going to do it try to understand what exactly i'm going to do molarity molarity which is capital m there is one of the result to calculate molarity i had given you already mass of solute in grams multiplied by thousand divided by molar mass of solute and this is volume of solution in ml do you remember this result I have given you long back. Now people, when you are mixing 120 grams of urea with 1000 grams of water, among these two, which one is a lesser in amount? Urea is lesser in amount, so urea is my solute. Urea is my solute, right? Urea is my solute. So what is the mass of solute? It's 120 grams. Mass of solute is 120 grams multiplied by 1000 divided by molar mass of solute, molar mass of urea. When you calculate it, it will be 60. Now this volume of solution is not given to me. Volume of solution is not given to me. Now how will I calculate volume of solution? That is the point. How will I calculate volume of solution? Look at this term. Density of solution is given. Instead of density of solution, I can write mass of solution. Divided by volume of solution. Right? This is given to me as 1.15 grams per ml. Correct? So I'm using the parameter density. Density of solution is given. So density of solution is mass of solution divided by volume of solution. Now tell me what is the mass of solution? Mass of solution means mass of solute plus mass of solvent. Mass of solute plus mass of solvent. This plus this. So that is 1120. 1120 grams divided by volume of solution needs to be calculated. So take volume here. 
take this here so this is 1.15 grams per ml i'm taking in the denominator and here i'm getting volume of solution in milliliters right people yes when you solve this particular term 1120 divided by 1.15 it will come out to be 973 ml so what did we calculate from here i calculated the volume of solution in milliliters so put it here it is 120 multiplied by 1000 divided by 60 and this is 973 when you solve this the value comes out to be 2.05 so what is this 2.05 this is the molarity of the solution correct you can solve this question by one more approach as well first calculate weight by weight percentage of solute then use the formula molarity is equal to 10 multiplied by density of solution multiplied by weight by weight percentage of solution divided by molar mass of solute you can do that as well no issues at all no issues at all you can do that okay you can do that give this question a try quickly give this question a try quickly calculate the molality calculate the molality of a KCL aqueous solution which is prepared by dissolving 7.45 grams of KCL in 500 ml of solution. What is it? What is meant by it? Try to understand. Try to understand. You have made a solution. You have made a solution. Right? In which water is solvent, KCL is solute. As per the question, 7.45 grams of KCL are present in 500 ml of solution this is mentioned 7.45 grams of kcl are present in 500 ml of solution this is mentioned right what do i need to calculate i need to calculate molality there is one formula for molality if you remember w2 in grams multiplied with thousand divided by m2 and this was w1 in grams I hope you remember this result. I have given you long back. I have given you long back. Now, the solute is KCL. And what is the mass of solute? Mass of solute W2 is 7.45 grams multiplied by 1000 divided by molar mass of solute, molar mass of KCL. When you solve it, it is 74.5 grams per mole. W1, W1 is the mass of solvent in grams. But I do not know what is the mass of solvent. I do not know what is the mass of solvent. How do I get the mass of solvent? Try to understand. I'll be using this parameter. Density of solution. Right? Density of solution. Instead of density of solution, I'll write mass of solution in grams divided by volume of solution in milliliters. Density is equal to mass by volume, right? Is equal to 1.2. Correct? Is equal to 1.2 grams per ml. Now, as per the question, Volume of solution is given. Volume of solution is given. 500. So this is 500. So mass of solution will be 500 into 1.2. I'll say the mass of solution will be this multiplied by this which comes out to be 600 grams. But in the formula do I need the mass of solution? No. I do not need the mass of solution. I need the mass of solvent. What did I get? I got the mass of solution. You know mass of solution is basically mass of solute plus mass of solvent. So this has to be 600 grams, correct? What is the mass of solute? 7.45 grams plus W1 is equal to 600. So you can calculate W1 from here, which will come out to be 592.55 grams. So this is the mass of solvent. So put it here. Instead of W1, what exactly you are going to write? You are going to write 592.55. Solve this and get the molality. That's all. Nothing to do. Nothing to do in this particular question as well. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear. And people, in the concentration terms, this is your homework question. Because all these types we have, we are done. We are given with a solution whose molarity is given. Density of solution is given. First calculate molality. You can do that. Use a direct formula. Right? Once you calculate molality, then calculate weight by weight percentage of solute. You can do that too. Right? Weight by volume percentage of solute. You can do that too. All the direct results which I gave you. Mole fraction of solute. Once you calculate molality, there is one result which connects molality with mole fraction. Right? Perfect guys. So this is going to be your homework question. This is going to be your homework question which you shall be doing. 
and do let me know its answer in the comment section at the end okay is everything going perfect till now is everything going perfect till now is everything going perfect till now yeah now we have got one more amazing topic guys and this is frequently used many a times someone is saying fourth part mein confusion ho raha hai fourth part kaun sa tha fourth part was the mole fraction of solute right so first of all i believe you can easily calculate molality from here right molality you can use with direct result once you calculate molality you can use this result mole fraction of solute multiplied by 1000 one minus mole fraction of solute molar mass of solvent right this you would have already calculated right molar mass of solvent you know water is the solvent 18 so one equation one unknown from here you can calculate chi2 that's it nothing to worry yes is it perfectly fine people everyone 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 in the chats in the chats quickly everyone in the chats quickly <clears throat> everyone in the chats quickly there i have been following you consistently since last 6 months and there has been massive progress in my approach to chemistry glad to know that glad to know that okay let me move ahead people molarity of dilution before discussing dilution before discussing dilution there is before discussing dilution there is one thing which i want you to remember what is that have a look have a look my dear students few minutes back i gave you one result to calculate molarity of the solution that was number of moles of solute divided by volume of solution in liters divided by volume of solution in liters this i told you few minutes back right now people can i write the same result like this can i write n2 is equal to n2 is equal to this multiplied by this molarity of the solution multiplied by volume of solution in liters i can do that no issues at all right so what is meant by this particular statement this is important this is important why see whenever you will be having a solution whenever you will be having a solution whose molarity will be given to us whose volume in liters we know multiply molarity of that solution with its volume in liters you will be getting the number of moles of solute in that particular solution for example you have got a solution whose molarity is 2 let's say volume of that solution is 5 liters so this multiplied by this is equal to 10 so that means there are 10 moles of solute in that solution that means there will be 10 moles of solute in that solution right agreed perfect number 1 number 2 in the same equation in the same equation instead of volume of solution in liters if i use volume of solution in milliliters instead of volume of solution in liters if i write volume of solution in milliliters now i'm not going to call this as the number of moles of solute i will be calling this as the number of millimoles of solute i will be calling this as the number of millimoles of solute this is one more thing which i want you guys to know so one is moles of solute in the solution moles of solute in the solution is always equal to molarity of that solution multiplied by volume of that solution in liters now similarly millimoles of solute in the solution will be equal to molarity of that solution multiplied by volume of the same solution but in milliliters but in milliliters what what is what is the difference between the two there is no difference these are just the fancy terminologies again i'm saying millimoles are nothing when you multiply moles 
by thousand you get millimoles then you multiply moles by thousand you get millimoles so if i write millimoles of solute millimoles of solute will be moles of solute multiplied with thousand nothing else nothing else people right just to confuse you nothing else i believe this is clear now if this is clear then it is a high time to discuss the molarity of dilution understand what exactly i'm going to do and try to remember the concept do not mug up the formula here try to remember the concept for example this is the container which i have right imagine in this container i've got a solution i've got a solution that means in this particular container we have got solute as well as solvent we have got solute as well as solvent in this container we have got a solution in the container that means there is solute as well as solvent right imagine that imagine that imagine that imagine that molarity of this particular solution which is there in the container molarity of the solution which is there in the container is for example m1 imagine volume of the same solution in the container is for example is for example v1 liters let's assume that I've taken the solution whose molarity is M1. Volume of the same solution is V1 liters. Okay. My dear students, if I ask you, how many moles of solute are there in the solution? How many moles of solute are there in the solution? Few minutes back, I told you. Molarity multiplied by volume in liters. That gives you the moles of solute. So, if I ask you, how many moles of solute are there in the solution? Right now, molarity of the solution is M1. Multiply it with volume of solution in liters. So this multiplied by this, it's going to give me the number of moles of solute in the solution. Agreed? Agreed? Now people, imagine I'm doing, I'm adding, imagine I'm adding extra solvent in the same container. Imagine I'm adding extra solvent in the same container. The process of addition of extra solvent into the solution. The process of addition of extra solvent into the solution is something which you call as dilution. So basically what am I doing? I'm adding extra solvent in the solution. That means I'm doing the dilution. That means I'm doing the dilution. Now tell me, when I will be adding extra solvent into the solution, tell me, Will the volume of solution remain same? Is it going to be V1? No, it will change. It will increase. Let's say the final volume of the solution is V2 liters. Let's assume after the dilution, the final volume of the solution is V2 liters. Now, you know, molarity is inversely proportional to volume. So, if I'm adding extra solvent in the solution, due to which volume of the solution is increasing, and if volume of the solution is increasing, that means molarity of the solution would have decreased, right? If the molarity of the solution initially was M1, let's say, finally, the molarity of the solution would be M2. Now, if I want you guys to compare between M1 and M2, can I say, can I say M2 will be less than M1? Because molarity is inversely proportional to volume. We are adding extra solvent due to which volume of solution is increasing. If volume of solution is increasing, molarity of the solution will be decreasing, right? Yes. Now, now, now. Tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. After the dilution is done, what is the new molarity of the solution M2? What is the new volume of solution V2? If I multiply these two terms, if I multiply these two terms, what do I get? What do I get? If I multiply these two terms, can I say I again got the moles of solute present in the solution? Can I say this was the case of before dilution? And this is the case of after dilution? This was the case. These were the moles of solute present in the container before dilution. And these are the moles of solute present in the container after dilution. Yes. If you look properly, what did we do? What did we do exactly? We added extra solvent. We added extra solvent. Did we do anything with solute? Did I add extra solute? No. Did I, took, did I take solute out? No. I did nothing with solute. I just added what? I just added the solvent. I did nothing with the solute. I did nothing with the solute. 
I just added extra solvent. Agreed? Agreed? So can I use one simple statement? Can I say number of moles of solute before dilution has to be equal to number of moles of solute after, after dilution? Because I did not do anything with the solute. Whatever solute was there in the container before, same amount of solute will be in the container afterwards as well. Because I just added solvent. I did nothing with solute. Right? So people, moles of solute before dilution, moles of solute before dilution is equal to M1V1. Moles of solute after dilution is equal to M2V2. Right? This is one equation which I got over here. And you call this particular formula as the dilution formula. You call this particular formula as dilution formula. Right? Now, now, now. If I ask you one simple thing. If I ask you one simple thing. Tell me the volume of, what is the volume of extra solvent added? What is the volume of extra solvent which we added? How do we calculate that? How do we calculate the volume of extra solvent added? How do we calculate that? See, initially the volume of solution was V1. Then you added some extra solvent. Finally, the volume of the solution is V2. So, final volume of the solution minus initial volume of the solution. That is always going to give me what? A volume of extra solvent added. That's always going to give me the volume of extra solvent added. Right? V2 minus V1. Correct? If this concept is clear to you, you can easily kill this question. You can easily kill this question. Easily kill this question. How much water, how much water should be added to 200 ml of two molar solution? So basically we have got a solution whose molarity, whose initial molarity is 2, whose initial volume is 200 ml, right? We have got a solution whose initial molarity is 2, whose initial volume is 200 ml. Now in this solution, what we are doing? We are adding extra solvent. And the solvent which we are adding here, that is water. So we are adding extra water. Now due to the addition of extra water, what's happening? What's happening? Final molarity of the solution is becoming 0 0.2. Right? Let's assume the final volume of the solution is V2. Can I say this is the simplest case of dilution? This is the simplest case of dilution in which I shall be using the dilution formula. M1V1 has to be equal to M2V2. So what is M1? 2. What is V1? 200. What is M2? 0 0.2. From here you can calculate V2. And when you solve this V2, it will come out to be 2000 ml. But this is the final volume of the solution. Was I supposed to calculate final volume of the solution? Look at the question. I was not supposed to calculate final volume of the solution. I was supposed to calculate the extra solvent which I had added. So I'll say volume of the extra solvent which I have added is equal to V2 minus V1. V2 we got to know as 2000 and V1 is 200. The value comes out to be 1800 ml. So what is meant by this 1800 ml? So can I say I had to add, I had to add 1800 ml of extra water. Then only the molarity of the solution changed from 2 to 0 0.2. Is this clear to everyone? Quickly, my dear students. Absolutely, all these are your PYQs. They have been asked in different competitive examinations. All of these, all of these. Let me know once in the chats with the fire emojis if every single thing is clear to them. Quickly. Quickly, people. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Everyone, everyone, everyone. You know, guys, do I need to repeat it all the time? Everyone means everyone. Do I need to repeat it? Everyone means everyone. And what am I saying? All the students have not liked the session yet. What is it? What does it mean? Should I end the session? Yeah? You're forcing me to end the session. So smash that like right now. Yeah? Smash that like button right now. Right now means right now. Right now means right now. 
Right now means right now. Everyone means everyone. Ionic equilibrium will be done too. Just wait for it. Let's complete this chapter first. Guys, everything will be done in detail. Relax. Relax. Right? There were a lot of students who came in the beginning. Sir, you will stop this series after 10 lectures and all. Right? There were a lot of students who came up with this thought. Yeah? So, I would... I would... I would tell those students to just have a chill pill and watch the sessions. Those are all the paid users, by the way. Paid users means, you know, right, what I'm talking about. First, we have to finish all these concentration terms, right? Then I'll be giving you a break. First, let's finish it off. Okay. Molarity of mixing. Molarity of mixing. Molarity of mixing. Molarity of mixing. See, I'm going to break this molarity of mixing into two cases. Case one, which is the simplest case. Case one. Imagine, these are the two containers which I have. Imagine in this container, we have got HCl aqueous solution. Imagine in this container, again, we have got HCl aqueous solution. So how many solutions do we have? We have two solutions. We have two solutions. Imagine molarity of this solution is M1. Volume of this solution is, for example, V1 liters. Imagine molarity of this solution is M2. Volume of this solution is V2 liters. For example, now, my dear students, if you mix them, if you mix them in the final container, this is the final container. This is the container in which you are mixing these two solutions. Now, this is HCl aqueous solution. This is HCl aqueous solution. Are these the reacting solutions? Do they react? This HCl, this HCl. Have you seen HCl, HCl reacting? No. So these are non-reacting solutions. So when I mix them, what do I get? I get a resulting solution. I get a final solution. This is my resulting solution. This is my resulting HCl aqueous solution. This is my resulting HCl aqueous solution. Now people, what is the final volume of this resulting aqueous solution which I am representing with Vr? Volume of the resulting solution, volume of the final solution, that will be V1 plus V2. If the resulting solution was ideal, if the resulting solution was ideal, assume that molarity of the resulting solution is MR. Molarity of the resulting final solution is MR. Now people, what concept should I use here? Can you tell me, before mixing, before mixing, how many moles of solute were here in the container? It was M1 multiplied by V1. Right? These were the moles of solute in this container. How many moles of solute were in this container? It was M2 multiplied by V2 in liters. If I add them, if I add them, should I be calling this particular term as the total moles of solute, total moles of solute present in both these containers before mixing? Yes, these are my total moles of solute present in both the containers before mixing. Now, after mixing is done, what is the molarity of the final solution, MR? What is its volume, VR? So if I multiply MR with VR, what should I be calling this particular term? Molarity multiplied by volume in liters. What, what do that, that give us? This is something which will give us the number of moles of solute in the final container. Is that before mixing or after mixing? This is after mixing. This is after mixing. So I'll say before mixing, some solute was here in this container. Some solute was here in this container. When you mix them up, all the solute which was present in both these containers, all that solute came here in this container. So tell me the concept. What concept should I be using? I should be saying number of moles of solute, total moles of solute before mixing has to be equal to total moles of solute after mixing. Correct? As simple as that? As simple as that? As simple as that. Tell me moles of solute before mixing. That is M1V1 plus 
एम टू वी टू इज इक्वल दिस गोइन बी एम आर मल्टीप्लाइड बी वी आर वी आर इज नथिंग दैट इज वी वन प्लस वी टू नाउ फ्रॉम दिस पर्टिकुलर इक्वेशन यू कैन इजिली कैलकुलेट एम आर मोलैरिटी ऑफ द फाइनल रिजल्टिंग सोल्यूशन विच इज एम वन वी वन प्लस एम टू वी टू डिवाइड बाई वी वन प्लस वी टू इफ द रिजल्टिंग सोल्यूशन आइडियल दिस इज फ्रॉम दिस इक्वेशन यू गेट वन टाइप ऑफ क्वेश्चन From this equation, you get one type of question. This was my case one. Now, what about my case two? What about my case two? What about my case two, people? <clears throat> Look at this case. Look at this case. And after this case, we'll be solving certain questions. Over here, I'm taking three containers, not two. I'm taking three containers. These are the three containers which I have. Imagine in this container we have got HCl aqueous solution. Imagine in this container we have got HCl aqueous solution. Imagine in this container there is only water, pure water, nothing else. Pure water, nothing else. Okay. Molarity of this solution is m one. Volume of this solution is v one. This is m two. This is v two. Volume of this water is for example v. Volume of this water is for example v. Now, in the chats, tell me how many solutions do we have? Remember carefully what I'm saying. Listen, listen to me very carefully. I'm asking you, how many solutions do we have? Listen carefully. How many solutions do we have? Three or two. This is a solution. This is a solution. But this is a pure solvent. We have got two solutions. We have got two solutions, and in the third container, we have got a pure solvent, right? Now, people, now people, tell me one thing. Did I mix them yet? I did not mix them yet. i did not mix them yet so this is the case of before mixing this is the case of before mixing tell me if i ask you how many moles of solute were there in this container before mixing you will say m1 v1 m1 v1 moles of solute present in the first container before mixing in the second container moles of solute before mixing is m2 v2 in this container there is no solute there is no solute right so If I add them up, what this term is going to give me? It's going to give me number of moles of solute. It's going to give me total moles of solute present with us before mixing. Before mixing, right? Before mixing. Now, people, if I mix all these three containers in the final container, this is my final container. I will be getting a resulting solution. i'll be getting a final solution of hcl assume that assume that the volume of the final solution when you mix them up volume of the final solution is equal to vr now this vr has to be equal to v1 plus v2 plus v v1 plus v2 plus v imagine imagine molarity of this final solution is mr right now people if i just multiply these two terms what do i get if i multiply mr with vr If I multiply MR with VR, if I multiply MR with VR, I got the total moles of solute present in this particular container. Is it before mixing or after mixing? This is after mixing, right? This is after mixing. This is after mixing. Now tell me the concept. Before mixing, there was some solute here. There was some solute here, right? And now you are mixing them up. Can I say all the solute? Which was there in these two containers? It finally reached in this container, right? Yeah. So what is the concept which I'll be using? Total moles of solute which we had before mixing has to be equal to total moles of solute after mixing, right? So I'll be using this particular statement here: total moles of solute before mixing has to be equal to total moles of solute after mixing. Perfect. Now tell me how many moles of solute are there before mixing? It is m one v one plus m two v two. It has to be equal to total moles of solute after mixing. Look at that. It is m r multiplied by what? Multiplied by v r. And you know v r is nothing. That is v one plus v two plus v. What was v? V was the volume of water added. My dear students, if you got to know how to make this particular equation, you are sorted. If you got to know how to make this particular equation, you are sorted. Because from this equation, what they'll ask you? they'll ask you in the exam to calculate the volume of water added how much volume of water we have added you'll be getting a question from this particular equation okay 
You'll be getting a question from this particular equation. Now, now, now. I believe case 1, case 2 is over. Let's see what kind of questions have been asked from these two cases. One simplest among all. Kill it. Kill it quickly. Kill it quickly. 200 ml of 3 molar HCl aqueous is mixed with 300 ml of 2 molar HCl aqueous. And the final volume is made up of made up to 1500 ml. Calculate the molarity of the resulting solution. Is it even a question? No. We have got the first solution whose molarity is how much? Whose molarity is 3. Volume of the first solution is 200 ml. Molarity of the second solution is equal to 2. Volume of the second HCl solution is equal to 300 ml. Now what we are doing? We are mixing them up. And what we'll be getting? We'll be getting a resulting solution. Volume of that resulting solution is given as 1500 ml. Molarity of that resulting solution needs to be calculated. Let me which equation? Case 1 or case 2? Case 1 or case 2? Case 1 or case 2? I'll be using case 2. These are non-reacting. MR will be equal to M1V1 plus M2V2 divided by V final. V final is how much? V final is how much? 1500 ml. Right? Right, people? Right? So use all the parameters here and kill this question. Nothing else you have to do. Nothing else you have to do. 2.4 will be the answer. Yes, absolutely right. Wonderful. Good job done. Good job done. Good job done. Okay, if this is clear, just read the question and tell me only one thing. Read the question and tell me only one thing. Is it based on case 1 or case 2? Is it based on case 1 or case 2? Quickly. Till then I can have some water. Is it based on case 1 or case 2? You need to tell me. Is it based on case 1 or case 2? Yeah? Perfecto guys. Wonderful. Furnishing breakfast. Yes, it's morning right now. Yes, yes. You need breakfast. See guys, look at this particular question carefully. As per this question, we have got three containers, one, two, and three. Okay. In the first container, you have got HCl aqueous solution. In the second container, you have got HCl aqueous solution. In the third container, you only have water. You only have water. Molarity of the first solution, which is M1, is equal to 0 0.6 and its volume is 250. So 0 0.6 its volume is 250 ml. Molarity of the second solution is nothing but 0 0.2 and its volume is how much? Its volume is 750 ml. Imagine in the third container you have got some V ml of water. Imagine you have got some V ml of water here. Now what you are doing? You are mixing them. When you mix them, what do we get? We get a resulting solution, final solution. You get a resulting solution, a final solution. Right? Perfect. Molarity of this resulting solution is given to me as per the equation 0 0.25 and volume of this resulting solution will be V1 plus V2 plus V. So 750 plus 250 plus V which comes out to be 1000 plus V. Right? 1000 plus V. Now, you know it is case 2. Correct? So make the equation quickly. The equation has to be M1 V1 plus M2 V2. It has to be equal to MR multiplied by VR, which is V1 plus V2 plus V. That comes out to be directly how much? 1000 plus volume of water, which was there in third container, right? Now this is something which we know, 0 0.6 multiplied by 250 plus M2, 0 0.2 multiplied by V2, 750 is equal to MR, 0 0.25 multiplied by what? 1000 plus volume of water added. One equation, one unknown. From here, you can calculate the volume of water which was added. How much it's coming after solving? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Everyone, everyone, you have to be very quick. So 200 ml. So 200 ml of water was added while mixing. That's something which we were supposed to calculate. I believe it is done and dusted. Solve this question as well. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Quickly, my dear students, everyone.
29.2% weight by weight weight by weight solution of HCl. Wow, whose density is given? Whose density is given? Occupies 8 ml volume. Calculate the final volume of the solution. Whose concentration becomes 0.4 molar on dilution. Look at the question and see what is mentioned in the question and what we are supposed to calculate. Break after 15 to 20 minutes. Be there. Do not go anywhere. Be there. Look at this particular question. We have got HCl aqueous solution. Correct? Density of the solution is given. Okay. Weight by weight percentage of solute is given. Right? Perfect. Volume of this solution is given. Now what exactly we are doing? The solution which we have taken. We are doing its dilution. We are adding extra solvent. We are adding extra solvent. When we are adding extra solvent, what do we get? We get the final HCl aqua solution. Right? Molarity of this final HCl aqua solution, that is M2, is 0 0.4. Is 0 0.4. And let's assume its final volume is V2. And that is something which we have to calculate. So tell me just one thing. Is it the case of dilution or this is the case of mixing? This is the case of dilution. Now, I should be using the dilution formula. Which is M1V1 has to be equal to M2V2. Now, M1. Do we know? We do not know the initial molarity of the solution. So my first point is. So calculate the initial molarity of the solution. Initial molarity of the solution is equal to 10 multiplied by density of solution multiplied by weight by weight percentage of solute divided by molar mass of solute. Right? So M1 will be equal to 10 multiplied by density of solution is 1.25. Weight by weight of solute is 29.2. And molar mass of solute, molar mass of HCl 36.5. When you solve it, I believe it comes out to be 10. I believe it comes out to be 10, right? So M1 is 10, V1 is 8, M2 is 0.4, V2 you are supposed to calculate, you are sorted. So 80 divided by 0.4, the value comes out to be 200 ml. That is going to be the final volume of the solution. If you got it, let me know in the chats with some fire emojis that too quickly people. That too quickly. Quickly, quickly, the Josh has to be high. The Josh has to be high. We have to complete this chapter, right? In detail. All the theory, all the problem patterns we have to do. Correct? From this question, two to three questions. From this chapter, two to three questions you'll be getting. Two to three questions. So 12 marks you'll be securing by this chapter. And it is very easy chapter. Trust me on that. Trust me on that. It's a, it is very easy chapter when it comes to NEET. And it is the most difficult chapter when it comes when it comes to JE Advanced. When it comes to JE Advanced, it is the most difficult chapter. When it comes to NEET, it is the easiest chapter. Yeah. JE means NEET level is now same. All right, guys. Now, now, there is one, one more type of the question. There is one more type of the equation. Mixing of non-ideal solutions. Mixing of non-ideal solutions. So first of all, this particular term, the non-ideal solutions, we have to discuss in detail afterwards. But right now, I just need its one point. Afterwards, I'll be discussing non-ideal solutions in detail. But right now, I just need its one point. What is that one point? Have a look. Imagine. Imagine I have got two containers, okay? This container contains liquid one. This container contains liquid two. Now you are mixing these liquids. You are mixing these liquids in the final container. This is the final container. So what did I get? I got a resulting solution. I got a resulting solution over here. Okay, I got a resulting solution over here. If the volume of the first liquid is V1, volume of the second liquid is V2, volume of the resulting solution which I got over here, it is Vr. It is Vr. Now remember one thing. Remember one thing. 
रिमेंबर वन थिंग इफ वी आर कम्स आउट टू बी इक्वल्ड वी वन प्लस वी टू इफ वी आर कम्स आउट टू बी इक्वल्ड वी वन प्लस वी टू देन एट दैट पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम आई शेल बी कॉलिंग दिस रिजल्टिंग सोल्यूशन एज द आइडियल सोल्यूशन एज द आइडियल सोल्यूशन नंबर वन नंबर टू इफ वी आर is not equal to v1 plus v2 i shall be calling this resulting solution as the then it's going to be my non ideal solution just one important point i used i did not discuss ideal not non ideal with you yet something which we have to discuss in some time i just need one point that's it if vr is equal to v1 plus v2 ideal if vr is not equal to v1 plus v2 non ideal that's all that's all okay now people now remember one more thing no matter no matter whether the solution no matter whether the resulting solution is ideal or non ideal mass of resulting solution will be always equal to w1 plus w2 mass of resulting solution will be always equal to w1 plus w2 if the resulting solution is ideal or non ideal nothing to do with that mass of resulting solution will be always equal to mass of liquid 1 plus mass of liquid 2 this is the concept which i'll be using here this is the concept which i'll be using here tell me one thing tell me one thing if i analyze this particular point properly tell me if we are if volume of resulting solution comes out to be greater than v1 plus v2 if volume of resulting solution comes out to be greater than v1 plus v2 tell me what would have happened at that point of time can i say expansion has taken place volume is increasing i was expecting when i was mixing these two liquids i was expecting the volume of resulting solution to be v1 plus v2 but it's coming out to be greater than that means expansion has taken place right and people if vr comes out to be less than v1 plus v2 should i be calling this as expansion no be calling this as contraction i'll be calling this as contraction a particular type of question is asked where in they will ask you how much was the volume contraction how much was the volume expansion when you mixed two liquids when you mixed two liquids how much was the volume contraction how much was the volume expansion how to deal with that particular question look here how to deal with that particular question look at the question carefully look at the question carefully look at the question carefully people on mixing 15 ml of ethyl alcohol with 15 ml of pure water at 4 degree centigrade the resulting non ideal solution is found to have density of 0.924 grams per ml calculate the contraction in volume calculate the contraction in volume understand what it says so you have got a container you have got a container this is your first container this your second container and this your third container try to understand what exactly i'm going to say in the first container you have got ethyl alcohol in the second container you have got pure water at 4 degree centigrade okay right in the first container we have got 15 ml of ethyl alcohol under ml of ethyl ethyl alcohol right density of ethyl alcohol is given to us as 0.792 grams per ml correct now this water this water it is kept at 4 degree centigrade it is kept at 4 degree centigrade and volume of this water is also given 15 ml so volume of the water in the second container is 15 ml now the water is present at 4 degree centigrade density of water at 4 degree centigrade you must be knowing it is 1 gram per ml correct now people the two liquids which we have we are mixing them and we are getting a final resulting solution we are getting a final resulting solution now 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 let's assume that let's assume that the final volume of this resulting solution is vr density of the resulting solution is given density of the resulting solution is given 0.924 grams per ml i have to check the contraction in volume first of all understand how and when volume would have contracted i'll say contraction in volume is only possible if vr will be less than v1 plus v2 
If Vr will be less than V1 plus V2, then only I can say contraction has happened. Contraction of volume has happened. So they are asking me, how much is this volume contraction? How much is this volume contraction? How to deal with this particular question? Look here. What is D1? Density of this liquid. Density is equal to mass by volume. So instead of D1, can I write W1 by V1? That is 0 0.792. Do we know the V1? That is 15. 15 multiplied by 0 point something. Can you let me know the exact value in the charts quickly? 0 0.792 multiplied by 15. Can you let me know the exact value which you will be getting from here? Quickly, quickly, everyone. Everyone, I think it will be 10 or 11, something like that. But I want the exact value from your side. Quickly. Quickly, quickly. Solve it, yaar. Quickly. Be, be fast. Be fast. How much this value is coming out to be? What that is saying? 10.5. Is it coming out to be 10.5? 10, 10 Are you sure? Arre, yaar. Someone is saying 19.5. Wow. It comes out to be 11.8. 11.88 grams. I calculated the mass of first liquid. Now, D2. What is D2? Density of this water, which is mass of water, divided by volume of water, which is given to me as 1 gram per ml. So, can I say W2 is equal to 1 multiplied by V2? 1 multiplied by V2. It will be 15 grams. Correct? Correct, people? I calculate the mass of first liquid. I calculate the mass of second liquid. Tell me, tell me, tell me. No matter... If the resulting solution is ideal or non-ideal, no matter if the resulting solution is ideal or non-ideal, mass of resulting solution, as I told you, it's always equal to W1 plus W2. Now, what is W1? 11.88. What is W2? 15. The value comes out to be 26.88 grams. This is the mass of the resulting solution, right? Now, people use this parameter. Density of resulting solution means mass of resulting solution divided by volume of resulting solution which is 0 0.924, right? Perfect. So volume of resulting solution will be equal to uh, mass of resulting solution that is 26.88 divided by 0 0.924. And this value, when you solve it, this value will come out to be 29 ml. So what is this 29 ml? What is this 29 ml? I use the density parameter. Mass of resulting solution divided by volume of resulting solution, right? Mass of resulting solution we know. Correct? So I'll be getting volume of resulting solution 29 ml. Volume of resulting solution should have been 15 plus 15, 30 ml. But it's only 29 ml. That means volume contraction has happened. So how much is the contraction in volume? How much is the contraction in volume which I'm representing with delta V? Final volume minus initial volume. Final volume is 29. Initial volume is 15 plus 15, 30. So contraction in volume is 1 ml. This is something which we were supposed to calculate. So volume contraction of 1 ml has happened. Now you must be thinking why this contraction in volume happened. That is something for which you have to wait for 1 or 2 hours. Yeah. If you want to know that, you have to wait for it for like 1 to 2 hours. I believe all the things still here are absolutely clear. So our concentration terms are done and dusted. Now comes the Liquid solution. Now comes the topic vapor pressure. But I believe a lot of students are asking about the break. So let's take a quick break. I'm not giving you a long break right now. Long break, the dinner break will be taken afterwards. One short break of 15 minutes I'm giving you. But you have to promise that you'll be back. You have to promise that you'll be back. The time is right now 19.22. So 7.22, it'll be 7.32. 7.36. Seven. Seven. Okay. Right? Guys, be back. Now I'm going to start something amazing. And you are going to understand all these things the way you have never studied. Trust me on that. But be back. Be back. Okay?
be back on time till then
Is everyone back? Uh, just give me a second, people. <laughs> yeah, back with full energy. Is that? <clears throat> Is everybody back? Is everybody back? <coughs> so people, whatever we have discussed till now, let me know in the chats if every single thing is clear. Let me know in the chats if every single thing is clear till here. Hmm. Let me know in the chats if every single thing is clear till here. Quickly. Quickly, people are joining in. Let's wait for one more minute. Let's wait for one more minute. So till then you can let me know if every single thing is clear. Uh, Vijay is asking, sir, is Avengers batch completed? Physics is completed. Chemistry and bio are getting complete on 10th of January in Avengers batch. 10th of January, their syllabus is getting completed and then they are starting the revision. <laughs> <coughs> PDF will be available on my telegram. <coughs> no, no, Yakub, no, I'm not. So, should we start? I want you to light up the chats now, again. I want you to light up the chats again. Should we get going now? Next chapter, I'll let you know. <clears throat> Next chapter, I'll let you know. Okay guys, so let's start with a term called as vapor pressure. This is something important. <clears throat> it forms the basis of the liquid solutions. This particular topic which I'm going to teach you now. Okay, vapor pressure. So first of all, how do we exactly define the term vapor pressure? Guys, be careful with what I say. Be careful with what I say. Take a note of every single thing now. Vapor pressure is defined as the pressure exerted the pressure exerted by the vapors the pressure exerted by the vapors of a volatile liquid When, when the liquid and its vapors, when the liquid and its vapors are in equilibrium with each other, when the liquid and its vapors are in equilibrium at a particular temperature. at a particular temperature. Now you must be thinking what is meant by this. Try to understand people. 
carefully try to understand. Imagine I'm taking a container over here. This is the container. For example, in this container, what exactly I'm going to keep? I'm going to keep a volatile liquid till here. I have kept a volatile liquid in this particular container. And I believe this is the top surface of the volatile liquid. So over here, I have taken a volatile liquid in this particular container. Right? Imagine this particular liquid is it, it is present at some constant temperature, right? Temperature over here is kept constant. Perfect. Now, first of all, you must be thinking what is meant by volatile liquid? Let me tell you, volatile liquid is the one which has got tendency to form vapors. That liquid which has got the tendency to get converted into its vapors, that is what you call as volatile liquid. Any liquid? Any liquid which can form its vapors? which can form its vapors is what you call as is what you call as volatile liquid is what you call as volatile liquid for example you have got water water can get converted into its vapors so water is the volatile liquid so basically i have taken a volatile liquid over here now guys as soon as i kept the volatile liquid in this container, what will happen? Some of the water molecules will start getting converted into its vapors. Some of the, some of the volatile liquid, for example, which was water in the container, once I introduced water in this container, some of the water molecules, they escaped. They got converted into its vapors, right? So that is my first step. Once I introduce water in the container, what happened? I'll say evaporation started. I'll say evaporation started. After some time, you'll observe one more phenomenon. After some time, you'll observe one more phenomenon. You'll observe some of the vapors will start getting converted into liquid. Right? So initially, evaporation started. After some time, condensation started. Initially, some of the liquid molecules started getting converted into vapors. After some time, the vapor molecules, they started getting converted into liquid as well. Perfect. Perfect. Now we will try to understand. Initially, evaporation started. Then condensation started. There will be a scenario when, when one of the liquid molecule gets converted into vapor. At the same time, one vapor molecule gets converted into liquid. So basically, there will be a time when equilibrium will be established between the liquid and its vapors. There will be a time when equilibrium will be established between the liquid and its vapors. For example, I had the liquid X. Initially, what happened? It started getting converted into its vapors. Right? So what happened in the beginning? Evaporation started. After some time, these vapors again started getting converted into liquid, right? So after some time, I'll say condensation started, right? Then a time will reach when rate of evaporation and condensation becomes equal. At that point of time, I would say equilibrium, equilibrium is established between the liquid and its vapors. Now people try to understand. If equilibrium is established between liquid and its vapors, what does that mean? That means if one liquid molecule is getting converted into vapor, at the same time, one vapor is getting converted into liquid. So can I say, once equilibrium is established, can I say the amount of vapors generated over here, they become fixed. Once equilibrium is established, I'll say amount of vapors generated here will become fixed. Because if one liquid molecule is getting converted into vapor, at the same time, one vapor molecule is getting converted into liquid, right? So at equilibrium, 
at equilibrium i must say at equilibrium i must say amount of vapors generated are fixed amount of vapors generated are fixed now people since equilibrium is established now we have definite amount of vapors over here right now tell me will these vapors be in rest or they'll be in motion they'll be in motion can i say these vapors will be colliding with each other yes they'll be colliding with the walls of container as well so can i say these vapors are exerting pressure these vapors are exerting pressure because they are colliding with each other at the same time they are colliding with the walls of the container they are colliding with the topmost surface of the liquid as well right so can i see these vapors are exerting pressure over here they are generating some pressure that pressure which is exerted by the vapors of the volatile liquid when liquid and vapors are in equilibrium with each other that pressure is something which you call as vapor pressure let me know once if you got to know what this vapor pressure is first of all in order to define the vapor pressure your liquid and its vapors they must be in equilibrium they must be in equilibrium right the pressure exerted by the vapors the pressure exerted by the vapors of the volatile liquid when the volatile liquid and its vapors are at equilibrium with each other at a particular temperature that pressure exerted is something which you call as vapor pressure i hope you got the meaning of the term vapor pressure right now people what are the factors on which this vapor pressure depends on what are the factors before talking about the factors on which vapor pressure depends let me tell you the factors on which vapor pressure does not depend let me tell you vapor pressure do remember it does not depend on the amount of liquid it does not depend on the amount of liquid it does not depend on the amount of liquid for example this was water in the container imagine there were 500 ml of water in the container now we have got one more container which contains only 100 ml of water if both the containers are kept at same temperature their vapor pressure will be equal so vapor pressure it does not depend on the amount of liquid vapor pressure it does not depend on the shape of the container in which liquid is kept do remember these two points vapor pressure first of all it does not depend on the amount of liquid number one it does not depend on the shape of the container in which liquid is kept okay now what are the factors then on which this vapor pressure depends let's have a look on them factors affecting vapor pressure it's pretty much simple the first factor on which vapor pressure depends upon is something which you call as force of interaction force of interaction between the liquid molecules between the liquid molecules how we are going to justify it vapor pressure it depends on the force of interaction between the liquid molecules now it is it can be easily understood see below this layer we have got liquid on the top of this layer we have got vapors right now if i talk about this particular bulk if i talk about this particular liquid can i say there will be liquid liquid molecule interactions here right let's say we have got one liquid molecule here one liquid molecule they'll be interacting with each other right there'll be force of attraction between the liquid molecules absolutely right right people see this is the liquid in the container if i take two molecules from the bulk for example from the bulk they'll be attracting each other basically there'll be force of interaction between them which will hold them together now people can i say more the attraction between the liquid molecule more the attraction between the liquid molecules can i say lesser will be the escaping tendency more the attraction between the liquid molecules more the attraction between the liquid molecules lesser will be escaping tendency if lesser is the escaping tendency less vapors will get generated if less vapors are generating that means less will be the vapor pressure right that's all that's all so do remember more the force of interaction between the liquid molecules 
lesser is going to be the escaping tendency lesser is going to be the escaping tendency and and eventually lesser is going to be the vapor pressure lesser is going to be the vapor pressure point number one point number one point number two your vapor pressure it depends on temperature as well it depends on temperature as well these are the two main factors on which your vapor pressure depends now you must be thinking how vapor pressure depends on temperature this is something which you can easily understand tell me one thing increase the temperature when you increase the temperature of this liquid can i say there'll be more evaporation more evaporation means more vapors are getting generated if more vapors are getting generated more will the vapor pressure right so so on increasing the temperature on increasing the temperature what happens to the vapor pressure of the liquid vapor pressure it increases so can i say vapor pressure is directly proportional to temperature when you increase the temperature vapor pressure increases right and can i say vapor pressure is inversely proportional to the force of interaction between the liquid molecules more the interaction between the liquid molecules lesser the vapor pressure now people there is one equation now people there is one equation which quantitatively there is one equation which quantitatively gives you the idea how much the vapor pressure of liquid increases upon increasing the temperature there is one equation there is one equation which quantitatively gives you the idea which quantitatively gives you the idea of how much the vapor pressure of liquid increases upon increase the temperature that equation is something which you call as that equation is what you call as clausius clapeyron equation i'm not going to derive this equation because that's of no use correct i will be giving you the equation and remember that and remember that so the equation is something like this log of p2 divided by p1 is equal to delta h vaporization divided by r sorry divided by 2.303 r divided by 2.303 r this is 1 upon t1 minus 1 upon t2 now what these terms are what these terms are have a look have a look imagine i have got a liquid in the container and that liquid that liquid is in equilibrium with its vapors that liquid is in equilibrium with its vapors correct that liquid is in equilibrium with its vapors imagine at temperature t1 the vapor pressure was p1 now i'm changing the temperature from t1 to t2 and i'm assuming vapor pressure changed from p1 to p2 i'm assuming i'm changing the temperature from t1 to t2 and assuming that vapor pressure changed from p1 to p2 imagine people you have increased the temperature imagine you have increased the temperature if you have increased the temperature of this liquid if you have increased the temperature of this liquid tell me what will be the value of t2 minus t1 imagine you have the the liquid which was there in the container right the liquid which was there in the container imagine you are increasing its temperature if you are increasing its temperature so final temperature minus initial temperature will come out to be positive so this term will come out to be positive if you see it is t2 minus t1 so t2 minus t1 i'll say this term this term in the brackets will come out to be positive enthalpy of vaporization enthalpy of vaporization right it is vaporization is endothermic so it's always positive only so this term is positive this term is positive so can i say log of p2 by p1 will be positive can i say log of p2 divided by p1 will be positive when is that possible when is log x positive log of x is positive only if x is greater than 1 so i would say p2 divided by p1 here is greater than 1 which is clearly telling you that p2 is greater than p1 it is clearly telling you that p2 is greater than p1 what was p2 p2 was the vapor pressure of the liquid at temperature t2 p1 was the vapor pressure of the liquid at temperature t1 since you had increased the temperature you had increased the temperature and upon increase the temperature what happened to the vapor pressure vapor pressure increased that's it that's it i believe it's clear yeah is it clear my dear students quickly
क्विकली 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 एवरी वन एवरी वन सो डू रिमेंबर वेन यू इंक्रीज द टेम्परेचर वेपर प्रेशर इंक्रीजेस एंड दिस इक्वेशन एक्जैक्टली लेट्स यू नो हाउ द वेपर प्रेशर इंक्रीजेस अपॉन इंक्रीजिंग द टेम्परेचर perfectly done now from this equation can they ask any question from this equation can they ask any question they might they might who knows they might who knows but before solving that question before solving that question you should know what boiling point is what is a boiling point how do you define the term boiling point how do you define the term boiling point my dear students it's pretty much simple if i talk about the boiling point understand it is defined as the temperature the temperature at which the temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal the temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to the external pressure to the external pressure which is generally your atmospheric pressure what is meant by this which is generally our atmospheric pressure what is meant by this let's get to know this let's get to know this people try to understand what exactly i'm going to say try to understand what exactly i'm going to say because these are some basic points which you should know then only this chapter can get clear to you otherwise not otherwise not okay so this is your container for example this is your container in this container imagine you have kept a volatile liquid the volatile liquid is present till this surface this is the top surface of the volatile liquid imagine this is the top surface of the volatile liquid imagine this liquid right now is at temperature 25 degree centigrade just to make you understand this liquid for example this liquid is water imagine this volatile liquid is your water right so this liquid is right now at 25 degree centigrade so can i say at 25 degree centigrade this liquid will be in equilibrium with its vapors absolutely this liquid will be in equilibrium with its vapors this liquid will be in equilibrium with its vapors at a particular temperature imagine the vapor pressure of the liquid at 25 degree centigrade imagine the vapor pressure of the liquid at 25 degree centigrade for example that is 0.1 atm this is the vapor pressure of the liquid at 25 degree centigrade for example right outside this container what do we have atmosphere so can i say outside the external pressure which we have that is basically the atmospheric pressure imagine that is 1 atm outside the atmospheric pressure is 1 atm now tell me one thing at 25 degree centigrade vapor pressure of the liquid is less than that of atmospheric pressure yes now people tell me one thing if you want to increase the vapor pressure of this particular liquid what do we have to do if you want to increase the vapor pressure of this particular liquid can i say i have to supply heat i have to raise the temperature i have to raise the temperature in order to increase the vapor pressure of the liquid if i increase the temperature if i keep on increasing the temperature i'll say vapor pressure of liquid will be increasing can i say there will be a particular temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to external pressure can i say upon increasing the temperature continuously vapor pressure of the liquid will keep on increasing it will keep on increasing it will keep on increasing at some particular temperature vapor pressure of liquid becomes equal to atmospheric pressure and that particular temperature that particular temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to the external pressure becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure that particular temperature is what you call as boiling point right and you know in case of water that boiling point is how much that boiling point is 100 degree centigrade normally right so initially i kept the water at 25 degree centigrade at that point of time its vapor pressure was 0.1 atm now i slowly increased the temperature of water and when the temperature of water reached 100 degree when the temperature of water reached 100 degree at that point of time the vapor pressure of water became equal to the atmospheric pressure 
and that particular temperature at which vapor pressure becomes equal to your external pressure vapor pressure becomes equal to your external pressure that particular temperature is what you call as that's what you call as boiling point yes now guys try to understand one more thing i hope this particular scenario is completely clear i hope this particular scenario is completely clear just a second i hope this particular scenario is completely clear if you want to show it graphically if you want to show it graphically how do you show it graphically see imagine i'm plotting a graph between vapor pressure versus temperature now you know when you increase the temperature of the liquid its vapor pressure increases when you increase the temperature of the liquid its vapor pressure it will increase when you increase the temperature of the liquid when you increase the temperature of the liquid vapor pressure of the liquid increases right at this point vapor pressure is zero if you go up vapor pressure is increasing 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 let's say at this particular point your vapor pressure is 180 at this particular point for example the vapor pressure is 180 right which is basically the atmospheric pressure which is basically the atmospheric pressure my dear students the temperature the temperature the temperature the temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure the temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal to its atmospheric pressure that is something which you call as boiling point so this particular point will be representing your boiling point yes and this was the curve for what for a volatile liquid i believe this particular curve is clear if this is clear let me know once in the chats quickly if this is clear let me know once in the chats quickly <clears throat> quickly my dear students everyone and you know everyone means everyone yeah right people shape of the graph is curved it's curved it's curved it's not a straight line it's curved okay now guys there are two things which you have to remember directly one is called as standard boiling point one is called as normal boiling point when we talk about standard boiling point when we define standard boiling point at that point of time external pressure is kept as 1 bar when we define normal boiling point external pressure is kept as 1 atm that is the difference that is the difference if external pressure is 1 bar that means we are talking about standard boiling point if external pressure is 1 atm we are talking about we are talking about the normal boiling point we are talking about the normal boiling point i hope the term boiling point is clear okay now guys i just want to see your understanding of the concept i just want to see the understanding of your concept tell me the answer of this question on increasing on increasing the external pressure on increasing the external pressure on increasing the external pressure boiling point of the liquid boiling point of the volatile liquid does it increase or decrease what do you think use your brain use your brain when i increase the external pressure when i increase the external pressure will the boiling point of liquid increase or decrease quickly use your brain here use your brain here it's pretty much simple guys here the external pressure was 1 atm now in the second case for example external pressure is 5 atm in the second case for example external pressure is 5 atm so in the first case you are increasing the vapor pressure from 0.1 to 1 but here in the second case you have to increase the vapor pressure from 0.1 to 5 so here you have to increase the temperature a larger amount as compared to first so what does that mean that means vapor pressure increases sorry that means the boiling point increases right more the external pressure more the boiling point more the ex external pressure more should be the raise in temperature such that vapor pressure of liquid becomes equal to external pressure and if more is the rise in temperature that means more is the boiling point as simple as that yeah 
Let me know once in the chats if this particular point is clear. Let me know once in the chats if this particular point is clear. On increasing the external pressure, the boiling point of the volatile liquid that increases. Yes or no in the chats? Yes or no in the chats? Yes or no in the chats? <clears throat> These were two basic terminologies which you were supposed to know before starting the roll slot. Yes, J students can also watch it. Absolutely. <coughs> now, guys, this is something very important from which short, short question you guys are going to get. Short, short question you guys are going to get. Okay. Rolls law. So, what this Rolls law exactly is all about? Let me write its definition first. Then I'll make you understand what it means. Okay. This is important. All right. If I talk about the Rolls law, also says that the partial vapor pressure. Rod's law says that the partial vapor pressure. What am I writing here? The partial vapor pressure of the component of a component over the over the liquid solution over the liquid solution is directly proportional to the mole fraction is directly proportional to the mole fraction mole fraction of the same component of the same component in liquid phase or you can say in the solution phase now, what is meant by this particular statement? Try to understand very carefully. This is my first container. This is my second container. In the first container, till here, I am keeping a volatile liquid A. This is a volatile liquid A in the first container. And in the second container, what exactly am I doing? I am keeping the volatile liquid B in the second container. Okay. Temperature is fixed. Temperature is fixed. Temperature is fixed. Now guys, if this is a volatile liquid, what does that mean? What does that mean? That means there will be the vapors of A. And assume the vapors of liquid A are in equilibrium with the liquid. Imagine these vapors are in equilibrium with the liquid. Imagine the vapors of B are also in equilibrium with the liquid, right? So we are in a position to define their vapor pressures. Let's assume the vapor pressure here is P naught A. Let's assume the vapor pressure here is P naught B. Now, first of all, what is P naught A and what is P naught B? P naught A is the vapor pressure of liquid A when present in pure state. When present in pure state. You can see the first container. In the first container, we only have A. There is nothing added to it. Right? P naught B. What is P naught B? P naught B I am calling as vapor pressure of B. Vapor pressure of B when present in pure state. Vapor pressure of B when present in pure state. Okay. I've taken two volatile liquids which are in equilibrium with their vapors. So vapor pressure of A right here is P naught A. Vapor pressure of B right here is P naught B. Okay. Now guys, imagine the number of moles of liquid A in the container. The number of moles of liquid A in the container is Na. Number of moles of liquid B in the container is Nb. I'm talking about the moles of liquid A in the container and moles of liquid B in the container, right? Now people, just understand, if you mix these liquids, if you mix these liquids, if you mix these liquids, what do you get? What do you get? If you mix these liquids, I'll be getting a solution of A plus B. This is something which I'm calling as Solution of A and B. Absolutely, this is the solution of A and B. 
This is the solution of A and B. Now, A as well as B, both were volatile. So, over here in the solution, there are A particles as well as B particles, right? There are A particles as well as B particles. So, tell me one thing. Will here only be the vapors of A or there will be vapors of B as well? What do you think? Since both are volatile, if you are mixing them, in this particular space, you will find vapors of A as well as vapors of B, right? You will find vapors of A as well as vapors of B. So, over here, what is this particular thing? These are vapors of A as well as B. These are vapors of A as well as B. Okay? Now, people, the total vapor pressure of the solution, the total vapor pressure of the solution, I am representing by PS. PS or PT, choice is yours. The total vapor pressure of the solution. Will the total vapor pressure of solution B due to only the vapors of A, only the vapors of B or both will have contributed towards the total vapor pressure? What do you think? What do you think? Quickly. I'll say both the vapors of A as well as B would have contributed towards the total vapor pressure. As per Dalton's law, Dalton's law, the total vapor pressure will be, will be equal to the sum of contributions made by each the sum of contributions made by each this is as per which law this is not as per Rolt's law this is as per Dalton's law this is as per Dalton's law you should know this the total vapor pressure of the solution will be the sum of will be the sum of contributions made by each of the A and B vapors and you call these contributions as the partial vapor pressures this is something which I call as partial vapor pressure of A. Similarly, this is something which I call as partial vapor pressure of B. Partial vapor pressure of B. Now, what Dalton said, what, what Rolt's law exactly is all about? Now, what Rolt's law exactly is all about? Rolt's law says that the partial vapor pressure, for example, the partial vapor pressure of A, Rolt's law says that the partial vapor pressure of a component, for example, the partial vapor pressure of A. I hope you know what is the partial vapor pressure of A. This is the partial vapor pressure of A. Rod's law says that the partial vapor pressure of A is directly proportional to mole fraction of A in the solution phase. Mole fraction of A in the solution phase. More the mole fraction of A in the solution phase. More the mole fraction of A in the solution phase more will be the moles of A in the solution. And if more moles of A are then the solution, more vapors of A would have got generated. That means A would have contributed more towards total vapor pressure. Right? Right, people? Right? So, the sky A. What is the sky A? This is, this is the mole fraction of A in which phase? In the solution phase, in the liquid phase, right? Correct? More, again, I'm telling you the same thing. More the mole fraction of A in the liquid, what does that mean? That means more are the moles of A in the solution. If more moles of A are there in the solution, that means more vapors of A would have got generated. If more vapors of A would have got generated, I'll say, a would have contributed more towards the vapor pressure, towards the total vapor pressure. What does that mean? That means more will be the partial vapor pressure of A. More will be the partial vapor pressure of A. So if I remove this proportionality, if I remove this proportionality, you will get a constant and the constant here is P naught A multiplied by what? Multiplied by chi A. Right? So the partial vapor pressure, the partial vapor pressure of A is equal to vapor pressure of A in pure state multiplied by mole fraction of A in the solution phase. In the similar way, in the similar way people, if I write PB, partial vapor pressure of B, partial vapor pressure of B, that will be directly proportional to mole fraction of B in the solution phase and if you remove the proportionality sign, you will be getting P naught B multiplied by chi B. This is again one more equation which I got, right? And what is the sky B here? Chi B is something which I call as mole fraction of B in the solution phase mole fraction of B in the solution phase. And I believe this P naught A, P naught B already you know. What is P naught A? P naught A is the vapor pressure of A in which state? In pure state. 
in pure state and what is p not b p not b is the vapor pressure of b in the pure state right what is p a p a is the partial vapor pressure it is the partial vapor pressure of a right is the partial vapor pressure of a in the solution right what is pb pb is the partial vapor pressure of b or you call them as the contribution of a and b towards the total vapor pressure of the solution correct right people this is something which you call as which law this is your Rolle's law basically this is your simplest statement of the Rolle's law which you have to remember now 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 there are some other versions as well there are some other things which you need to know about Rolle's law as well what are those things the first thing which you need to know the first thing which you need to know if i ask you to plot a graph if i ask you to plot a graph between pa and chi a what do you think will be the nature of the graph first one second one if i ask you to plot a graph between pb versus chi b what will be the nature of graph if i ask you what will be the nature of the graph between pa versus chi b nature of the graph if i ask you what will be the nature of the graph between pb versus chi a you should be in a position to make these graphs you should be in a position to make these graphs have a look you know as per your Rolle's law pa is equal to p naught a multiplied by chi a correct pa you are plotting along y axis so this is your y chi a you are plotting along x axis so this has to be m so y is equal to mx y is equal to mx y is equal to mx straight line what about the slope of it its slope will be simply equal to p naught a right similarly we already know pb is nothing it is p naught b multiplied by chi b pb you are plotting along y axis chi b you are plotting along x axis this is your m so y is equal to mx again a straight line what about its slope its slope will be simply equal to p naught b right right now have a look here you know you know your pa you know it is p naught a multiplied by chi a what is chi a chi a is the mole fraction of a in the liquid phase in the solution phase mole fraction of a in the solution phase in the solution phase can you write it like this p a is equal to p naught a understand understand chi a is the mole fraction of a in the solution phase chi b is the mole fraction of b in the solution phase can i say here can i say here chi a plus chi b it has to be one chi a plus chi b it has to be one if chi a plus chi b has to be one so instead of chi i can write one minus chi b absolutely i can do that so p a has to be equal to p naught a minus p naught a chi b correct p a you are plotting along y axis chi b you are plotting along x axis so this has to be your m the sign is minus so this is c y is equal to minus mx plus c y is equal to minus mx plus c minus mx plus c slope slope is equal to minus p naught a intercept intercept is equal to p naught a right intercept is equal to p naught a same goes for the another curve right it will be like this and what about the slope slope here will be guys i hope you got it i hope you got it similar minus p naught b minus p naught b what about the intercept intercept will be p naught b right let me know once in the chats if it's clear quickly let me know in the chats if it's clear quickly let me know in the chats if it's clear okay if this is clear if this is clear then then let's move on to some special cases of the Rolle's law special case of the Rolle's law but before talking about this tell me once in the chats if all the things are clear and i want everyone to speak quickly guys these basic things are very important if they are getting clear it will not take us more than three to four hours to cover the complete chapter trust me on that if these things are getting clear all right 
All right. So if this is clear, Rolt's law for a solution containing volatile liquids. The same scenario, I mean. The same scenario. You know, this was volatile liquid A, volatile liquid B. Now you mix them up, right? Let you, now you mix them up. Perfect. This is a solution. This is a solution containing A and B. And these are the vapors of A and B here. Perfect. The total vapor pressure of the solution is the sum of the contributions made by the vapors of A and B here. Correct. Right. Now guys, understand what exactly I will have to do here. Let me keep this slide over here. Have a look. We already know total vapor pressure of the solution is equal to PA plus PB. PA plus PB. Now people, PS is equal to. Instead of PA, I can write P naught A chi A. Instead of PB, you know, you can write P naught B chi B. This is one of the equations which you have to remember from which you can get the questions. First equation from which question is going to come. Right? First equation from which question is going to come. And simple question. Second. Second. Since we already know. Since we already know. Since we already know chi A plus chi B is equal to 1. Mole fraction of A and B in the solution phase is equal to 1. So what I'll do over here. I'll write P naught A chi A as such. Let me replace chi B with what? With 1 minus chi A. Let me replace this chi B with 1 minus chi A. So I can write PS is equal to P naught A chi A plus this will be P naught B minus P naught B multiplied by chi A. Now people what we can do at the end? This is chi A, this is chi A. Take chi A common, right? But first I'll write P naught B. Let me write P naught B first. After that, I'm taking chi A common. It'll be P naught A minus P naught B. It'll be P naught A minus P naught B. And what have I taken common? I have taken chi A common. This is one more equation from which question is going to come. One more equation from which question is going to come. One more equation from which question is going to come. What about the next equation from which the question is going to come? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Since in this equation over here, I replaced chi B with 1 minus chi A. I could have done one more thing. I could have replaced chi A as well. Instead of chi A, I could have written 1 minus chi B. Let's do that too. So PS will be equal to, this is P naught A. Instead of chi A, I'm writing 1 minus chi B. Right? And over here, what do we have? We have got P naught B multiplied by chi B. Now what you need to do, just make this equation in the proper format, nothing else. Make this equation in the proper format, nothing else. So I'll write PS is equal to P naught A, I'm writing as such. Here I'm taking chi B common. So it will be P naught B minus P naught A multiplied by chi B. So this is one more equation for the Rolt's law, which we are supposed to remember. Well, I would suggest you to remember this equation and these two, eventually you can generate. Eventually you can generate them. Eventually you can generate them. Right? Eventually you can generate them. Now guys, there is one very, very, very important graph which we need to understand. I know majority of the students would have remembered that graph for now, till now. But you need to understand that graph. That is very important. Okay? So let me make that particular graph which is related to Rolt's law. Let me make the particular graph which is related to Rolt's law. First of all, before plotting the graph, before pl plotting the graph, I'm not showing you any questions yet. Questions will be done in some time. Right? Before showing you the graph, let me make this scenario again. This is a solution of A and B. This is a solution of A and B. And A and B both were volatile. Right? So over here you have got vapors of A as well as B. Vapors of A as well as B. Correct? Right? Total vapor pressure of the solution was contribution made by each PA plus PB. And your PA as per Rolt's law is equal to P naught A chi A. Your PB is equal to what? PB is equal to P naught B chi B. Right? Where chi A and chi B, these are the mole fractions of A and B in the liquid state. And already there is one more thing. Chi A plus chi B, already we know that is 1. These are the things which we already have discussed. 
these are the things which already we have discussed these are the things which already we have discussed now guys it's time to plot one very important graph right which you need to understand basically which you need to understand which you need to understand which you need to understand have a look on this particular side i'm plotting vapor pressure on this particular side i'm plotting mole fraction chi mole fraction so what is chi chi is the mole fraction of the component in the solution phase in liquid phase chi is the mole fraction of the component in the liquid phase in the solution phase okay now my dear students try to understand what exactly i'll be doing try to understand what exactly i'll be doing imagine at this particular point imagine at this particular point imagine your chi a is equal to zero for example if chi a becomes zero that means chi b will be equal to one so at this particular point either you say chi b is zero or, or you Either you say chi is equal to 0 or you can say chi b is equal to 1. Now try to understand this. If chi a is equal to 0, what does that mean? That means mole fraction of a in the solution phase is 0. That means a is not there in the container. What is there in the container? There is only b in the container. There is only b in the container. So I will say b is present in its pure state. So whatever will be the vapor pressure right now that will be due to pure b and vapor pressure due to pure b is represented for example by p naught b so this is for example your p naught b i hope you got this particular point what i said right i hope you got this particular point now people if you go in the forward direction in the forward direction what you'll observe chi a will increase and chi b will decrease see at this point chi a was zero chi b was 1. At this particular point, chi b or let me write it as chi a, chi a will be 1 and chi b will be 0. 1 plus 0 makes it 1. Chi a plus chi b has to be 1. Here it's 1, here it's 1. Everywhere on this particular line, chi a plus chi b will be 1 only. Okay. Look at this particular point. At this particular point, chi a is 1, chi b is 0. What does that mean? Chi a is 1 chi b is 0. chi b is 0 means mole fraction of b. Mole fraction of b in the solution is 0. That means there is no b in the container. If there is no b in the container, that means there is only a in the container. If there is only a in the container, what does that mean? That means the vapor pressure right now will be due to pure a and vapor pressure due to pure a is represented by p naught a. Imagine this is your p naught a. This point is your p naught a. I hope you got this. I hope you got this. Now try to understand very carefully. If you move in the forward direction, here chi a is 0, here chi a is 1. So on moving in the forward direction, chi a is increasing. On moving in the forward direction, chi a is increasing. If chi a is increasing, that means p a is increasing. On moving in the forward direction, chi a is increasing. Chi a increasing means mole fraction of a in the solution phase is increasing. If mole fraction of A in the solution phase increases, can I say more vapors of A will be there? Can I say more will be the contribution of A towards the total vapor pressure? Right? Do you get this? Do you get this point? From here to here, chi A is increasing. If chi A is increasing, mole fraction of A in the solution phase is increasing. Right? If mole fraction of A in the solution phase is increasing, that means moles of A in the solution phase. Moles of A in the solution phase are increasing. That means at that time you'll find more vapors of A. If you find more vapors of A, if vapors of A gener if vapors of A are getting increased, what does that mean? If vapors of A generated gets increased, that means contribution made by A towards the total vapor pressure also increase. Yes. So what should be the nature of the graph? The nature of the graph has to be like this. On moving from here to here, right? The contribution made by A towards the total vapor pressure. The contribution made by A towards the total vapor pressure. That increases. That increases from hair to hair. 
Correct? And what will be the equation of this straight line? It will be PA is equal to P naught A chi A. This is the equation of the straight line. Right? This is the equation of this particular straight line. Perfect. You can check it out too. At this point, chi A is 1. If chi A is 1, that means it is P naught A. Perfect. Now try to understand it like this. At this particular point, chi B is 1. Chi B is 1 means in the container, there is only B. Imagine there is only B here. Imagine there is only B here. Right? So whatever vapors will be here, those are due to pure B. And vapor pressure due to pure B is P naught B, which I mentioned over here. Now tell me, if you move forward, if you move forward, is the chi B increasing or decreasing? Here it is 1, here it is 0. If you move forward, chi B is, chi B is decreasing. If chi B is decreasing, that means mole fraction of B in the solution phase is decreasing. If mole fraction of B in the solution phase is decreasing, that means, that means vapors of B over here will be decreasing as well. If this term is decreasing, that means this term will be decreasing. Vapors of B will be decreasing here. If vapors of B will be decreasing, what does that mean? That means contribution made by B towards the total vapor pressure will be decreasing. Right? So, what will be the nature of the curve? On moving from here to here, contribution made by B towards the total vapor pressure, that, that decreases like this. Like this. If I ask you, what will be the equation for this line? It will be PB is equal to P naught B multiplied by chi B. Right? And one thing which I have assumed, from the graph, this is your P naught B. This is your P naught A. I had already assumed P naught A is greater than P naught B. You can assume the reverse. P naught B is greater than P naught A. The choice is all yours. Okay? Now, my dear students, if I join this particular point from here to here, if I join, if I join this particular point from here to here, right? This particular line, this represents the total vapor pressure of the solution, which is equal to PA plus PB, or you can raise, write P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Right? Tell me if this graph is absolutely clear to everyone or not. Quickly, people. Quickly, everyone in the chats. I want everyone to let me know in the chats if this is absolutely clear to you or not. Quickly. Quickly, people. Yeah? Guys, I want everyone to say it, yeah? Don't sleep. Don't sleep, yeah? Just say it quickly. Just say it quickly. All the things are clear? <clears throat> Perfect. Now there is one more question. Guys, you have to remember all these concepts which I'm giving you, okay? Now there is one more concept, then there will be a lot of questions. There will be a lot of questions then. Dinner break will do at 9.30. Dinner break will happen at 9.30. Okay. Calculation of mole fraction of components in vapor phase. Guys, from this a particular type of question is asked. From this a particular type of question is asked. Imagine this is your container. And in this container, what do we have for example? We have got a solution of A plus B. This is a solution of two volatile liquids A and B. Right? This is the solution of two volatile liquids A and B. Correct? 
Imagine the moles of A in the liquid phase is Na. Moles of B in the liquid phase is Nb. Now, if you understand it carefully, on the top, there'll be vapors of A as well as B. On the top, there'll be vapors of A as well as B. Correct? Let's say, let's say, the number of moles of A in the vapor phase is Na dash. Number of moles of B in the vapor phase is Nb dash. Is Nb dash. Be careful with the terms. This A, this Na represents mole fraction of A in the liquid phase. Na dash represents mole fraction of the vapors of A overhead. Right? If you look at this particular chamber, this part of the container, this part of the container, it contains basically two vapors. Vapors of A as well as vapors of B. So I would say this part of the chamber contains a gaseous mixture. This part of the chamber contains a gaseous mixture. And that gaseous mixture contains two gases, A and B. Correct? It contains two gases, A and B. And as per Dalton's law, the total vapor pressure will be the contributions made by each gas, Pa plus Pb. Correct? As per Dalton's law, Pa, Pa, which is the contribution made by the vapors of A towards the total vapor pressure. As per Dalton's law, as per Dalton's law, that has to be equal to total pressure, total pressure of this mixture, which is basically total vapor pressure of the solution, multiplied by mole fraction of A in the vapor phase. So imagine chi A dash represents mole fraction of A in this mixture, and here chi A, it represents mole fraction of A in this solution. So these are two different things. One is mole fraction of A in this mixture. That is basically the mole fraction of gas A in the mixture. This chi A is the mole fraction of A in this solution. These are two different things. Similarly, chi B dash, this is the mole fraction of B in this particular mixture. And chi B, it is the mole fraction of B in the solution phase. I hope these two things are clear. If these things are clear, PA, PA is the contribution made by A towards the total vapor pressure. As per Dalton's law, it has to be equal to total, total pressure multiplied by mole fraction of A in this mixture. Right? This is your Dalton's law. This is your Dalton's law. Now, as per Rolf's law, what is PA? As per Rolf's law, your PA is P naught A multiplied by chi A. This chi A is mole fraction of A in the solution phase. This is as per your Rolf's law. Now see, this term is giving you PA. This term is giving you PA. If you compare them, when you compare them, you get something like this. PS multiplied by chi A dash is equal to P naught A multiplied by chi A. And from this particular equation, you can calculate chi A dash, which will be P naught A multiplied by chi A divided by PS. So what is this particular term? What is this particular amazing term, guys? What is this particular amazing term? There will be some questions in which you will be asked to calculate the mole fraction of A in the vapor phase. Right? Similarly, you will be asked to calculate mole fraction of B in the vapor phase, chi dash B, which will be equal to P naught B multiplied by chi B divided by PS. It is just you have to be careful with the terminologies. You have to be careful with the terminologies. Let me write the terminologies again so that it won't be a confusion for you. Chi A dash is equal to, it is the mole fraction of A in vapor phase. In vapor phase. Chi A is the mole fraction of A in which phase? In solution phase or you can say liquid phase. Same goes for Chi B and Chi B dash. Okay? So these two questions are asked. After a few minutes, you'll get to know about the questions as well. But before doing the questions, there is one more thing which you must know, which is again very important. Which is again very important. What is that? That is vapor pressure of the solution. Vapor pressure of the solution containing a non-volatile solute. What is meant by this? What is meant by this? Try to understand people. Try to understand very carefully what it means. Because this forms, this particular topic, it forms the basis of your first colligative property that is the relative lowering in vapor pressure. 
this particular topic it forms the basis of your first topic that is related to lowering in vapor pressure so you have to understand it very carefully i'm again taking two containers these are two containers imagine imagine or just a second just a second people see instead of two containers let me take only one container let's say this is your container and in this particular container imagine you have got a volatile liquid a this is a volatile liquid a in the container here is a concept here is a concept first thing if you look at the top surface can i say on the top surface there will be only a particles absolutely because a is right now in pure state there will be only a particles on the top surface because a is in pure state of course a is in pure state okay so so i would say there will be only the vapors of a here right so vapor pressure when a is present in its pure state is represented by p not a right this is p not a now guys imagine in the same container imagine in the same container you are introducing a non volatile solute imagine in the same container you are introducing a non volatile solute non volatile solute means that solute which cannot form its vapors you are introducing one more liquid for example that liquid is non volatile right introducing non volatile solute in the same container that that solute you are introducing which cannot form its vapors now if you are introducing the non volatile solute what will happen what will happen in the container in the container what do i get i got a solution of let's say the name of this non volatile solute is b i got a solution of a and b again absolutely i got the solution of a and b but this solution has two components a and b since a is volatile but b is non volatile b is non volatile b is non volatile Tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. On the top surface, on the top surface here, will there be only will there be only A particles or there will be B particles as well on this surface? If I just need to make you understand, if I just need to make you understand, on this surface, for example, there will be A particles as well as, as, well as B particles. Similarly, in the bulk, there will be A particles as well as B particles, right? Let's say these are the B particles. These are the B particles. Correct? These are the B particles. now over here as you see there are a as well as b here a as well as b here only a can get converted into vapors only a can form its vapors right only a can form its vapors b cannot form its vapors some from bulk will go top will go at the top right only a can form its vapors b cannot form its vapors now tell me one thing over here only a particles were there and all the a particles were volatile and all a particles right had got the tendency to get converted into vapors but here you have got a as well as b b is non volatile so can you think over it and let me know among these two cases where will be the probability of vapor formation less where will be the amount of vapor generated less quickly tell me that where will be the amount of vapor generated less in this particular case there is a as well as b only a is volatile b is non volatile right okay so over here you can only find the vapors of a that to in minimal amount that to in minimal amount just just to make you understand it just to make you remember it over here at the surface there are b as well over here only there were all volatile particles here there are some non volatile particles as well which cannot form its vapors right perfect so the vapor pressure of the solution the vapor pressure of this particular solution it was supposed to be pa plus pb it was supposed to be pa plus pb but b is non volatile b has no contribution b has no contribution towards the total vapor pressure right so can i say ps is nothing it is just pa i'll say ps will be equaled P A is P not A multiplied by K A as per Rolle's law. As per Rolle's law. As per Rolle's law. Correct. Perfect. So here one thing has to be addressed. Here one thing has to be addressed. When you had only pure A in the container, its vapor pressure was P not A. Now you added a non-volatile solute. What happened to vapor pressure? Has vapor pressure increased or decreased? 
the probability of vapor formation here was more the probability of vapor formation here is less because it contains some non volatile particles as well which cannot form its vapors so can i say can i say on adding on adding non volatile solute on adding non volatile solute into a volatile liquid into a volatile liquid vapor pressure decreases vapor pressure decreases and and that decrease in the vapor pressure that decrease in the vapor pressure is called as lowering in vapor pressure is called as lowering in vapor pressure and that lowering in vapor pressure is represented by delta p delta p so if i ask you how much vapor pressure has decreased you will say initially it was p not finally it is p not chi so how much vapor pressure has decreased initially it was p not a and finally it is p not a chi a so p not a minus p not a chi a. this will give me the decrease in the vapor pressure by the way this is the logic which i'm giving you so that you can remember the actual reason is the th are the thermodynamic reasons i can explain the same scenario correctly on the base of entropy right but you need not remember that you need not remember that okay just remember it like this in short perfect okay? this is how you can remember it the actual reasons are entropy oriented the actual reasons are entropy oriented which you need to need not to know okay perfect now people one more thing one more thing one more thing decrease in the vapor pressure initially it was p not a now it's p not a chi a this is something which i call as decrease in the vapor pressure this is something which you call as lowering in vapor pressure if you take p not a common it will be 1 minus chi a 1 minus chi a is chi b so you can write it like this as well p not a out taken common 1 minus chi a is nothing that's chi b perfect so this particular statement i believe is clear to everyone so when you add a non volatile solute into a volatile liquid when you add non volatile solute into a volatile liquid when you end, when you put non volatile solute into a volatile liquid what happens to the vapor pressure it decreases that decrease in the vapor pressure is what you call as lowering in vapor pressure right perfect now with this your rolls law is over let's try to do some questions the first question on your screen the first question on your screen <clears throat> the normal boiling point of water is 373 kelvin if you remember i gave you two terms one is normal boiling point one is standard boiling point when we talk about the normal boiling point when we talk about the normal boiling point at that point of time external pressure is kept at 1 atm if you remember and we are talking about the boiling point of water we are talking about the boiling point of water right which is how much 373 kelvin that means at 373 kelvin the vapor pressure of water the vapor pressure of water the vapor pressure of water would have got equal to the atmospheric pressure external pressure which is 180 so this was the thing which was supposed to be concluded from here right this was the thing here which you had to conclude perfect the boiling point of water is given as 373 kelvin that means at 373 kelvin vapor pressure of water would be equal to what would be equal to external pressure which in normal boiling point case is 1 atm perfect now as per the question is concerned vapor pressure of water at temperature t kelvin is 19 mm of hg so when the temperature is t kelvin vapor pressure of water is how much it is equal to 19 mm of hg 19 mm of hg so 1 atm you can write as 760 mm of hg you can convert it here only correct so if you look if you look at it carefully initially the vapor pressure was 19 mm of hg then you have increased the temperature basically you have increased the temperature that's why vapor pressure has increased perfect delta h vapor pressure is given delta h vapor pressure is given let me write it over here let me mention it over here delta h vapor pressure is equal to 40.67 kilojoules i'll be converting it into joules and raise for 3 joules per mole then the temperature t would be we have to calculate this t this t we have to calculate right so if you look at this particular case carefully 
initially the vapor pressure was 19 then finally at the boiling point vapor pressure is 760 so boiling vapor pressure is increasing how vapor pressure is increasing when you have increased the temperature so initial temperature is t and the final temperature is 373 kelvin initial vapor pressure is how much it is 19 and final vapor pressure is 760 now you have one equation that is clausius clapeyron equation log of p2 divided by p1 is equal delta h vaporization divided by 2.303 this is r this is 1 upon t1 minus 1 upon t2 1 upon t2 right so you have all the parameters people you have p2 you have p1 value correct you have delta h vaporization correct r value 8.314 t1 is to be calculated t2 is given one equation one unknown that's it that's it when you solve this question you'll be getting the final result as 290 sum okay correct <laughs> correct guys is it clear is it clear i hope this is clear to everyone moving on to one more simple question the vapor pressure of two pure liquids a and b that means they are giving the p naught a and p naught b value p naught a is 100 torr and as per the question p naught b is how much it is 80 torr it is 80 torr calculate the total vapor pressure of the solution obtained by mixing two moles of a and three moles of b so moles of a is two moles of b are three what do i have to calculate i have to calculate the vapor pressure of the solution you know it vapor pressure of the solution is equal to p naught a chi a plus what plus p naught b chi b correct so p s is equal to p naught a i'm writing as such what is chi a chi means moles of a divided by total moles present in the container yes similarly this is going to be p naught b moles of b divided by total moles present in the container correct so this is p s is equal to p naught a what is p naught a that's 100. Number of moles of A in the solution phase, that's 2. Divide by total moles, 2 plus 3, 5. Plus P naught B, that's 80. Moles of B, 3. Total moles, 3 plus 3, 2, 5. Right? Solve it. This will give you the total vapor pressure of the solution. Correct? People are saying it's coming out to be 88 torr. Of course, it can come as 88 torr. Absolutely, it's coming out to be 88 torr. Right? Okay, guys. I believe this is clear. Let's move on to one more question. Let's move on to one more question. Look at this particular question carefully. See what the question says. Two liquids A and B, they form an ideal solution. So we have got two liquids, they are forming an ideal solution. At 300 Kelvin, the vapor pressure of the solution, the vapor pressure of the solution containing one mole of A, the vapor pressure of the solution containing one mole of A and three moles of B is how much? Vapor pressure of the solution containing this much is equal to 500 mm of Hg. At the same temperature, if one more mole of B is further added, so first of all, you had a container which contained one mole of A and two moles of B in the solution phase. Three moles of B in the solution phase. Now, you are introducing one more mole of B when you are introducing one mole of one more mole of B, nothing will happen to the moles of A. Moles of A will remain the same, but moles of B now will be three plus one four. Correct? If one more mole of B is added, the vapor pressure of the solution increased by ten m of Hg. So initially, the vapor pressure of the solution was five hundred. Now it will be five hundred ten m of Hg. I hope you are understanding these things. I hope you are understanding these things. Guys, is there any lag? Is there any lag? Is there any lag, people? No, right? Because on my screen, the cursor is continuously rotating. I thought there is a lag or something.
All right. So initially you had a container basically, right? Initially you had a container. Initially you had a container in which the solution which we had. In the solution there was one mole of A and three moles of B. Vapor pressure of that solution was given. Now you have introduced one more mole of B. So moles of B in the solution are now four. Moles of A are same. Due to which vapor pressure of the solution has increased by 10 mm of Hg. So total vapor pressure of the solution now is going to be 510 mm of Hg. We have to calculate what? P not A, P not B. So basically, I have got two conditions. If I use first condition, PS has to be equal to P not A chi A here plus P not B chi B here. So PS is given to me as how much? 500 is equal to P not A as such chi A. Moles of A divided by total moles right now. So it is 1 by 4. It is 1 by 4 plus this will be P not B as such. Mole fraction of B. Moles of B divided by total moles right now. 3 plus 1, 4. So I got one equation. I got one equation. Now look at the second case. Look at the second case. Total vapor pressure of the solution. You know it has to be equal to P not A multiplied by chi A plus P not B multiplied by chi B. So total vapor pressure of the solution is 510 is equal to P not A right as such. What is chi A right now? What is mole fraction of A right now? It will be moles of A divided by total moles here are 4 plus 1, 5. Plus, this is P not B and it's going to be 4 divided by 5 now. So if you look at these two equations, you got two equations and two unknowns. Two equations, two unknowns. You can solve them easily by either substitution method or elimination method or cross multiplication method, whatever methods you know. By means of that, you can easily get P not A and you can get P not B as well. Those were the two things which I was supposed to calculate. Nothing else. I hope this sort of a question is clear to you. You can solve this sort of a question. Look at one more question. The vapor pressure of pure liquid A, the vapor pressure of pure liquid A, so basically they are talking about P naught A. The vapor pressure of pure liquid A is 70 torr. Okay. The vapor pressure of pure liquid A is 70 torr. It forms an ideal solution with another liquid B. Okay. The mole fraction of B in the solution. Mole fraction of B in the solution is 0 0.2. That means mole fraction of A in the solution will be 0 0.8. Total vapor pressure of the solution is also given. 84 torr. Total vapor pressure of the solution is also given. 84 torr. What do we have to calculate? We, do have, we have to calculate P naught B. We have to calculate P naught B. It's a simple question guys. It's a simple question. Have a look. I'll say total vapor pressure of the solution is nothing. That is P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Correct? What is PS? PS is given as 84 torr is equal to P naught A is 70. Mole fraction of A is 0. Uh, 0. 0.8 plus P naught B. You have to calculate. Chi B is 0. 0.2. So again, one equation, one unknown. From here, you can easily calculate P naught B. That is something which you are supposed to calculate, right? Correct? So nothing to think in these questions, guys. You can easily kill them now. You can easily kill them. You can easily kill them. For example, there is one more question. This can be asked too. This can be asked too. A solution has 1 is to 4 molar ratio of pentane and hexane. A solution has 1 is to 4 molar ratio of pentane and hexane. If the P0 values are this and this, calculate the mole fraction of pentane in the vapor phase. So let me make you understand the question first of all. This is the container. In this container, you have got a solution. This is a solution for example. This is a solution of pentane and hexane. This is a solution of pentane and hexane, right? Molar ratio of pentane and hexane. Let me call this as A. Let me call this as B, okay? Their molar ratio in the solution phase is given. So chi A divided by chi B. Chi A divided by chi B is given to me as 1 by 4. Chi A divided by chi B is given to me as 1 by 4. Right? It is given to me as 1 by 4. P not A and P not B values are also given to me. P not A is equal to how much? 440 mm of Hg. And P not B is given to me as 120 mm of Hg. Calculate the mole fraction of pentane in the vapor phase. So you have to calculate chi A dash basically. Right? So 
few minutes back, I've told you how to calculate mole fraction of the component in the vapor phase. It'll be equal to P naught A multiplied by chi A divided by PS. Correct? Divided by PS. Right, guys? So, can you solve it further? Can you solve it further? So, first of all, P naught A is given to me. Right? P naught A is given to me. So, let me do one thing. Let me first of all calculate PS. Total vapor pressure of the solution. Total vapor pressure of the solution. It has to be equal to P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Correct? So, PS has to be equal to. What is P naught A? P naught A is 440. Chi A. Chi A by chi B is equal to 1 by 4. What does that mean? That means if chi A is X, chi B will be 4X. Right? Correct? So, chi A I'm calling as X plus P naught B. Chi B will be how much? 4X. And P naught B is given to me as 120. So, it's 120 into 4X. So, this value will come out to be 440X plus this will be 480X. So, PS comes out to be 08412, 4489920X. This is your total wave pressure of the solution. Now, put it here in this expression. What do I get? I'll get mole fraction of A in the vapor phase is equal to P naught A. P naught A is nothing. That's 440. What is chi A? Chi A is X divided by. What is PS? That is 920X. So, XX cancelled. Mole fraction of A in the vapor phase is coming out to be 440 divided by 920. Right? This is the vapor. This is the mole fraction of A in the vapor phase. If you got the mole fraction of A in the vapor phase, can you calculate mole fraction of B in the vapor phase? Absolutely. Chi A dash plus chi B dash will be 1. So, chi B dash will be 1 minus 440 divided by 920. So, all this, this will give you chi B dash. Is it clear? I hope this is clear. So, with this our Rolt law is clear. And now it is the time for ideal, non-ideal solutions. So, do you want to take a break here or continue? Do you want to take a break here or continue? Tell me that. Tell me that thing quickly. Do you want to take a break here or you want to continue? <clears throat> Everyone. But are you promising that you guys will be back on time? Is it a promise with your teacher? Is it a promise with your teacher? First, everybody should write promise in the chats. Then only I can leave you. And the chat should flow like anything. Chat should flow like anything. That should flow like anything. Don't you understand my angrizi? Quickly, 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 quickly. Okay, let me give you a break for some time. It's a dinner break. Go have a dinner. But what time you'll be back? Just tell me that. What time will you be back? It's 9.10 now.
so i'll be resuming the session at at 9:45 sharp everyone be back okay this chapter will still take some 4 hours this chapter will still take some 4 hours not less than that because i've taught everything in detail now okay perfect see you after the break then see you guys
<laughs> What's up, people? Is everyone back? Yeah, is everything everyone back? <coughs> all right so what's up how are you all doing how are you all doing sleepy yes i'm done with my dinner what about you guys are you done are you guys done? <coughs> Perfect. <coughs> Just give me a second. <coughs> All right, so tell me the topics which we covered till now are all the topics clear till here? Tell me the topics which we have covered till now are all the topics clear till now? <coughs> are all the topics clear till now? Let me know once in the chats, everyone. Everyone. Yeah? <coughs> Perfect guys. So let's get going then without wasting a lot of a time. Let's get going. Let's have a look on the topic which is ideal solutions. So first of all, how do you exactly define the term ideal solution? Let me quickly write its definition first then I'll make you understand what these ideal solutions are all about and what kind of questions are framed from the ideal non-ideal solutions. Have a look people. How do we exactly define the ideal solutions? Let me tell you these are the solutions that obey that obey Rolls law <clears throat> under all compositions the solutions which obey the Rolls law under all compositions those are what we call as ideal solutions now what is meant by it what is meant by it have a look people try to understand exactly what I'll be talking about <coughs> see First of all, if I talk about the vapor pressure, if I talk about the vapor pressure of the solution, which we represent by PS, vapor pressure of the solution. Okay. Dear students, there are basically two ways. There are two ways by means of which we can calculate the vapor pressure of solution. There are two ways by means of which we can calculate vapor pressure of the solution. One is experimentally, experimentally with the help of manometer. Vapor pressure of the solution can be calculated by two ways. One experimentally with the help of manometer and theoretically and theoretically, it can be calculated with the help of with the help of Rolle's law. Okay, so in order to calculate the vapor pressure of the solution, we have got two ways. 
we can calculate vapor pressure of the solution experimentally with the help of manometer or we can calculate vapor pressure of the solution heretically with the help of Rolle's law. Whenever we calculate vapor pressure of the solution experimentally, that is what you call as the actual vapor pressure of the solution. That's what you call as the actual vapor pressure of the solution. Or you can call it as the observed vapor pressure of the solution. Okay. Whenever you calculate the vapor pressure of the solution with the help of Rolle's law, you call that vapor pressure of the solution as the theoretical vapor pressure. You call that vapor pressure of the solution as the theoretical vapor pressure. And as per your Rolle's law, your theoretical vapor pressure is nothing. Theoretical vapor pressure of the solution is equal to P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Correct? So first of all, I want you guys to remember these two things. I want you guys to remember these two things. There are two ways by means of which we can calculate the vapor pressure of the solution. One experimentally. One experimentally, right, with the help of manometer. Another one with the help of Rolle's law. And that vapor pressure of the solution which is calculated with the help of Rolle's law, you call that as the theoretical vapor pressure. You call that as the theoretical vapor pressure. Perfect. Now, my dear students, there are few solutions, there are few solutions in which, in which observed vapor pressure, that means the actual vapor pressure which is calculated experimentally, comes out to be equal to the theoretical vapor pressure, which is calculated with the help of Rolle's law. And there are some types of the solutions in which observed vapor pressure and theoretical vapor pressure won't be equal. They come out to be different. They come out to be different. Let me tell you those solutions, those solutions, those particular solutions for which observed vapor pressure and theoretical vapor pressure comes out to be equal. You call those solutions as the ideal solution. Okay. And those particular solutions for which the observed vapor pressure which is calculated experimentally comes out to be different as calculated from the Rolle's law. You call those solutions as the non-ideal solution. You call them as the non-ideal solution. This is the broad classification. This is the broad classification of the ideal and non-ideal solution. Okay, this is the broader way by means of which we can classify ideal and non-ideal solution. Right? Yes, people? Is it clear to you till here? Is it clear to you till here? Again, I'm repeating the same thing. This is something important. Whenever we need to calculate the vapor pressure of the solution, Yes, Vijay, your batch will be extended. Do, do not spam here. Your batch excess will be extended. Don't worry about that. Okay. Vapor pressure of the solution, we can calculate either with the help of manometer experimentally or we can calculate it theoretically with the help of Rolle's law. Right? That particular solution for which the actual vapor pressure, which is what you call as observed vapor pressure, which is calculated experimentally, comes out to be equal to theoretical vapor pressure. That's called as ideal solution. And those solutions for which observed and theoretical comes out to be different. Those are called as non-ideal solutions. So let's talk about the ideal solutions first of all. Let's talk about the ideal solutions first of all. Let's see what are the parameters, what are the points which are related to the ideal solutions which we have to remember. See guys, I'm marking the heading as ideal solution. <clears throat> I'm marking the heading as ideal solution. Okay. <laughs> All right. Try to understand very carefully what exactly I'm talking about. For example, I'm taking these two containers over here. This particular container, it carries, it contains volatile liquid A. This particular container, it contains volatile liquid B. And over here, you have got pure vapors of A and vapor pressure of A here will be P naught A. And here, vapor pressure of B will be absolutely P naught B. Correct? Now, my dear students, if you mix them, what you'll be getting? If you mix them, what you'll be exactly getting? See, when you mix these two solutions, I mean, when you mix these two liquids, you get a solution of A and B. This is your solution of A and B. This is your solution of A and B. Right? And over here, you'll find the vapors of A as well as B. Correct? And vapor pressure of the solution over here is represented by PS. 
and as per Rolle's law, it has to be equal to what? It has to be equal to P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B plus P naught B chi B, correct? Or you can say it has to be equal to P A plus P B, where P A is P naught A chi A, P B is P naught B chi B, right? This is something which you all must be knowing. My dear students, this particular solution which we got over here, this solution of A and B, as I told you earlier, I have got two ways to calculate the total vapor pressure of this particular solution. I have got two ways to calculate the total vapor pressure of this particular solution. One experimentally, which is I'll be calling as observed vapor pressure, and one theoretically, which is calculated with the help of Rolle's law. Which is calculated with the help of Rolle's law. So with the help of Rolle's law, the total vapor pressure should be equal to P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B plus P naught B chi B. With the help of Rolle's law, the total vapor pressure of the solution should be this much, right? My dear students, if you have such kind of the solution, if you have such kind of the solution for which observed vapor pressure and theoretical vapor pressure comes out to be equal, you'll be calling this particular solution as the ideal solution. You'll be calling it as the ideal solution. That means observed vapor pressure, when you calculate the vapor pressure experimentally, it will also come out to be the same. It will also come out to be the same. P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Right? Whenever you see this sort of a solution for which observed and theoretical vapor pressure comes out to be equal, I'll be calling that particular solution as the ideal solution. I hope this particular point is clear. I hope this particular point is clear. Point number one, point number one, right? Point number one, point number one, point number two, point number two. <clears throat> In case of ideal solutions, what all extra features do we have? Have a look, people. First of all, you have got a liquid A over here, right? So in this particular liquid, there will be AA interactions. Here in this particular liquid, there will be BB interactions. And here in this particular solution, what kind of interactions you'll have? Here you'll have AB interactions. And when we talk about the ideal solutions, in case of ideal solutions, do remember AA interactions are same. The magnitude of A interactions is equal to the magnitude of BB interactions is equal to the magnitude of AB interactions. This is one very important point when you talk about the ideal solutions. When you talk about the ideal solutions, okay? Whatever A interactions will be there, right? BB interaction magnitude will be the same and AB interaction magnitude over here will be again the same. Point number one. Point number one. Okay. Imagine volume of this particular liquid over here is V1. Imagine volume of this particular liquid over here is V2. And volume of this resulting solution, for example, it is Vr. We say in case of ideal solutions, delta V mixing, delta V mixing, delta V mixing. Delta V mixing is equal to zero. How can you justify this statement? How can you justify this particular statement? Delta V mixing is zero. What does that mean? That means V final minus V initial, V final minus V initial, which will be equal to V final is basically volume of the resulting solution minus V initial is V1 plus V2. V initial is V1 plus V2. Now, if I ask you, if all these interactions are same, if all these interactions are same, can I say V1 plus V2 will be equal to Vr? And if V1 plus V2 is equal to Vr, you'll categorically say delta V mixing over here comes out to be zero in case of what? In case of ideal solutions. Right? I hope this particular, this particular statement is clear. In case of ideal solution, all the interactions are same. If all the interactions are same, if all the interactions are same, what does that mean? That means the final volume of the solution will be same as the sum of the initial volumes. Correct? Now imagine it like this. If by chance these interactions were different, imagine if AB interaction was weak. Imagine if AB interaction was weak, then A and BB. If AB interaction was weak, then A and B particles would have been far. Right? So final volume at that point of time would have been more than that of initial volume. Correct? Similarly, if AB interactions would have been more, if AB interactions would have been more than ABB, then AB particles would have been closer. So final volume would have been lesser at that time, right? 
but i am telling you all the interactions here are same that clearly tells you that clearly tells you final volume will be equal to initial volume due to which delta v mixing change in volume during mixing change in volume during mixing will be will be zero is this particular point clear is this particular point clear is this particular point clear to everyone there is one more thing related to ideal solutions what is that we say delta h mixing is zero in case of ideal solution what is meant by that delta h mixing is zero first of all over here in this liquid we have a interactions here we have bb interactions here a b interaction is getting formed so for this a b interaction to get formed can i say this interaction should break similarly this interaction should break and at the end this interaction should get formed right for the a b interaction to get formed i'll say this bond has to break this bond has to break and this bond has to get formed right you know bond breakage is endothermic requires energy bond breakage that is endothermic requires energy bond formation is exothermic energy is released now if all the interactions here are same that means the net energy absorbed here will be equal to the net energy released if net energy absorbed is equal to net energy released i would say delta h mixing that has to be what that has to be zero that has to be zero right perfect since interactions are same everywhere this bond has to be broken down this interaction has to be broken down this interaction will get formed bond breakage is endothermic requires energy bond formation is exothermic energy is released since interactions are same so net energy absorbed in this case will be equal to what net energy released eventually delta h mixing comes out to be what it comes out to be zero okay this was one more important point this was one more important point similarly in case of ideal solutions do remember delta s mixing delta s mixing it is positive it is greater than zero entropy change is positive that means entropy change is positive what does it mean that means entropy is increasing during mixing which is evident here my dear students you only have a particles here you have got only b particles now when you are mixing them you have got a as well as b particles so can i say disorder over here will be more if disorder over here is more final disorder is absolutely greater than that of initial disorders right perfect so what does that mean if disorder is more that means entropy is more so during mixing entropy increases if entropy increases during mixing final entropy will be more than initial entropy therefore change in entropy will have to be positive change in entropy will have to be positive correct is this point clear is this point clear to everyone <laughs> these are the questions which are directly asked delta s mixing delta h mixing delta v mixing interactions okay perfect here you had only a particles only b particles here there are a as well as b particles correct so that means disorder is more final disorder is more if final disorder is more delta s comes out to be positive similarly if you talk about delta g if you talk about delta g delta g mixing what is delta g as per thermodynamics delta h minus t delta s delta h minus t delta s in case of ideal solutions delta h already is zero delta h already is zero right delta s is positive positive and negative makes it negative so eventually i would say delta g mixing here is negative as well delta g mixing here is negative as well so these are some very 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 important points which you have to remember related to ideal solutions let me quickly summarize point number 1 in case of ideal solutions observed vapor pressure with the help of experiments comes out to be same as that of calculated with the help of rolls law right which is only possible if all the interactions are same number 1 all the interactions are same number 1 number 2 number 2 delta v mixing is zero delta h mixing is zero delta s mixing is positive delta g mixing that comes out to be negative right perfect these are the points which you have to remember related to what related to ideal solutions yeah these are the points which you have to remember related to ideal solutions is this clear is this clear people yes okay if this is clear if this is clear then i would want you guys to remember few examples of these ideal solutions right 
these are some of the examples of the ideal solutions which you can remember directly right which you can remember directly so examples of the ideal solutions which you have to remember directly okay i'm not going into the details of it i am going to talk about the non ideal solutions now which is very important i'm going to talk about the non ideal solutions now which is very important okay so first of all as i told you in case of non ideal solutions as i told you in case of non ideal solutions in case of non ideal solution <clears throat> As I told you, in case of non-ideal solution, the observed vapor pressure, the observed vapor pressure of the final solution, it comes out to be different than that of theoretical. Than that of theoretical, right? Theoretical means that vapor pressure of the solution which is calculated with the help of Rolle's law. With the help of Rolle's law, try to understand what exactly I'm going to talk about. My dear students, that particular solution whose observed vapor pressure comes out to be different as what we had calculated with the help of Rolle's law, we call that particular solution as non-ideal solution, right? Now, the first case which arises here, the first case which arises here, if P observed is not equal to P theoretical, that means P observed, it can be greater than P theoretical or there can be one more case in which P observed will come out to be less than p-theoretical, right? What is p-theoretical? p-theoretical is nothing. It is p-not-a chi-a plus p-not-b chi-b. Correct? p-theoretical is nothing. It is p-not-a chi-a plus p-not-b chi-b. So, those solutions in which, those solutions in which observed vapor pressure, which is calculated experimentally, comes out to be greater than theoretical vapor pressure comes out to be greater than theoretical vapor pressure. You call, you say those in non-ideal solutions show positive deviation. You say those non-ideal solutions, they show positive deviation from the Rolle's law. Similarly, over here, these are the non-ideal solutions which show negative deviation from the Rolle's law. Now, let's talk about these Non-ideal solution showing positive and negative deviation in detail. Okay, let's talk about them in detail. Let's talk about them in detail. Try to understand what exactly I'll be talking about. This is something which is super important, guys. Okay, so my first topic here is <clears throat> non-ideal solutions showing which deviation? Showing positive deviation. Non-ideal solutions showing positive deviation. Have a look exactly what I'm going to talk about. Try to understand carefully. My dear students, this is one container. This is one more container here. And this is over here one more container. Correct? In the first container, you know, what do we have? We have got pure A, pure volatile liquid A in the container. Here you have got pure volatile liquid B in the container. And now what we are doing, we are mixing them and we are getting a solution of A and B. We are getting a solution of A and B over here, right? So first of all, A is present in the pure state. Vapor pressure of A when present in pure form is basically your P0A, right? Similarly, vapor pressure of B in pure state is basically your P0B. And vapor pressure of the solution, which is due to vapors of A as well as B, that is represented by PS. This is the vapor pressure of solution. And as per your Rolle's law, vapor pressure of the solution, which you call as theoretical vapor pressure of the solution, it has to be equal to P0 A chi A plus P0 B chi B. Plus P0 B chi B. But as I told you, in order to calculate the vapor pressure of the solution, how many ways we have? Two ways. One experimental, through which you get observed vapor pressure of the solution. One is theoretical with the help of Rolle's law. With the help of Rolle's law. Right? Perfect. Now people, try to understand what exactly I'm trying to convey here. Vapor pressure of the solution. As I already mentioned, we have got two ways. One experimentally by means of which you get observed vapor pressure of the solution. One with the help of Rolle's law by which you get theoretical vapor pressure of the solution. As per Rolle's law, vapor pressure of the solution should be what? It should be P0 A chi A plus P0 B chi B as per Rolle's law. As per Rolle's law. 
but this is the solution for which observed and theoretical vapor pressures come out to be different come out to be different this is the solution for which observed and theoretical vapor pressure comes out to be different that means your p observed is not equal to p not a ka plus p not b ka b right so first point your p observed what you get from the manometer right it is not equal to p not a ka a plus p not b ka b right and over here i'm talking about so it is first of all the non ideal solution and right now i'm talking about that now non ideal solution right now i'm talking about that non ideal solution for which observed vapor pressure observed vapor pressure comes out to be greater than theoretical comes out to be greater than this comes out to be greater than this and we and whenever we get such kind of the solution for which observed vapor pressure comes out to be greater than comes out to be greater than this much right then we say that particular solution that particular non ideal solution is showing positive deviation is showing positive deviation now people tell me one thing when is this particular equation possible when is this particular statement possible when observed vapor pressure will come out to be greater than this when when my question to you when my question to you when see if this was ideal if this was ideal at that point of time p observed would have been equal to this would have been equal to this but this is non ideal so p observed is not equal to this here in this particular case i am telling you that p observed is for example greater than this which is only possible which is only possible if which is only possible if p a will be greater than p not a ka a and p b will be greater than p not b ka b right perfect perfect guys right i believe this particular point is clear this particular statement is only possible if the partial vapor pressure if the partial vapor pressure of a if the partial vapor pressure of a here this is your partial vapor pressure of a this is your partial vapor pressure of b right if this particular solution was supposed to be ideal then partial vapor pressure of a would have been equal to p not a ka a and partial vapor pressure of b should have been equal to p not b ka b but but in this particular case p observed is coming out to be greater than this term which is only possible if partial vapor pressure of a is more than expected what was expected this was the partial vapor pressure of a which was expected with the help of rolls law this was the partial vapor pressure of b which was expected with the help of rolls law but but the total vapor pressure of the solution is coming out to be greater than this particular term which is possible only if the if the partial vapor pressure of the of a would come out to be more than expected partial vapor pressure of b comes out to be more than expected that is the only case right right people is this particular point clear now you tell me one thing you tell me one thing tell me one simple thing <laughs> tell me one simple thing i am telling you over here in this particular solution which showing which is showing positive deviation i am telling you its total vapor pressure its actual total vapor pressure comes out to be greater than that of what greater than that of rolls law greater than that of what that of calculated from rolls law when is that possible that is possible only if ab interactions will be lesser in magnitude than that of a and bb interactions that is how that is how that is how more vapors would have got generated over here than expected correct that's how more vapors would have got generated over here than expected right people i believe you are getting this particular thing so do remember ab interactions ab interactions are less than that of aa or bb interactions if if ab interactions would have been same if ab interactions would have been same as that of aa bb then i should have been calling this as ideal if this was ideal then its observed vapor pressure should have been equal to theoretical vapor pressure correct but observed is coming out to be greater that means whatever interactions i was expecting interactions won't be that much stronger it will be comparatively weaker due to which more vapors would have got generated 
in which more vapors would have got generated. That is the reason, that is the reason why the partial vapor pressure of A will be more than the expected. That's why the partial vapor pressure of B will be more than the expected. Right? Expected means as per Rolle's law. And that is the reason why the total observed vapor pressure of the solution comes out to be more than that of theoretical vapor pressure, which was expected as per Rolle's law. I hope this particular point is clear. Right? Now you tell me one thing. Since over here you have got A interactions, over here you have got BB interactions, over here you have got AB interactions, right? So in order to form these AB interactions, this has to be broken, this has to be broken and this has to get formed, right? And you know, and you already know, bond breakage is endothermic, energy is required, right? Bond formation is exothermic, energy is released. But here, interactions are weak, interactions are comparatively weak. Interactions are weaker than expected. If interactions are weaker than expected, can I say the magnitude of net energy released, the magnitude of net energy released will be less than that of the magnitude of net energy absorbed. The magnitude of net energy released will be less than that of the magnitude of net energy absorbed due to which the overall process is endothermic. If the overall process is endothermic, if the overall process is endothermic, you can categorically say delta H mixing over here will be positive. Correct? Now, if I ask you about delta V mixing, change in volume, delta V mixing, interactions are weak. If interactions are weak, AB particles will be far. If AB particles are far, I'll say final volume of the solution will be greater. I'll say final volume of the solution, which is the volume of resulting solution, it will be greater than V1 plus V2. If Vr is greater than V1 plus V2, then change in volume. Final minus initial. It will come out be what? It will come out be positive. So delta V mixing is positive here. Delta V mixing is positive here. Right? Delta V mixing is positive here. And do remember, what about delta S mixing? Delta S mixing. Whenever there is mixing, entropy increases. Entropy increase means delta S mixing has to be positive. And do remember here, delta G mixing is negative. Delta G mixing, in case of that particular solution, in case of that non-ideal solution which shows positive deviation, for that, delta G mixing will be negative. Now, you must be thinking how delta G mixing is negative here. Delta G is equal delta H minus T delta S. Right? I told you delta G mixing here is negative. Perfect. You know, this delta H here is positive. This is positive, even delta S is positive, then how come the overall sign will come out to be negative? It is only possible if magnitude of T delta S here will be greater than that of magnitude of delta S. So do remember in this particular case, magnitude of T delta S will be greater than that of magnitude of delta H. That is the reason why your delta G mixing over here comes out to be negative in case of non-ideal solutions showing the positive deviation. Perfect. Showing the positive deviation. Perfect people. Perfect. Is this clear? Let me know once in the chats. Let me know once in the chats quickly. Yeah, clear. Is it absolutely clear? So, if the solution was supposed to be ideal, then the interactions between A and B should have been same as that of A, should have been same as that of BB. At that point of time, P observed should have been equal to P theoretical, but it's non-ideal. So P observed won't be equal to P theoretical as per Rolle's law. P observed here is coming out to be more, which is only possible if the partial vapor pressure of A would be more than expected, if the partial pressure, partial vapor pressure of B would be more than expected. What was expected? What was the expected partial vapor pressure of A? That was P naught A ka A. What was the expected partial vapor pressure of B? That was P naught B chi B. Right? Perfect. That is the reason why I wrote over here. P A will be greater than P naught A chi A. P B will be greater than P naught B chi B. Right? I believe this is clear to everyone. Okay? Now guys, before showing you its graphical form, before showing you its graphical form, let me show you 
those non-ideal solutions which show negative deviation. After that, I'll show you the graphical form of both the ones combinedly. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about those non-ideal solutions which show negative deviation. Which show negative deviation. Now you should be intelligent enough to understand this particular case on your own, I believe. Right. So first of all, let me make it a little more clear to you again. This is your container number one. This is your container number two. And this is your container number three. Right. Over here, as you all must be knowing, what do we keep? We keep liquid A, volatile liquid A. Here, what do we have? We have got volatile liquid B. Right. And over here, we are adding the two. And what do we get? We are getting a solution of A plus B. A solution of A, A plus B. Perfect. And here, you'll again find vapors of A only. So, vapor pressure here is P naught A. Here, the vapor pressure is what? Here, the vapor pressure is P naught B. Here, the vapor pressure of the solution, which is represented by PS, it, as per Rolle's law, it should be. As per Rolle's law, it should be P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Right? P not B chi B. Now, again, I'm telling you the same thing. We have got two ways to calculate the vapor pressure of solution, right? To calculate vapor pressure of solution, we have got two ways. What all ways are there? One is experimentally calculated, which is called as observed total vapor pressure. One is with the help of Rolle's law, which is called as theoretical vapor pressure. And as per Rolle's law, the theoretical vapor pressure of solution should have been P not A chi A plus P not B chi B. As per Rolle's law. Okay. But, which solution this is? This is the solution which is showing negative deviation. And in case of the solutions showing negative deviation, observed vapor pressure, observed vapor pressure comes out to be less than that of theoretical vapor pressure. What does that mean? That means observed vapor pressure comes out to be less than that of P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Right? When is this possible? This is only possible if the expected if the, if the actual partial vapor pressure of A comes out to be less than that of, less than that of expected, right? Similarly, if the actual partial vapor pressure of B comes out to be less than that of expected, and what is expected? Expected was P naught B chi B, right? Opposite of whatever we studied till now. Clear? Now guys, understand it like this. If the solution was ideal, then P observed and P theoretical should have been equal if it was ideal. Correct? That means in that case, all the interactions would have been same. But it is the non-ideal solution showing negative deviation. Observed vapor pressure is less than that of expected. This is expected. This observed. Observed is less than expected. What can we conclude from there? I can conclude in a reality, the actual amount of vapor generated here would be less. When is that possible? That is only possible in reality if AB interactions are more than that of AA or BB interactions. Right? If the interactions are more, less escaping tendency, less vapor formation. Correct? Now tell me one thing. What about delta V mixing? Is it going to be positive or negative? Delta V mixing. If the interactions are more here, that means AB particles will be close. Final volume will be less. Right? Final volume will be less. Right? Final volume will be less. So Vr will be less than V1 plus V2. Which tells you that if final volume is less than that of initial, that means change in volume. Final minus initial. Change in volume. Final minus initial. Change in volume. Final minus initial. It comes out to be what? It will come out to be negative. It will come out to be negative. Now similarly, delta H mixing. Delta H mixing. What will happen to this particular thing? Delta H mixing. Delta H mixing. See, for AB interaction to get formed, over here, first of all, you have got A interactions. Here, there are BB interactions. Here, you have got AB interactions. For these interactions to get formed, this has to be broken down. This has to be broken down. And this will get formed. Right? Breakage is endothermic. Right? And over here, it is exothermic. Bond formation is exothermic. Right? Interactions here are stronger. What does that mean? That means energy released, magnitude of energy released will be greater than that of magnitude of energy absorbed. If magnitude of energy released will be greater than that of magnitude of energy absorbed, that means the overall process will be exothermic and 
delta H mixing will be negative. Similarly, what about delta S mixing? Delta S mixing. Whenever there is mixing, delta S is always positive. And delta G mixing here will be negative. Here will be negative. And if delta G mixing is negative, right, you can make the condition. You can make the condition as well. For the delta G mixing to be negative, what does that mean? That means delta H minus T delta S mixing has to be negative. Now already we know this term is already negative. This term is already negative. This term is positive. This term is positive. Positive negative makes it negative. Right? Positive negative makes it negative. So it's it's already coming out to be negative only. Right? Delta H is negative. Sorry. Delta H is negative. Delta S is positive. Delta S is positive. So positive negative makes it negative. So there is a sign here negative, here negative. So overall sign will come out to be negative only. Perfect. No condition you have to make over here. I hope this particular point is, all these points are clear to you. I hope all these points are clear to you. So let me quickly summarize all these things in just one slide. In just one slide. First of all, I'm writing ideal solutions. From this particular slide, basically you'll be getting the questions. Non-ideal solutions showing positive deviation. Non-ideal solutions showing negative deviation. Let me quickly summarize all of them in one particular slide so that you can easily remember this. So that you can easily remember this. First of all, in case of ideal solutions, observed vapor pressure is equal to theoretical vapor pressure. Right? Perfect. Or I can say, observed vapor pressure is equal to P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Perfect. Which is possible only if P A is equal to P naught A chi A. Right? And P B is equal to P naught B chi B. Perfect. All the interactions are same. All the interactions are same. A interactions are same as that of BB, as that of AB, right? If I talk about delta V mixing, delta V mixing in case of ideal is zero, right? Delta H mixing is zero, perfect. Delta S mixing here is positive. Sorry, yeah, positive, sorry. And delta G mixing here is negative. These are the possible questions which can be asked in ideal solutions. Anything out of these? Similarly, non-ideal solution showing positive deviation. First point, observed vapor pressure, which is calculated with the help of experiments, it is greater than that of theoretical. That means the observed vapor pressure will be greater than that of P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Whatever we had calculated with the help of Rolls law, that is expected vapor pressure. This is, I mean, this is expected vapor pressure, which is also called as theoretical vapor pressure. This particular scenario is only possible if PA is greater than P naught A chi A and PB is greater than what? PB is greater than P naught B chi B. Correct? Now, AB interactions, AB interactions are weaker than that of AA or BB interactions. Right? Similarly, delta V mixing is positive here. Delta H mixing is positive here. Delta S mixing is positive here. Delta G mixing is negative here. Right? Possible questions which can be asked. <clears throat> what do you think in the last case? Negative deviation. In case of negative deviation, will the actual vapor pressure be equal to the expected vapor pressure which we calculated from Rolls law? No, they'll be different. How come? I mean, what difference exactly? Say observed vapor pressure, there will be less than that of theoretical vapor pressure, which we calculated from Rolls law. Correct? So I would say observed vapor pressure will be less than that of P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. This is possible only if P A, if P A will be coming out to be less than that of P naught A chi A and P B will be coming out to be less than that of P naught B chi B. Correct? Uh, interactions, interactions, talking about interactions. AB interactions are more than that of AA or BB interactions. Delta V mixing here is 
negative delta h mixing here is negative delta s mixing here is positive delta g mixing here will be negative correct one question which can be asked don't go into the details of that question one question those non ideal solutions which show the positive deviation those non ideal solution which show the positive deviation they form minimum boiling azeotropes this point do remember directly this is the question which can be asked which of the which of the following solutions can form minimum boiling azeotropes non ideal solutions showing positive deviation they form minimum boiling azeotropes and they form maximum boiling azeotropes do remember them directly now guys i have to ask you certain questions here that's how i'll understand whether you got all these things properly or not okay and you will have to answer me in the chats first question <coughs> first question <coughs> heretical vapor pressure is calculated with the help of tell me in the chats heretical vapor pressure is calculated with the help of heretical vapor pressure is calculated with the help of quickly rolls law yes observed vapor pressure is calculated with the help of observed vapor pressure is calculated with the help of experimentally with the help of manometer right tell me in case of ideal solutions in case of ideal solution whatever amount of vapors we expected with the help of rolls law do we get the same amount of vapors experimentally as well say yes or no perfect tell me one thing <clears throat> tell me one thing <clears throat> tell me one thing in case of non ideal solutions whatever amount of vapors we expected with the help of rolls law experimentally do we get same amount of vapors more than expected or less than expected in case of positive deviation in case of positive deviation whatever vapors were expected as per rolls law do we get the same vapor same amount of vapors experimentally no experimentally there will be more vapor formation than expected which is possible only if interactions between a and b are comparatively weaker right so more than expected in case of non ideal solution showing negative deviation negative deviation expected amount of vapors and actual amount of vapors which one will be less less which one will be less expected or experimental the actual vapors will be less than expected right that is the reason why actual vapor pressure is less than that of what theoretical vapor pressure which is which was calculated as per rolls law I hope all these points are clear. I hope all these points are clear. <coughs> I hope all these points are absolutely clear to you. Now, guys, now, now, now. The examples I would want you guys to remember directly. These are the examples of ideal solutions, right? and you will be getting this in the pdf format in the telegram perfect these are the examples of non ideal solution showing positive deviation right and these are the examples of non ideal solutions showing negative deviation you have to remember them well i'm not going into the examples here i just want to show you one simple thing what is that see 
I want to make three graphs here. I want to make three graphs here. Three graphs I would want to make here. And you will be telling me the difference among, the, among them. First graph I am making for ideal solutions. Second graph is for those non-ideal solutions which show positive deviation. Third graph is for those non-ideal solutions which show negative deviation. Which show negative deviation. Just see how the graphs exactly will look like. The same graphs which we discussed earlier as well. Try to understand what exactly they are. I'm plotting vapor pressure on this side. I'm plotting mole fraction of the component in the solution on this side, right? Let's assume this at this point, chi A is equal to zero and chi B will be one. At this particular point, chi A will be one and chi B will be zero. We know it, right? At this particular point, B is present in the pure form. So let's call it as P naught B, right? At this particular point, A is present in the pure form, right? So let's call this as P naught A, perfect. I'll be making few curves. <clears throat> I'll be making one graph. I'll be making one graph. If we move from left to right, chi A is increasing. If chi A is increasing, that means vape, partial vapor pressure of A will be increasing. Perfect. What will be the equation of this? What will be the equation of this? Can I say, in case of ideal solutions, P observed. Let me write it over like this. In case of ideal solutions, P A will be exactly equal to how much? It will be exactly equal to P naught A chi A. It will be exactly equal to P naught A chi A. Right? And this particular line, this particular line, if the solution is ideal, then PB will be equal to P naught B chi B. If the resulting solution is ideal, this particular line will show that PS will be exactly equal to what? It will be exactly equal to P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Tell me one thing. In case of non-ideal solutions, will the graphs be same or different? Just tell me that. Will the graphs be same or different? In case of non-ideal solutions, will the graphs be same or different? In case of non-ideal solutions, will the graphs be same or different? This is vapor pressure. This is mole fraction. Right? First of all, I'm making for ideal again. I'm making for ideal again. So chi A is equal to 0 here. Chi B is equal to 1 here. Chi A is equal to 1 here. And chi B is equal to 0 here, for example. Right? For example, this particular point represents your P naught B. Let's say this particular point represents your P naught A. Perfect. Now tell me one simple thing. This would have been, this would have been the graph if, this would have been the graph if P A would have been equal to P naught A chi A. But in case of non-ideal solution showing positive deviation, is the actual partial vapor pressure of A equal to this or more than this? It'll be more than this. So if I talk about the actual graph, will the actual graph be a straight line here? Or it'll go upwards like this. It'll go upwards like this. So this particular graph, it is showing you that the actual, the actual partial vapor pressure of A is more than that of expected, which you calculate with the help of Rod's law. Correct? Right, people? If the solution was ideal, then this particular graph, then this should have been the graph, right? And its equation should have been what? Its equation should have been, its equation should have been PB is equal to P naught B chi B. But in case of non-ideal solution showing positive deviation, partial vapor pressure of B, the actual partial vapor pressure of B, will it be more than expected? Absolutely, it will be more than expected. More than what you expected through Rolf's law. So the actual graph will be like this. Right? 
And this particular curve is telling you that PB will be actually greater than P naught B chi B. Perfect. Similarly, this should have been in case of ideal, but we have got non-ideal showing positive. So the graph will be, its graph will be like this. Correct. So PS, the actual total vapor pressure of the solution will be greater than that of P naught A chi A plus P naught B chi B. Perfect. Can you make for negative deviation on your own? You should be in a position to make for negative deviation on your own. It is just these graphs, this graph will go downwards, this graph will go downwards, and this graph will go downwards. Correct? Correct? So, one will be like this. I'm talking about this particular one. One will be like this. Correct? And, and one would be like this. Correct? And one more. One more would be like this. Right? All downwards. All downwards. Rashmika, what do you have to do with my salary air? Just keep it confidential. It is a lot. Yeah. Okay. I told you it's a lot. It is, it'll be your dream package. The dream, dream package. <laughs> okay, I hope all these ideal, non-ideal, positive, negative is clear. Yeah? Taking 8-hour marathon has nothing to do with my salary. If my salary would have been very less, also I would be still taking these classes. If it will be like very, very, very high, still it will be the same. There is nothing to do with this. There is nothing to do with this. Yes, Satish, I'm, I'm saying your replies. Okay, I hope all these things are absolutely clear till here. So ideal, non-ideal solutions are clear to each and every one of you. Okay, let me ask you questions once. Let me ask you a few questions once so that I'll get that confidence that you learned. Tell me one thing. Uh, tell me one thing. In case of non-ideal solutions showing negative deviation, actual amount of vapors, will that be less than expected, more than expected, or equal to expected? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Less than expected. When is that possible? When is that possible? If AB interactions are more than expected or less than expected? If AB interactions are more than expected or less than expected? More than expected. Wow. Nice. Good. Good, guys. <clears throat> Wonderful. By the way, all these things were they clear like this or they got clear now? I'm pretty much sure you would have studied this chapter before. Were these points clear before? Or now they are getting clear? You can tell me honestly. That's great. Okay, perfect. Now we are going to move into the last phase of the chapter that is qualitative properties, right? It's not that difficult or something. <clears throat> okay. So what are exactly the qualitative properties and what exactly we have to discuss in them? 
let me first of all tell you these are these are the properties these are the properties of ideal solutions these are the properties of ideal solutions whose value whose value chains or let me write it like this these are the properties of the solution which depends on which depends only on which depends only on the number of particles of solute number of particles of solute and does not depend on and does not depend on the nature of solute does not depend on the nature of the solute so basically those properties of the solution those properties of an ideal solution whose value depends on the number of particles of solute so basically if you change the number of particles of solute in a solution there are some properties there are some properties whose value changes right okay so if you talk about the ideal solutions in case of ideal solutions if you take if you change the number of particles of solute if you increase or decrease the number of particles of solute there are some properties of the ideal solutions whose value changes whose value only depends on whose value only depends on the number of particles of solute does not depend on the nature of the solute you call those properties exactly as the colligative properties there are four colligative properties which we have to discuss one by one i'm just giving you the overview of the things the first one is the first one is the relative lowering in vapor pressure a relative lowering in vapor pressure this is the first colligative property which we have to discuss second one is going to be elevation in boiling point second colligative property third one is going to be depression in freezing point and the last one is something which you call as osmotic pressure these are those properties of the ideal solution these are basically those properties of the ideal solutions whose value only depends on the amount of solute only depends on the number of particles of the solute only depends on the number of particles of the solute they do not depend on the nature of the solute and all those properties whose value only depends on the number of particles of solute and does not depend on the nature of the solute what do you call those properties as you call them as the colligative property now one by one we shall be discussing these colligative properties the first colligative property which we have that is the relative lowering in vapor pressure that is the relative lowering in vapor pressure let's try to decode this relative lowering in vapor pressure my dear students if you remember if you remember if you remember i have told you one statement already on adding on adding a non volatile solute in a volatile liquid in a volatile liquid what happens to vapor pressure does vapor pressure increase or decrease we have discussed this before vapor pressure if you remember vapor pressure decreases right and that decrease in the vapor pressure if you remember and that decrease in the vapor pressure <laughs> that decrease in the vapor pressure is called as what is called as lowering in vapor pressure which is represented by lowering in vapor pressure is represented by delta p which used to be equal to p not a minus p s do you remember this do you remember this we have discussed this anyways i'm just going to give you the quick overview of this particular thing again so that you can understand it properly for example this is a volatile liquid a in the container volatile liquid a in the container and over here vapor pressure of a is p not a 
now you are introducing a non volatile solute b in the same container you are introducing a non volatile solute b in the same container so what do i get here i got a solution of a and b i got the solution in a and b and vapor pressure of this particular solution will be equal to ps right which should have been equal to pa plus pb which should have been equal to pa plus pb but b is non volatile it won't contribute towards vapor pressure so ps is nothing that is just equal to pa and pa already you know that is p not a k a so when we add a non volatile solute into a volatile liquid vapor pressure decreases basically and that decrease in the vapor pressure is what you call as that decrease in the vapor pressure is what you call as lowering in vapor pressure so this is what you will be calling as lowering in vapor pressure now guys if i divide this lowering in vapor pressure by the initial vapor pressure of the pure solvent right this particular term this particular this whole term over here right let me tell you this particular term lowering in vapor pressure with respect to initial vapor pressure of pure solvent this particular term is what you call as a relative lowering in vapor pressure this particular term is what you call as a relative lowering in vapor pressure which is equal to, which is equal to, this is p not a minus ps divided by p not a now you know it can be written as p not a minus ps is again p not a ka a as you can see there divided by p not a so p not a p not a p not a everywhere cancelled right so this is 1 minus ka a and 1 minus ka a comes out to be ka b so i got one very 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 important result that is relative lowering in vapor pressure is equal to basically p not a minus ps divided by p not a which is equal to mole fraction of non volatile solute which is equal to mole fraction of non volatile solute which can be further written as mole fraction of non volatile solute in the solution mole fraction of non volatile solute in the solution which can be written as number of moles of non volatile solute in the solution divided by total moles present in the solution divided by total moles present in the solution i hope this is clear i hope this particular point is clear now guys here here do remember if this non if this solution if the solution is very dilute 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 at that point of time you can say number of moles of number of moles of solute is far less than that of number of moles of solvent at that point of time the relative lowering in vapor pressure which is basically p not a minus ps divided by p not a it can be written as i'll write nb divided by instead of na plus nb i can just write na so this particular equation is not valid everywhere no it is only valid for dilute solutions it is valid for dilute solutions wherein the amount of solute will be far less than that of the solvent okay this is one of the equations which will be using in the questions number 1 number 2 there are few more equations which we are going to use in the numericals for numerical purposes i am going to make certain equations for numerical purposes i am going to make certain equations and what are those equations say first of all p not a minus ps this is called as lowering in vapor pressure correct earlier if you remember i divided it with p not a but now i am not going to divide it with p not a i'll be dividing it with ps let's see what expression we get i'll be getting something like this p not a minus ps is basically p not a ka a and here ps is equal to p not a ka a correct perfect so p not a p not a everywhere cancelled 1 minus ka a is ka a b divided by ka a what is ka a mole fraction of non volatile solute in the solution mole fraction of volatile solvent in the solution correct so this will be nb divided by na plus nb whole divided by this will be na divided by na plus nb so na plus nb na plus nb everywhere cancelled so i got one equation equation is simple p not a minus ps divided by ps it will be equal to nb divided by na this particular equation i won't be calling it as relative lowering in vapor pressure because relative vapor pressure relative lowering in vapor pressure it is only defined 
when you divide with what? When you divide with P naught A. But here I did not divide with P naught A. I divide with PS. This is not related to lowering. But this equation, this equation, it can be used everywhere. As I told you here, as I told you here, this particular equation is only valid for dilute solutions. Now, no matter if the solution is dilute or concentrated, this particular equation is used everywhere. Right? Everywhere, people, everywhere. Number one. Number one. I'm going to give you one more equation which can ease out a lot of things, which can help you out in solving the equations pretty much easily. Look at the same equation. I got to know P naught A minus P S divided by P S is equal to N B. What is N B? Number of moles of non-volatile solute in the solution divided by N A. N A. N A means number of moles of solvent which can be written as mass of solvent. Divided by molar mass of solvent. Molar mass of solvent I am writing here. If I multiply with 1000 in the numerator and divide with 1000, nothing will happen. I divided and multiplied with 1000. Now, why did I do so? Because if you look at this particular term now, if you look at this particular term now, if you look at this particular term now, you can write it like this. P naught A minus P S divided by P S is equal to this particular term will be molality of the solution multiplied by molar mass of solvent divided by what divided by thousand there will be some questions in which they'll ask you to calculate molality you can directly use this particular equation and get molality i hope this is clear let me know once if it is clear so that i can solve few questions here Hmm. Tell me, all these clear? All these are clear? So how many expressions did we get? Three expressions. First, P naught A minus P S divided by P naught A is equal to N B divided by N A plus N B. If the solution is dilute, then in the denominator, instead of N A plus N B, you will be writing N A. Second expression, valid everywhere, whereas whether the solution is concentrated or dilute, whatever. That is P naught A minus P S divided by P S is equal to N B divided by N A. Right? But that is not the colligative property. Colligative property, basically that is not your relative to lowering. Relative to lowering is when you divide with P naught A. Right? The third expression is this one. P naught A minus P S divided by P S is equal to molality of the solution. Multiplied by what? Multiplied by M A divided by 1000. Okay? Now, let's try to utilize them in the questions. One very simple and basic question. I'm just giving you the idea of solving it. Look at it. Calculate the relative lowering in vapor pressure. Calculate the relative lowering in vapor pressure. Relative lowering in vapor pressure. If 100 grams of a non-volatile solute. So, what is the mass of non-volatile solute? Mass of non-volatile solute is 100 grams. Right? Molar mass of this non-volatile solute is equal to 100 grams per mole. Dissolved in 432 grams of water. So mass of solvent, mass of volatile solvent, 432 grams. Right? And molar mass of solvent, molar mass of water, that is 18 grams per mole. This is something which all of you must be knowing already. Right? What do I have to calculate? I have to calculate the relative lowering in vapor pressure. That means I need to calculate this value. P naught A minus P S divided by P naught A. This is something to be calculated, which is basically equal to NB divided by NA plus NB. So what do I need to calculate? I need to calculate the relative lowering of vapor pressure. That means this particular term, its value has to be calculated. And its value is equal to NB divided by NA plus NB. Now do you know the value of NB and NA? NB, number of moles of non-volatile solute will be mass of solute divided by molar mass of solute. Number of moles of solvent will be equal to mass of solvent divided by molar mass of solvent. Right? So WB, MB given. So 100 divided by 100, that's 1. Right? 100 divided by 100. That's 1. NA. WA divided by MA. So 432 divided by 18. 432 divided by 18. So you got NB, you got NA. Put it here and get the value of relative to lowering in vapor pressure. I hope you can easily solve this sort of equation. Yeah? People are saying it's 1 upon 25. Whatever. I mean you can have the answer with you. Look at this particular equation. Look at this particular equation. The vapor pressure of an aqueous solution of glucose. So you have 
made an aqueous solution of glucose, right? You have made an aqueous solution of glucose at 373 Kelvin, okay? Is found to have 750 mmHg vapor pressure. The molality of the solution at the same temperature will be. See guys, what is the scenario? This is the container which had water in it. This is pure water. Correct, this is pure water. And temperature is kept as 373 Kelvin. So 373 Kelvin is basically the boiling point of water. And at the boiling point, vapor pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure. So I would say vapor pressure of water right now. Vapor pressure of water right now will be equal to atmospheric pressure. That is 760 mm of Hg. This is clear, I believe. Correct? Because this is something which I got from the first statement itself, from the temperature. Right? Now, as per the question, in this water, you have added glucose, which is a non-volatile solute. You have added glucose, which is a non-volatile solute. Correct? So, what you have got? You have got an aqueous solution here. This is the aqueous solution of glucose. Aqueous solution of glucose, whose vapor pressure, of course, will be less. Right? And that vapor pressure of the aqueous solution is given to me as 750 mm of Hg. What do I need to calculate? I need to calculate molality of this particular solution. Few minutes back, I gave you one result directly. What was that? That was P0A minus PS divided by PS is equal to. It was molality multiplied by molar mass of solvent divided by 1000. Correct? Right, people? So P0A is given. PS is given. Molar mass of solvent, molar mass of water, 18,000. So from here you can easily get the molality of the solution. Correct? This can be solved. It is a simple question. It is a very, very, very simple question. Very simple question. Just a second. Uh, just people, there is a solution here. Okay, look at this particular question. Look at this particular question. You should be able to solve this one as well. At a given temperature, vapor pressure of pure benzene. As per the question, you have a pure benzene. This is pure benzene, right? Vapor pressure of pure benzene, which I'm representing with P0A, that is given to me as 200 mm of Hg. At the same temperature, vapor pressure of the solution containing 2 grams of non-volatile solute. So you are introducing a non-volatile solute, right? How many grams of non-volatile solute? 2 grams of non-volatile solute, right? In 78 grams of benzene. So initially you had how many grams of benzene? 78 grams of benzene you had initially in the container. Now in this benzene, you are introducing a non-volatile solute. After that, what is happening? You are getting a solution. You are getting a solution. This is the solution which you are getting, right? Perfect. And vapor pressure of this particular solution comes out to be 195 mm of Hg as per the question. Because you know, when a non-volatile solute is added, what happens to vapor pressure? It decreases. Initially it was 200, now it's 195. Calculate the molar mass of solute. We have to calculate the molar mass of solute. Again, a simple question. Which equation I'll be using? P0A minus PS divided by PS is the equal to NB divided by NA. This equation is used everywhere, as I told you. You need not to check whether it is dilute or concentrated or whatever. So P0A is 200. PS is 195. PS is 195. NB, number of moles of solute, will be equal to mass of solute divided by molar mass of solute divided by number of moles of solvent means mass of solvent divided by molar mass of solvent, molar mass of solvent, molar mass of benzene. Solvent is your benzene, right? Its molar mass is 78. When you solve this, you'll be getting the molar mass of non-volatile solute, which I was supposed to calculate. Correct? You can easily solve it. Easily means easily. Okay, one more question. Look at this carefully. Look at this carefully, guys. You need to give it a try as well. 
what weight of non volatile solute urea needs to be dissolved in 100 grams of water in order to decrease its vapor pressure by 20% by 20% can you give it a try can you give it a try see guys what the scenario is let me make you familiar with the scenario first of all So as per the question, you have got 100 grams of water. You have got 100 grams of volatile liquid, that's water. Correct? I'm assuming its vapor pressure right now was P0A. I'm assuming its vapor pressure was P0A. Now as per the question, you are adding a non-volatile solute urea into it. You are adding a non-volatile solute urea into it. What's going to happen? After adding non-volatile solute urea, will the vapor pressure increase or decrease? It will decrease for sure. How much it's decreasing? It is decreasing by 20%. That means vapor pressure of the solution will be initial vapor pressure. And it has decreased by how much of amount? 20% of P0A it has decreased. I hope you got this particular statement. I hope you got this statement. Initially it was P0A. Now you are adding a non-volatile solute. What has happened? Vapor pressure has decreased. How much? 20%. So what will be the final vapor pressure of the solution? Initial minus 20% of this. So it will be vapor pressure of the solution will be P0A minus 0.2. It will be 0.8 P0A. Correct? This is something which I got till here. Now, the equation says what weight of non-volatile solute? Let's say we have added some WB grams of this non-volatile solute. We have to calculate how much non-volatile solute was added to decrease the vapor pressure by 20%. That was the question. So, I'll be solving it like this. P naught A minus PS divided by PS is equal to NB divided by NA. P naught A minus PS. P naught A minus PS. That will come out to be P naught A minus 0 0.8 P naught A, which will be 0. Point, this term will be 0. 0.2 P naught A. And here, it will be 0. 0.8 P naught A. So, P naught A, P naught A cancel. 0. 0.2 divided by 0. 0.8 comes out to be 1 by 4. Is equal to NB, moles of solute, will be equal to mass of solute, which is to be calculated. Divide by molar mass of solute, molar mass of urea, 60. Number of moles of solvent, mass of solvent, solvent is water. And we have taken it 100 grams, divide by molar mass of solvent, molar mass of water. So one equation, one unknown. You can easily calculate WB from here. You can calculate WB from here. And the second question is calculate the molality. For that, you can use this expression, which I gave you a few minutes back. P naught A minus PS, divided by PS is equal to M, multiplied by molar mass of solvent, divided by 1000. All the things are given. You just have to calculate this M over here. Is it clear? Guys, there are some other questions which we have to do related to colligative properties. But those questions we cannot do now. Once we are done with Van't Hoff factor, then we can do those questions. Some good questions. Correct? How long the session will be? The session will be for two to three more hours. Two to three more hours. Are you ready to be with me till the end? Are you ready to be with me till the end? Are you sure? Are you sure people? Yeah? We have to complete the chapter. You have to. Nine percent more battery. So keep your phone on charge. Keep your phone on charge. Keep your phone on charge. I cannot sleep for long because in the morning at eleven I have one more class. Avengers batch. Okay, let's not waste time. Let's complete this particular elevation in boiling point as well. See guys, again, I'm telling you all these colligative properties. To explain them, basically there are thermodynamic reasons. All these are explained with the help of entropy, right? But I'm not going there right now. I'm giving you only that much amount of theory which is required to solve the questions. Okay? Yeah? So what is elevation in boiling point all about? How it happens? 
for that i believe you know what is bowling point i hope you remember what is bowling you remember what bowling point exactly is first of all if i want to define the bowling point the temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid the temperature at which vapor pressure of the liquid becomes equal becomes equal to the external pressure which is generally atmospheric pressure right i hope you remember this is something which we have discussed correct this is something which we have discussed now people here comes few important things understand them carefully because i don't know whether you have i don't know whether you have i mean understood this particular scenario before or not see i'm not giving the thermodynamic reason by the way i'll be giving you the classical reason to understand this elevation and boiling point imagine i'm taking two containers imagine these are two containers which i have taken in this first container we have got a pure volatile liquid it is pure volatile liquid pure volatile liquid a okay pure volatile liquid a so first of all let's assume that let's assume that this volatile liquid is kept at temperature 25 degrees centigrade i'm assuming this volatile liquid is your water this water is at 25 degrees centigrade right this water is at 25 degrees centigrade i'm assuming the outside pressure is 760 mm of hg the external pressure is 760 mm of hg i'm assuming at 25 degrees centigrade the vapor pressure of this water for example it is 100 mm of hg just to make you understand the things just to make you understand the things this is water at 25 degree centigrade at 25 degree centigrade the vapor pressure of water for example is 100 and external pressure that is the atmospheric pressure for example that is 760 now people boiling point is that temperature at which vapor pressure of liquid becomes equal to atmospheric pressure right so first of all if i increase the temperature of this water what will happen its vapor pressure will keep on increasing and there will be a temperature at which the vapor pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure that's called as boiling point so imagine at 100 degree centigrade imagine when the temperature of water came out to be 100 degree centigrade at that point of time the vapor pressure of water became equal to the atmospheric pressure which is 760 so that particular temperature at which vapor pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure that is something which you call as boiling point this is your boiling point of water correct now people try to understand in the same container if i add a non volatile solute in the same container i have for example added a non volatile solute if i have added a non volatile solute it becomes a solution now a plus b i have added a non volatile solute b in this container now it is becoming a solution imagine this solution was initially at 25 degree centigrade tell me at 25 degree centigrade will its vapor pressure will the vapor pressure of solution be more than 100 or less than 100 you have to tell me vapor pressure of this particular solution would have been at 25 degree centigrade it would be less than 100 right so vapor pressure of this solution at 25 degree centigrade let's assume it is 50 mm of hg outside pressure is same how much is that 760 mm of hg now people tell me one thing if you have to boil this solution what you have to do you have to increase its temperature when you increase its temperature vapor pressure of this solution will keep on increasing but people here you have to increase the vapor pressure of solution from 50 to 760 here you were supposed to increase the vapor pressure from 100 to 760 where you have to increase the temperature more here you have to increase the temperature more because you have to increase the vapor pressure from 50 to 760 the difference is 710 here the difference was 660 here you have to raise the temperature more so i'll say this solution this solution this solution for the vapor pressure of the solution to get equal to atmospheric pressure i'll say temperature has to be higher so boiling point of the solution will be definitely more than that of 100 let's keep it as 105 degree 
let's keep it as 105 just to make you understand just to make you understand so basically initially when you had pure volatile liquid in the container you were supposed to increase its wave pressure from 100 to 760 so accordingly you were raising temperature and one temperature arised one temperature arose at which the vapor pressure became equal to atmospheric pressure that was 100 degree the boiling point now this particular solution in order to boil this you have to increase its temperature from you have to increase its vapor pressure from 50 to 760 so the gap here is more so you have to raise the temperature more so its boiling point will be more right so tell me one thing on adding a non volatile solute into a pure solvent is the boiling point increasing or decreasing this was the boiling point of pure solvent this is the boiling point of solution tell me what happened tell me what happened can i write a simple statement like this can i write a simple statement like this on adding a non volatile solute into a pure volatile liquid into a pure volatile solvent first of all you know vapor pressure that decreases and at the same time boiling point increase and that increase in the boiling point and that increase in the boiling point is called as what that's called as elevation in boiling point that is called as elevation in boiling point. So elevation in boiling point is represented by delta Tb. Elevation in boiling point is represented by delta Tb. How much boiling point has elevated? I'll say which one is that? Which one has got higher boiling point? Solution. Lower boiling point. Higher minus lower. So how much boiling point has elevated? I'll say boiling point has elevated here by 5 degree. Right? So I can write it like this. Elevation in boiling point will be equal to higher. That is boiling point of solution minus the boiling point of solvent. Boiling point of solvent. I hope this particular statement is again clear to you. Right? Yes. Now guys, understand the same thing graphically a bit. Understand the same thing graphically a bit. Same. If this is your vapor pressure and this is temperature. Vapor pressure versus temperature. Okay? Let's say this point represents atmospheric pressure, for example, which is 1 atm. Atmospheric pressure, which is 1 atm, for example. Right? If I make a graph between vapor pressure and temperature for a pure solvent, we know with the increase in temperature, vapor pressure increases. With the increase in temperature, vapor pressure increases. Right? So this is the graph for a solvent, for example, pure solvent. Perfect. Now, from the solvent, imagine I have made a solution. From the solvent, I have made a solution. Vapor pressure of solution will be less than that of pure solvent, you know. So graph for solvent will lie below this. I mean graph for solution will lie below this. Perfect. Right. Graph for solution will lie below this because vapor pressure of the solution containing non-volatile solute that is less than that of pure solvent. Right. Now tell me one thing. Look at this particular scenario. Can I say this is the temperature at which this is the temperature at which vapor pressure of solvent, vapor pressure of pure volatile solvent becomes equal to atmospheric pressure. So this point I'll be representing as boiling point of solvent. Boiling point of solvent, right? This point I'll be calling as boiling point of solvent. This point I'll be calling as boiling point of solvent. Now, if I extend the same line, it touches here and accordingly go a little down, right? This is the point, this is the temperature at which vapor pressure of solution becomes equal to atmospheric pressure. And that particular temperature at which vapor pressure becomes equal to atmospheric pressure, that is your boiling point. So this is the vapor, this is the boiling point of your solution. So look from hair to hair, you can calculate boiling point of solvent. From hair to hair, it is boiling point of solution. As you can categorically say from the see from the graph, boiling point of solution is greater than that of boiling point of pure solvent. Right? If I ask you how much the boiling point has increased, initially it was TB, now it is TB solution. So this gap, 
this gap over here what does it represent it represent elevation in boiling point and this elevation in boiling point will be tb solution minus tb solvent tb solution minus tb solvent that's what i have written over here correct that's what i have written over here okay that's what i have written over here now guys mathematically elevation in boiling point right i'm not deriving the results i'll be just giving you the results and let's apply them elevation in boiling point is directly proportional to molality of the solution more the molality of the solution more the molality of the solution right that means more the non volatile solute into it more will be the elevation in boiling point more will be the elevation in boiling point and if you remove this proportionality sign you will be getting a constant kb multiplied by m right this is one result which you have to remember if i would want to elaborate this result a bit if i would want to elaborate this result a bit elevation in boiling point will be boiling point of solution minus what minus the boiling point of solvent right is equal to kb i am writing as such which is a constant molality of the solution is mass of solute in grams multiplied by 1000 divided by molar mass of solute multiplied by mass of solvent in grams okay right you can remember it in this format as well no issues at all okay right, guys now this kb what this kb is called as this kb over here is called as molal elevation constant this is called as molal elevation constant or you can call it as ebullioscopic constant and this kb this kb kb this kb this kb molal elevation constant it is solvent dependent every solvent has got a particular value of kb every solvent has got a particular value of kb right what are going to be the units of this kb it can be written as degree centigrade per molal you can write it as degree centigrade per molal or you can write it as kelvin kg per mole perfect these are the units of this kb which is particularly solvent dependent right and these are going to be its units now if i ask you how do you define this kb how do you define this constant how do you define this constant kb see if molality of the solution is 1 at that point of time kb will be equal to delta tb right i'll say if molality of the solution is 1 at that point of time your kb is equal to delta tb so how can i define it from here you can easily define it i'll say molal elevation constant molal elevation constant is defined is defined as the elevation in boiling point the elevation in boiling point of a solution it is defined as the elevation in boiling point when when molality of the solution is unity this is how you remember it this is how you remember it this is how you remember it right now if i particularly talk about this kb little more this kb has got certain expressions as well kb is equal to rt not square divided by 1000 lv or m1 rt not square divided by 1000 delta h vaporization now what are these terms first of all what are these terms first of all look here first of all this t not t not is the boiling point of pure solvent lv is the latent heat of vaporization for 1 gram of solvent delta h vaporization is latent heat of vaporization for 1 mole of solvent the difference between lv and delta h v lv latent to vaporization this is for this is for 1 gram of solvent this is for 1 mole of solvent and r is what you call as gas constant or you can call it a solution constant you know its value 8.314 right units of kb any one of these two and every solvent has got a particular kb kb for water is this right kb for benzene is this kelvin kg per mole okay so let's try to solve few questions on the basis of elevation in boiling point but 
before solving the question, let me quickly summarize it. When you put a non-volatile solute in a pure solvent, okay, when you put a non-volatile solute in a pure solvent, you are going to answer me, you are going to answer me. When you put a non-volatile solute in a pure solvent, what happens to vapor pressure? Does vapor pressure increase or decrease quickly? Does vapor pressure increase or decrease quickly? I'm talking about vapor pressure. I'm talking about vapor pressure. When you introduce a non-volatile solute into a pure volatile liquid, does vapor pressure increase or decrease? Vapor pressure decreases. Boiling point? Boiling point? Boiling point increases. Boiling point increases. That increase in the boiling point is called as elevation in boiling point, represented by delta Tb, which is equal to Kb multiplied by molality. Or you can write it as, you can write it as boiling point of solution minus boiling point of pure solvent. Right? Perfect. How do we calculate Kb? These are the results RT naught square divided by 1000 LV or M1 RT naught square divided by delta divided by 1000 delta H vaporization. What is M1? M1 is the molar mass of solvent by the way. M1 that is basically the molar mass of solvent. M1 is basically the molar mass of pure solvent. Correct? Okay. I should tell me one more thing. <coughs> if molality of the solution is more, if molality of the solution is more, elevation and boiling point will be more. If elevation and boiling point will be more, can I say basically boiling point of the solution will be more? Simple. Right? Can I say boiling point of the solution will be more? The throat is gone. It is done and dusted. Yeah, perfect. Let's try to solve C. Right now, I won't be able to give you some good, good questions because good questions on elevation and boiling point and all the colloquial properties will be done once we do the Vanthoff factor first. After Vanthoff factor, you can solve a lot of questions. But right now, we can solve some basic, basic questions. For example, this is one basic question. This is one basic question which we have. This is one basic question which we have. What weight of sucrose what weight of sucrose must be added to 100 grams of water to have boiling point of solution as 100.5 degree simple and basic question simple and basic question can you solve this so basically if i give you the exact scenario of this particular equation as per this question we have taken water Imagine this is water in the container, which is your solvent, which is your pure solvent. Correct? We have taken 100 grams of pure water. We have taken 100 grams of pure water. You know, boiling point of water. Boiling point of solvent, you know, that is your 100 degree centigrade. Correct? Now, as per the question, you are adding a non-volatile solute across into it. After the addition of non-volatile solute sucrose into it, what do we get? We get a solution. This is your solution basically. This is your solution basically. The solution which we got, as per the question, boiling point of the solution is given to me as 100.5 degree centigrade, right? So, I'm supposed to calculate what weight of non-volatile solute sucrose has been added. What, vol of, what weight of non-volatile solute sucrose has been added, right? So I'll be using elevation and boiling point. So delta Tb is equal to Kb multiplied by M. Delta Tb, elevation and boiling point. Initially it was 100, 100 to 100.5. Means elevation and boiling point is 0.5 degree. Right? Is equal to Kb value that's given to us 0.52. Molality of the solution. Molality of the solution will be mass of solute in grams multiplied by 1000 
molar mass of solute mass of solvent in grams right now people this this is going to be 0 0.52 is equal to 0 0.52 multiplied by this is 0 0.5 here sorry 0 0.5 is equal to 0 0.52 multiplied by mass of non volatile solute uh, sucrose has to be calculated multiplied with 1000 molar mass of sucrose you should be knowing it is 342 grams per mole mass of solvent mass of solvent is 100 so look at this particular equation one equation one unknown one equation one unknown you can easily calculate the mass of non volatile solute here right wb is calculated done i mean this is a basic equation which easily you can do which easily you can do similarly you have got a question find kb of a liquid whose boiling point is given and lv is given boiling point is given lv is given boiling point is given lv is given right so boiling point is given, LV is given, right? R value will be 8.314. Done understood. Put the values in this equation. Get the value of KB. So these are some basic equations, guys. Right? But here, LV is given in terms of calories. Calories. So R value, which R value will be using here? R has got three values. I hope you know. R has got three values. One is 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. One is Two calories per Kelvin per mole, and one more is a 0 0.0821 atm liter per Kelvin per mole. These are the three values of R basically. Now, which value of R you'll be using in this question? LV is given in calories, so you'll be taking this value of R. Boiling point is 60 degree centigrade, so convert it in Kelvin, it'll be 333 Kelvin, correct? And KB you can get easily. Okay, guys, there is no need to think a lot over this. There is one more that is depression in freezing point. That is one more colligative property. Well, it is similar. I'm just going to write the statement and the equation. Let's not go into the details. Remember, write the expression and apply the expression in the questions. See, as per the name is concerned, depression in freezing point. See, on addition, on addition of a non-volatile solute, in a pure volatile solvent in a pure volatile solvent freezing point decreases freezing point decreases and that decrease in the freezing point and that decrease in the freezing point is called as depression in freezing point that is called as depression in freezing point, which is represented by delta Tf. Delta Tf, represented by delta Tf. So, for example, let me give you one example over here. Let me give you one example over here. Imagine this is a container. In this container, you have got a pure solvent. Let's assume its freezing point is 0 degree centigrade. Now, if you will be adding a non-volatile solute here, you will be getting a solution. What you will observe, you will observe freezing point of this solution will be less than this. So, its freezing point will be, for example, minus 3 degrees centigrade. Right? Perfect. So, how much freezing point has decreased? How much freezing point has decreased? Initially, it was 0. Now, it is minus 3. How much is the decrease in freezing point? Write it like this. Higher minus slower. Higher is solvent. So it is freezing point of solvent minus freezing point of solution minus freezing point of solution. Now in the questions, do remember freezing point depression is also directly proportional to molality and it is equal to Kf multiplied by M where Kf is a constant, right? Or you can represent it like this delta Tf is equal to Kf multiplied by molality which is mass of solute in grams multiplied by 1000 divided by molar mass of solute and this is mass of solvent in grams. Correct? You can remember them and at the same time this Kf, this Kf is called as molal depression constant, molal depression constant or you can call it as the cryoscopic constant. 
you can call it as the kreaskopi constant it is again solvent dependent so every solvent has got a particular value of kf every solvent has got a particular value of kf you need to remember that as well you need to remember that as well every solvent has got a particular value of kf and this particular kf value can be calculated with the help of these two results right where t naught is what you call as freezing point of pure solvent freezing point of pure solvent right this m1 is what you call as molar mass of pure solvent right what do you have lf lf is the latent heat of fusion latent heat of fusion per gram of solvent per gram of solvent you have got delta hf this is the latent heat of fusion per mole of solvent per mole of solvent correct so by using any of these expressions you can easily get the value of kf right Yes, it's kreoscopic, right? It is kreoscopic constant. I don't remember the spelling exactly, whether it is CRY or CR, I think it is CRY, right? Something like that, CRY. Is that? Perfect. So, solve this question. Solve this question, people. Solve this question once. I told you only basic basic questions can be solved for now till we do the Van Thos factor. Quickly guys. Find the freezing point of the solution obtained by mixing 18 grams of glucose and 90 grams of water. So the solvent is water, mass of solvent is 90 grams, molar mass of solvent, that means molar mass of water, that is 18 grams per mole. The non-volatile solute which you are adding, that is glucose. So how many grams of non-volatile solute? 18 grams, right? And molar mass of this non-volatile solute, glucose is 180 grams per mole. Perfect. Solvent is your water, correct? And freezing point of solvent, freezing point of water, pure water. You should be knowing it. It is 0 degree centigrade. So again, I'll be using the basic equation, nothing else. The basic equation says that a freezing point of solvent minus freezing point of solution is equal to Kf multiplied by molality of the solution, which is mass of solute in grams multiplied by 1000 molar mass of solute mass of solvent in grams freezing point of solvent is zero right so that minus comes on that side it goes on that side so you can get the freezing point of solution is equal to minus kf value is 1.86 mass of non-volatile solute is given as 18 multiplied by 1000 molar mass of non-volatile solute is 180 and mass of solvent is Again, 18. So solve this and get the freezing point of the solution. That is something which you were supposed to calculate. Right? So these are some basic basic equations as I told you already. Right? Similarly, you can solve this question as well. If 2.5 grams of ethylene glycol is added to 20 grams of water, find the freezing point of solution. Can you do it on your own? Because it is similar question. It is similar question. Can you do it on your own? Let me know once. Can you do it on your own, people? Quickly. Yeah? Can it be done? Again, the same process you have to do. The question is based on the same procedure. You know it. Delta TF, which is TF of uh, solvent minus TF of solution is equal to 
Kf multiplied by molality. All the parameters are given. All the parameters are given. Now, let's talk about the last qualitative property and after that there is one interesting topic that is your, that is your Van Hoff factor, right? So basically, there are only few slides which we have to discuss now. Only some 10 to 12 slides are there. Right? Some 10 to 10, 12 slides are there which we have to discuss. Good. Okay. Okay. Are you sleeping or what? Are you sleeping or what? Are you alive? Every one of you. Are you guys alive? Are you all alive? <laughs> say, say it in the chats. I want you to be alive till the end. Hmm. Yes, you guys are still breathing. That's great. That's great. All right, so first of all, what is osmotic pressure? Look at, look at this particular scenario. My dear students, imagine this is the container which I have, a bigger container. Okay, I'm dividing this container into two equal parts with the help of a semi-permeable membrane. This is a semi-permeable membrane which I'm using, right? And I'm assuming the semi-permeable membrane which I'm using over here it allows only the moment of solvent molecules. It only allows the moment of solvent molecules. Solvent particles, I would say. It allows the moment of only solvent particles, right? Now, first of all, on one side of this chamber, on this one side of the chamber, I'm keeping a solution. A solution on another side I'm keeping a pure solvent pure solvent on one side I've kept a solution whose concentration is for example C molar on another side I have kept a pure solvent now people what you will observe here this is for example the piston which is fitted at the top Right, let me just, let me just increase the height of this container. Okay, I've increased the height of this container, try to understand what exactly I'm going to say. So first of all, you have got a solution and the solvent in direct contact with each other with the help of semi-permeable membrane. Whenever you see this kind of the scenario, in which, in which a solution and the solvent or I can say more concentrated solution and less concentrated solution are in contact with the help of semi-permeable membrane. What you will find, you will find the net moment of solvent molecules. You will find the net moment of solvent molecules. You will find the net moment of solvent molecules. net moment of solvent molecules from from less concentrated side to more concentrated side that means from solvent side to solution side from solvent side to solution side or i can say less concentrated side to more concentrated side. To more concentrated side. Whenever you'll be having pure solvent and a solution in direct contact with each other with the help of semi-permeable membrane, or if I say it like this, whenever you have got more concentrated and less concentrated solution in direct contact with each other with the help of semi-permeable membrane, there will be net moment of solvent molecules from solvent side to the solution side. 
from less concentrated side to more concentrated side. And this phenomenon is something which is what you call as osmosis. This phenomenon is what you call as osmosis. So what is osmosis? It is the net moment of solvent molecules from solvent side to solution side or less concentrated side to more concentrated side. Right? Perfect. The phenomenon is what you call as osmosis. Now, my dear students, due to osmosis, due to osmosis, due to osmosis, can I say this piston will start going upwards? Right? Due to osmosis, I will say this piston, it will start going upwards. This, this piston, it will start going upwards. Perfect. Now, in order to make sure that piston does not move, in order to make sure that piston does not move, do we have to apply some excess pressure from the top? Yes. That minimum excess pressure, that minimum excess pressure that has to be applied on the solution side. The minimum excess pressure that has to be applied on the solution side, such that this piston does not show any moment. The minimum excess pressure that has to be applied on the solution side to prevent the moment of solvent molecules, to prevent the net moment of solvent molecules into the solution side, right? That minimum excess pressure is something which you call as osmotic pressure. And this osmotic pressure, it is represented by what? It is represented by pi. So it is pretty much simple, guys. See, basically, this uh, it's a very huge topic. If this is taught in detail, it's a very huge topic. There are a lot of terminologies involved here, right? But whatever is needed for our need 2024, that is some, this is something which you need to remember, nothing else. Okay? Whatever I'm telling you, that's something which you have to remember, nothing else. Otherwise, it's a very, very, very vast topic. A lot of new, new terminologies. Different types of pressures, right? Maybe you would have studied in biology as well. Right? We can involve free energy here. We can involve entropy here. Correct? Okay. So basically, again, I'm telling you whenever a, whenever a pure solvent and a solution is in contact with the help of semi permeable membrane. There'll be net flow of solvent molecules from solvent side to solution side or from less concentrated side to more concentrated side, right? This phenomenon is called as osmosis. Due to osmosis, this piston should go up. Now, in order to stop the moment of piston, right? In order to make sure that piston should not go up, minimum excess pressure has to be given from the top. Or I'll say the minimum excess pressure that has to be given from the tops on the solution side. So as to stop the net moment of solvent molecules from solvent side to solution side, that minimum excess pressure is something which you call as, which you call as osmotic pressure, right? Which is what you call as osmotic pressure. And people, people, the pressure which you are applying from the top, if the applied pressure, if, if the applied pressure, if the applied pressure on the solution side is more than that of osmotic pressure, is more than that of osmotic pressure. If the applied pressure from this particular side is more than that of osmotic pressure, what will happen then? I'll say there'll be net moment of solvent molecules from solution side to solvent side. At that point of time, there will be net moment of solvent from solution to solvent side. And this phenomenon is what you call as reverse osmosis. This phenomenon is called as reverse osmosis. And this reverse osmosis is used where? It is used for desalination of seawater. This reverse osmosis, it is a technique by means of which you desalinate the seawater. Perfect. So guys, if the pressure higher than osmotic pressure, if the pressure higher than osmotic pressure, is applied on the is applied on the solution side the solvent will flow from solution side into pure solvent side through spm right and that's what you call as reverse osmosis for example you have got desalination of sea water correct now there are few terminologies which you need to know then i can give you certain 
expressions for osmotic pressure and we can solve some of its questions. Ice, there is a term called as isotonic solutions. What are isotonic solutions? Isotonic solutions are the ones which have got same osmotic pressure. Isotonic solutions are the ones which have got which have got same osmotic pressure or you can call them as you can call those solutions as iso-osmotic solutions as well. Right? Since we are talking about the osmotic pressure, that is pi. Osmotic pressure is directly proportional to the concentration of solution. It is directly proportional to the temperature as well. So eventually what you get, you get pi is equal to CRT. This is the expression by means of which you calculate the osmotic pressure of any particular solution. Now remember the terminologies. What is C over here? C is what you call as concentration or molarity of the solution, which is number of moles of solute divided by volume of solution in liters, right? R is what you call a solution constant, right? Which has got three values, you know it, and T is the temperature, and T is the temperature, perfect, T is the temperature, right? So basically those solutions which have got same osmotic pressure, those two solutions which have got same osmotic pressure, you call them as isotonic solutions. You call them as isotonic solutions. So isotonic solutions have got same osmotic pressure. That's why they are called as iso-osmotic as well. How do you calculate this osmotic pressure? There is one general expression which is used to calculate this osmotic pressure. You can write it as number of moles of solute in the solution divided by volume of solution in liters multiplied by R multiplied by T. Right? This is the expression by means of which you can calculate the osmotic pressure basically. Correct? For example, you have got a question over here. A simple question. Calculate the osmotic pressure at 273 Kelvin of a 5% solution. Over here, let me tell you this is 5% weighed by volume. 5% weighed by volume solution of urea you have. You have got 5% weight by volume percent of urea. What does that mean? It means that 5 grams of urea are present in 100 ml of solution. Are present in 100 ml of solution. What do I have to calculate? I need to calculate its osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure pi is equal to CRT or you can say MRT. The choice is all yours. T is concentration. Concentration is nothing. That's molarity. Right? So pi is equal to CRT. So pi has to be equal to concentration means molarity. Number of moles of solute. And the solute is urea here. So number of moles of urea divided by volume of solution in liters multiplied by R multiplied by T. So pi has to be equal to number of moles of urea will be equal to mass of urea divided by molar mass of urea divided by volume of solution in liters. This is in ml, convert it in liters, so it is 0 0.1 liter. R value which I should use, I have to calculate osmotic pressure in ATM, so I'll be using 0 0.0821 as the value of R. Temperature is given to me as 273 Kelvin, correct? It's a matter of calculation, solve it and get the osmotic pressure in ATM. Yes, this is how you can easily calculate, solve these sort of questions. I believe you can do that. <clears throat> now, there is one more question which is on your screen. A 4% solution of sucrose is isotonic. Isotonic means their osmotic pressure is same. Is isotonic with 3% solution of an unknown organic substance. So you have got a solution of sucrose on one side and the solution of some organic substance on another side, their osmotic pressure is same. Their osmotic pressure is same, right? Their osmotic pressure is same means their concentrations, their concentrations as well as their temperatures will be same. Their osmotic pressure same means their concentrations as well as their temperatures will be same. What is pi? Pi is CRT. So it is C1R. T1. It has to be equal to C2 R T2. Now, if concentration temperature is same, so C1, C2 cancel, right? Or just a second. Just a second. First of all, let's write the statement. You have got a 4% solution of sucrose. What does it mean? 4% solution of sucrose. What does it mean? 
all these percentages which will be given here, they'll be weighed by volume percentage, right? Now, guys, you can easily, I mean, decode this statement. What does it mean? 4%. It means 4 grams, 4 grams of sucrose are present in 100 ml of solution. Similarly, organic substance, it is weighed by volume is 3%. That means 3 grams of organic substance is present in 100 ml of solution. Can you solve it accordingly, guys? Can you solve it accordingly? Can it be done? It is just equate the osmotic pressures, right? Equate the osmotic pressures, you are done. Can it be solved? Hello, I'm giving you this question as the homework question. Do let me know its answer in the comment section at the end. Now, the most important topic, right? That is introduction to Van Hoff factor. That is introduction to Van Hoff factor. I think let's take a break for 10 to 15 minutes, then we'll start the Van Hoff factor, right? Okay, the time is uh, 23.59, but I want every one of you to be back because this is something which is very important, guys. You have to understand this properly. So session, I'll be resuming at, I'll be resuming at, 12.20. Okay? Be back on time. Every one of you. Be back on time. Okay? It will take, I think, it will take one and a half hour more. One and a half more, more it will take, that's it. But I want you guys to be back. Are you planning to be back or you will study this topic on your own? If you were not back, so then I'll be ending the session. Then this topic is your homework then. Okay, see you all then. See you all, see you all. See you all at 12.20.
Is everyone back? Yes, is everyone back? Right, people? <clears throat> yes, back to business, huh? Back to business. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Sahana, no need. It's completely your choice whether you want to join now or not. Okay, so let's complete the last topic. <clears throat> let's complete the last topic of the session that is the Van Hoff factor. This is again one very important topic, guys. Okay, and this might. I mean, a lot of students, they find it confusing, right? So I'll try to decode it from the complete basics itself. Yeah? <clears throat> okay. So first of all, what this Van Hoff factor is all about, why this Van Hoff factor is introduced, right? What was the need for this particular Van Hoff factor? Everything we are going to discuss in detail. Okay. First of all, before understanding this Van Hoff factor, till now, if you remember, we have discussed four colligative properties. One was your relative lowering in vapor pressure. And as per the formula, it is P0 minus PS divided by P0 is equal to mole fraction of solute, mole fraction of non-volatile solute. Okay, this was the first colligative property which we have discussed. Second one was elevation in boiling point, which was delta TB. As per the formula, it used to be Kb multiplied by M, molality of the solution. The next one was depression in freezing point, right? Which was basically your delta Tf that used to be equal to Kf multiplied by M. And at the end, it was the osmotic pressure, right? Osmotic pressure, pi, which is equal to C multiplied by R multiplied by T, where C is the concentration of the solution, right? So till now we have discussed four colligative properties. Guys, if you, if you have a look on all these formulas, this is chi B, mole fraction of solute, moles of solute divided by total moles present in the solution. If you elaborate all the formulas, you will understand one thing. See, first of all, first of all, this particular term, it is a colligative property. This particular term, it is a colligative property. This one is a colligative property. Even this one is a colligative property, right? If you elaborate their formulas, what you'll observe, you'll observe in all the colligative properties, what you will see, you will see all the colligative properties are inversely proportional to molar mass of solute. All the colligative properties you'll find inversely proportional to molar mass of solute. For example, if I take the last one, for example, if I, if I take the last one, your pi is equal to CRT, right? So pi is equal to, so what is C basically? Concentration, molarity, number of moles of solute, number of moles of solute, divided by volume of solution in liters, volume of solution in liters, and this is R, this is T, right? If you further want to elaborate it, number of moles of solute can be written as mass of solute in grams, divided by, Molar mass of solute, correct? In the denominator already, you have got volume of solution in liters. In the numerator, there is R and there is T, correct? As you can see, this osmotic pressure and this molar mass of solute, are they directly proportional or inversely? They are inversely proportional. They are inversely proportional. So my dear students, if all these are inversely proportional, if all these are inversely proportional, whatever, whatever, whatever colligative property you take out of these four, Right? 
all these colligative properties, you'll find one thing, all these colligative properties are inversely proportional to the molar mass of solute. All these colligative properties are inversely proportional to molar mass of solute. Whatever colligative property you take, you'll find the same observation. Colligative properties, they are inversely proportional to what? Molar mass of solute. This is one point which I want you guys to take a note of. Correct? Number one. Number two, guys. Number two. Try to understand what exactly I'm going to say. <clears throat> try to understand what exactly I'm going to say. Let me tell you, we have exactly got two ways to calculate the value of the colligative properties. We have got two ways to calculate the colligative properties, be it any colligative property. Two ways are there. One is, one is, one is you will carry out cert certain experiments, right? One is you will carry out certain experiments by means of which you will calculate the observed value of colligative property. You will call it as at the observed, observed value of colligative property or you can call it as the experimental value of colligative property. This is the first way. Perfect. You will carry out certain experiments and by the experiments, you will get to know the value of any colligative property. For example, I need to calculate relative lowering in vapor pressure. I've got two ways to calculate relative lowering. Either experimentally, either experimentally and whenever I calculate it experimentally, whenever I calculate it experimentally, I'll be calling the value of the colligative property as the observed value of colligative property. Understand again what I'm saying. Understand again what I'm saying. I have got two ways to calculate the value of colligative properties. For example, I need to calculate elevation and boiling point. There are two ways by means of which I can calculate elevation and boiling point. Number one, I can do some experiment and calculate the value of elevation and boiling point. That elevation and boiling point which I calculate with the help of experiments, that is something which I call as observed value of elevation and boiling point. I hope you're getting it. Right? Now, there is one more way of calculating the colligative property. That is with the help of these results. That is with the help of these results. Right? Whenever you use these results to calculate the value of colligative properties, you call that particular value as the colligative property calculated or you call it as the theoretical. Colligative property theoretical. You call it as the colligative property theoretical, right? So basically, again, I'm repeating the same thing because this is something which is super important. Every colligative property can be calculated by two ways. One is with the help of experiments, when you use the experiment, when you do the experiment and calculate the colligative property, that colligative property which is calculated with the help of experiment is called as, is called as observed value of colligative property or experimental value. In the similar way, if you use the formulas to calculate the colligative property, you call them directly as calculated colligative property or theoretical colligative property, right? Perfect. Now guys, as I told you a few minutes back, your colligative properties, they are inversely proportional to molar mass of solute. They are inversely proportional to molar mass of solute. This is point number one. Point number two, which you need to understand. Point number two, which you need to understand. For example, <clears throat> for example, I'm taking two containers over here. This is container number one. This is container number two. These are two containers which I have. Okay, two containers. Assume that in this particular container, I have got, for example, 100 ml of solvent. Or for example, let me take, let me take 100 ml of water as the solvent. In this particular container also, what I'm doing exactly, I'm keeping 100 ml of solvent. For example, 100 ml of water. Perfect. In both the containers, I'm keeping 100 ml of water. Now, for example, people, imagine I'm introducing one particle of urea. Imagine I'm introducing one particle of urea over here. As you know, your urea is a non-volatile solute. In the second container, what I'm, assume, what I'm doing exactly, I'm introducing one particle of NaCl. I'm introducing one particle of NaCl, which is again a non-volatile solute. Right? 
what will happen since you are introducing a non volatile solute in a pure volatile liquid in a pure volatile solvent what will happen there will be relative lowering in vapor pressure there will be elevation in boiling point there will be depression in freezing point right perfect now my dear students if you look at the first scenario if i want to calculate the value of for example elevation in boiling point that's a colligative property how many ways i have to calculate the value of elevation in boiling point i've got two ways either i can do some experiment or i can calculate it with the help of formula so basically i have got two ways to calculate the colligative properties one will be one will be observed colligative property which is which is done which is calculated with the help of experiments one is one is theoretical or you can call it as the calculated value of colligative property perfect imagine in this particular scenario i need to calculate elevation in boiling point i can calculate elevation in boiling point through experiment or i can calculate elevation in boiling point through the formula or for example let's say i need to calculate relative lowering in vapor pressure i can calculate it with the help of experiment or i can calculate it with the help of formula perfect similarly in the second scenario let's say i need to calculate the colligative property one i can do with the help of with the help of experiment which is called as observed and i can calculate the same thing with the help of formula which i call as calculated correct what you will observe my dear students you will observe in the first scenario the observed value of colligative property will be same as that of calculated value of colligative property but in the second case you will not observe the same the observed value of colligative property will be different than that of calculated why is that why is that why in the second case these two things came out to be different why in the second case these two things came out to be different see guys you can understand it like this urea is a solute that neither dissociates nor associates it is a solute which neither dissociates nor associates so i have taken one particle i have introduced this one particle into this liquid right so basically basically i have introduced one particle over here in the second case i was expecting i was thinking that i had introduced one particle but you know when nacl gets into water it dissociates as an a positive plus cl negative it dissociates as an a positive plus cl negative it dissociates as an a positive plus cl negative so whatever i was i was expecting that i have introduced one particle over here perfect but the same nacl it dissociates into two particles basically it dissociates into two particles what is the colligative property that property of the solution which depends on number of particles of solute so i was expecting that i i was imagining right i was considering that i have introduced one particle but in reality it got converted into two particles so whatever colligative property i was expecting with the help of formula will it be same when you see the scenario experimentally they'll be different because the value of calculated colligative property will come due to one particle but in reality that one particle got dissociated into two particles right so so experimentally actually the value of colligative property here will be due to two particles correct that is the reason why here why here the calculated and observed colligative property comes out to be different yes right is this clear is this point clear to you let me know once in the chats let me make it little more simple for you let me make little more simple for you see this particular value this calculate value of colligative property we calculate with the help of what with the help of the formula this one is calculated experimentally perfect now what i have done over here i have introduced nacl after introducing one particle of nacl i have calculated the value of any colligative property with the help of formula i got some value now i am seeing the same solution in the lab and trying to calculate its colligative property experimentally which i am calling as colligative property observed now i am finding these two are coming out to be different what is the logic what is the reason the reason is i did not take into consideration that this one particle will break into two particles i did not take into consideration but when we saw it experimentally when you saw it experimentally when you analyzed it experimentally 
this one particle has got dissociated into two particles right so i can say in reality the number of particles of solute they have increased and colligative property depends on number of particles of solute right colligative property depends on the number of particles of solute so in reality the value of colligative property will come out to be due to two particles but i had considered only one particle that is the reason why these two are coming out to be different why here these two are not coming out to be different because it neither dissociates nor associates i had introduced one particle right perfect after introducing one particle of uh, this urea i calculated any colligative property perfect i got some value now i analyze the same solution experimentally i got the same thing i got the same value perfect because it neither dissociates nor associates perfect it neither dissociates nor associates here here it is getting dissociated it is getting dissociated so for those for those solutes which we introduce into the solution which we introduce into the solvent if the solute dissociates or associates the value of the observed and calculated colligate property it comes out to be different right perfect those solutes which either dissociates into solvent or associates into solvent for them the observed and calculated value of colligative properties comes out to be different that is the reason why in this particular case they came out to be different now people since they came out to be different since they came out to be different now if i if i if i want to equalize left hand side and right hand side right now they are not equal but if i want to make them equal in order to make them equal i'll be introducing a factor over here which i represent with i just to make lh side and rh side equal and this factor which we are introducing to make observed and calculated colligative properties equal right this factor is something which is what you call as van t hoff's factor so how do i define the van t hoff's factor i i is equal to observed value of colligative property divided by calculated value of colligative property perfect i hope you got to know why this concept of van t hoff factor was introduced yeah perfect right guys so i can say your van t hoff factor i is basically equaled it is basically equaled observed value of colligative property divided by calculated value of colligative property perfect perfect okay if i ask you one simple thing over here if i ask you one simple thing over here see all these formulas which we got whether you will be getting correct result always from these formulas tell me that whether you will be getting correct result from these formulas always no if the solute dissociates or associates if the solute dissociates or associates the value which you get by solving these formulas that will be different than experimental that will be different than experimental so from these formulas i won't be always getting the correct value of i won't be always getting the correct value of actual value of colligative properties right so in order to get the actual value of colligative properties from these formulas itself i have to multiply by the factor i over here after multiplying by a factor i now i can say that from here i'll be getting the exact actual colligative property values yes right is this clear to everyone is this clear to everyone i hope you got to know what was the need what was the need to introduce this van t hoff factor so that we always get the exact the correct value of colligative properties with the help of these formulas yeah clear to everyone now tell me one thing tell me one thing till now i told you few few things let me summarize them let me summarize them first thing i told you colligative property is inversely proportional to molar mass of solute number 1 correct number 2 i told you number 2 i told you your van t hoff factor your van t hoff factor it is equal to observed value of colligative property divided by calculated value of colligative property correct 
if colligative property is inversely proportional to molar mass of solute can i say can i say colligative property observed divided by colligative property calculated will be equaled in terms of first relation can i say it will be equaled molar mass of solute that is calculated divided by molar mass of solute that's observed right is this particular statement clear to you is this particular statement clear to you is this particular statement clear to you yeah i is equal to mc divided by m not because your colligative property that's inversely proportional to molar mass of solute right inversely proportional inversely proportional i hope this particular statement is again clear to you yeah now tell me one thing tell me one thing that solute which neither dissociates nor associates i'm calling that as non electrolyte if you have got a non electrolyte the solute which is non electrolyte which neither dissociates nor associates tell me for that particular solute what will be the value of van't hoff factor i i which neither dissociates nor associates so calculate and observe will be same i value will be equal to 1 i value will be equal to 1 correct i value will be equal to 1 now tell me one thing that particular solute that particular electrolyte which dissociates if the electrolyte dissociates i value will it be equal to 1 greater than 1 or less than 1 you tell me in the chat what do you think that particular solute which dissociates which dissociates that means in reality you get more particles right and colligative property depends on particles more the particles more the value of colligative property right right people so observed value of colligative property at that time i'll say observed value of colligative property at that time will be greater than what will be greater than that of calculated perfect which clearly tells you that i value will be greater than 1 because it is the division of 2 if numerator is more then denominator i value will be greater than 1 yes now if you'll be having that electrolyte which associates which associates that electrolyte which associates into the solvent for that colligative property observed will be less than that of colligative property calculated so i value here will be less than 1 if you have got the solute which associates for example you have got a solute which dimerizes so you are introducing two particles of solute and you are expecting the value of colligative property will be there of two part will be there due to two particles but in reality it associates into one particle right so number of particles in the solution are decreasing i was expecting that i was introducing two particles but in reality it is becoming one particle so calculated value of colligative property will be less than that of what will be less than that of the observed value of colligative property due to the reason why i value will be less than one here so do remember that particular non electrolyte i value is 1 here it's greater than 1 here it is less than 1 i believe it's clear i believe it's clear prachi english channel english isliye english bolna padta hai theek hai channel ka naam bada karo pehle clear guys is it clear properly So these are the few things which you need to remember. These are the few things which you need to remember. Okay. Perfect. Say yes or no in the chats, then I can move ahead. Now guys, try to understand few more things. What are those few more things? Have a look. That electrolyte which undergoes dissociation. That electrolyte which undergoes dissociation. How do I calculate Van Hoff factor for that particular electrolyte? Have a look. How do I calculate? I'm giving you direct result and I'll show you how to apply it. I'm not deriving the result here. Okay. See, for example, I've got the electrolyte like this. An is it gives n times a stoichiometric coefficient here is 1 here the stoichiometric coefficient is n and i'm assuming n value 
I'm assuming n value is greater than one. If n value is greater than one, so consider it as two. So one particle is giving two particles. From one particle, you are getting two particles, right? Or from one particle, you'll be getting three particles. From one particle, you'll be getting four particles. Let's say you've got a solute which is undergoing dissociation. So this solute in the solvent is basically undergoing dissociation. Correct? It is undergoing dissociation. How do I calculate its Van't Hoff factor? I will be equal to 1 plus n minus 1 multiplied by alpha, where alpha is the degree of dissociation of this particular solute. Right? This is one of the results which you need to remember and it is valid only in case of dissociation. Whenever you'll be having a solute which undergoes association, which undergoes association, whenever you have got a solute which undergoes association, for example, you have got Na, it gives An. Toy geometry coefficient here is N, here it is 1. I'm assuming N value is greater than 1. So imagine N value is 2. So two particles of A are giving one particle. Three particles will be giving one particle. Four particles will be giving one particle. So more than one particles are assembling and giving one particle. So this is the case of association. And this alpha over here, I'm calling as degree of association. How do I calculate Van't Hoff factor in this particular case? I will be equal to 1 plus 1 divided by n minus 1 into alpha. This is the result which you have to remember. To calculate what? To calculate I when the solute undergoes association. When the solute undergoes association. Perfect. Right guys, I hope these things are absolutely clear to you. Right? Before doing the questions, before doing the questions, there are a few more things which you need to remember. See guys, for example, if I talk about, if I talk about elevation in boiling point, delta Tb, in reality, delta Tb is I multiplied by Kb multiplied by M. Correct? Yes. And what is this delta Tb? Delta Tb is elevation in boiling point, which is boiling point of solution minus boiling point of solvent. Minus boiling point of solvent. Correct? Do you see delta Tb is directly proportional to I? Yes, it is directly proportional to I. Delta Tb is directly proportional to I. Yeah? Do you agree with that? It is directly proportional to I over here. Let's say I have got that solute which dissociates. Let's say I have got that solute which dissociates. Perfect. For that, I'll say delta Tb will be directly proportional to I. And for that, I will be directly proportional to N. Number of ions which are generated in the solution. Perfect. So if Van't Hoff factor for the electrolyte is more, delta Tb is more. If delta Tb is more, the difference between them is more. And when can be the difference between them more? more when, when boiling point of the solution will be more. When boiling point of the solution will be more. Right? So do remember one simple thing. When the electrolyte undergoes dissociation, at that point of time, the boiling point of the solution, boiling point of the solution is directly proportional to the Van't Hoff factor. Or you can say, it is directly proportional to what? the number of ions generated if the concentrations are kept same right over here i'm mentioning same concentration same concentration what is the meaning of this where do we use this particular statement that is something which i'll let you know in some time that's something which i'll let you know in some time similarly if i talk about freezing point if i talk about freezing point if I talk about freezing point, you know your delta Tf is equal to I multiplied by Kf multiplied by M, which is equal to freezing point of freezing point of solvent minus freezing point of solution. Freezing point of solution, correct? Let's say I have taken that electrolyte which undergoes dissociation, which undergoes dissociation, right? I'll say delta Tf. I'll say delta Tf is directly proportional to I, right? Perfect. Is directly proportional to I. 
and I is directly proportional to the number of ions generated. So more the I, more delta TF. More I, more delta TF. More I, more delta TF. More delta TF means more is the difference between the two. When can be difference between the two more? If freezing point of the solution is less. If freezing point of the solution is less. So do remember one simple thing. Your freezing point of solution is inversely proportional to Van Hoff factor, right? When you have used the electrolyte which undergoes dissociation. Yeah? Perfect. Perfect, guys. And this is also valid when the concentration is kept same. What is meant by the same concentration, you'll get the idea in some time. But before that, before solving those sort of questions which are based on these statements, let me show you some basic questions. Let me show you some basic questions so that you can properly interpret all these things. So I hope all these things are absolutely clear, right? All these things we have discussed in detail. Now, it is the time to do some questions which will make you understand all these things in detail. Have a look on this particular question. The values of observed and calculated molecular weights of AgNO3 are this and this. Calculate degree of dissociation of AgNO3. First of all, tell me one thing. How AgNO3 undergoes dissociation? How this AgNO3 will undergo dissociation? I have to calculate degree of dissociation, right? How AgNO3 would have undergone dissociation? Ag positive plus NO3 negative. Right? So first of all, is, is this the case of dissociation? Absolutely. One particle is giving two particles, so n value is 2. One particle is giving two particles, so n value here is 2. From one particle, you are getting two particles, right? Now, my dear students, what do I have to calculate? I have to calculate alpha, degree of dissociation. I have to calculate degree of dissociation. First of all, I have told you already how to calculate I. There was one formula which is m calculated divided by m observed. What is m calculated? M calculated is 170 and M observed is how much? 92.64. Can you solve this and let me know the exact value which you'll be getting after solving this? Can you let me know quickly? I believe it will be 1.9 or 1.8, something like that. So you got the I value, which was understood because we know in case of dissociation, I value is always greater than 1, right? Yeah. Now people, try to understand one more thing. You got the I value. Since it's the case of dissociation, instead of I, I can write 1 plus n minus 1 into alpha is equal to 1.9. So I can write 1 plus or leave 1 aside. Take 1 on that side. n minus 1. n is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. So alpha is equal to 1.9 minus 1 comes out to be 0 0.9. This is something which you are supposed to calculate. The value of alpha. And you have calculated it. You have calculated it. I'm giving the approximate value. Okay. This approximate 1.9. Yeah, this is approximate. This is not exact. A lot of people are saying the value is coming out to be 1.83. If the value is coming out to be 1.83, then alpha will be 0 0.83. Right? I hope this is clear. I hope this particular question is clear to you. All right. Look at this particular question. Look at this particular question. Look at this particular question. Carefully solve this. See, it looks difficult because there is something degree of hydrolysis, etc, etc, that's given. Some molarity is given, right? Volume is somewhere given. This is all just to confuse you, nothing else. Just to confuse you. We have to calculate Van Hoff factor for NH4Cl. Tell me how this NH4Cl undergoes dissociation. It will undergo dissociation like this. NH4 positive plus Cl negative. One particle is giving two particles, so N value is equal to two. Now, how do you calculate I? I is equal to 1 plus N minus 1 into alpha. Correct? Right? Now, I we have to calculate, right? I is equal to 1 plus N values 2 minus 1 and alpha is given to me as 0 0.8 and nothing else we need to do. So, the value directly comes out to be 1.8. So, all the parameters which were given in the question, they were just given to, to confuse you, nothing else. Right? They were just given to confuse you. Okay. Let's have a look on one more. A millimolar solution of potassium ferricyanide 
a millimolar solution of what? Potassium ferrous cyanide. Is 70% dissociated. 70% dissociated means alpha value 0.7. Right? Find the osmotic pressure at 27 degrees centigrade in ATM. First of all, how this K3, Fe, Cn6 will undergo dissociation? You tell me that. It will be 3 times K positive plus Fe, Cn6 tri negative. Right? Now, one particle is giving 3 plus, 3 plus 1, 4 particles. So, n value over here is 4. Perfect. If n is 4, can, can I calculate i? i will be 1 plus n minus 1 into alpha. Right? Which will be 1 plus n values 4 minus 1. Alpha is how much? 0 0.7. So, 3, 7, 21. So, it is 3.1. So, you got the Vanto factor. You got the Vanto factor, right? You got the Vanto factor. After getting the Vanto factor, we have to calculate osmotic pressure. Pi is equal to I multiplied by C R T, right? So pi we have to calculate. I value already we have gotten 3.1. Concentration. Concentration is given millimolar. That means 10 raised power minus 3 molar. Right? We have to calculate osmotic pressure in ATM. So the value of R has to be taken as 0 0.0821 ATM liter per Kelvin per mole. Temperature is how much? 27 degrees centigrade, which is 300 Kelvin. Solve this and get the answer exactly in ATM, in atmosphere. I believe this is again clear to everyone. Yeah? Perfect. Yes, Nathan, you can do that. You can do that. So these sort of questions you can solve like this. Let's see if some more questions. Let's see some more questions. Let's see some more questions. Look at this particular question. Let's see what exactly it means. Acetic acid dimerizes in benzene. Acetic acid dimerizes in benzene. That means two acetic acid molecules, two acetic acid molecules, right? They are dimerizing. They are dimerizing. So two particles are associating and forming one particle. And in case of association, in case of association, the number of particles associating to form one particle, that gives you the value of n. This is the case of association n values 2. Correct? n values 2. So, first thing, what do we have to calculate? Acetic acid dimerized in benzene to form a solution. When this, this, this is dissolved in this, boiling point raised by 0 0.36 degree, calculate I and alpha. All right. So, first of all, delta Tb. It is based on elevation in boiling point. Delta Tb is equal to I multiplied by Kb multiplied by m. Correct? I multiplied by Kb multiplied by m. Okay? I think there is one thing that is missing in the question that is the value of KB. Yes, the value of KB should be given. The value of KB should be given in the question. Let me check the value of KB in the question exactly. Just a second, people. Just a second. Yes, KB is equal to KB is given in the question as 2.57. Right? KB is given as 2.57. Now, first of all, delta TB, that is the elevation in boiling point. How much the boiling point has raised? 0 0.36 degree. So, elevation in boiling point is 0 0.36 is the quote I multiplied by. What is KB? KB is 2.57. Molality. Molality is the quote mass of solute. Mass of solute is 1.65 grams multiplied by 1000. Divided by molar mass of solute, molar mass of acetic acid, which will be 60, multiplied by mass of solvent, mass of solvent, benzene, 100 grams. So from this particular expression, you can get the value of I. From this particular expression, you can get the value of I. Once you get the I value, uh, Laharika is saying I value is equal to 1.65. Okay, Chalo, I believe you. I value is equal to 1.65. All right. If I value is equal to 1.65, then I, then in order to calculate alpha, 
सिंस इट इज अ केस ऑफ एसोसिएशन इन केस ऑफ एसोसिएशन आई इज इक्वल वन प्लस वन डिवाइड बाई एन माइनस वन इंटू अल्फा राइट तो आई वैल्यू वी हैव कैलकुलेटेड वन पॉइंट सिक्स फाइव इज इक्वल टू वन प्लस वन डिवाइड बाई एन वैल्यूज टू माइनस वन मल्टीप्लाइड बाई अल्फा फ्रॉम हेयर यू कैन इजिली कैलकुलेट अल्फा विच इज अ डिग्री ऑफ एसोसिएशन तो दीज बाई द टू थिंग्स विच वेर सपोज टू बी कैलकुलेटेड राइट These were two things which were sub. By the way, I value won't be 1.65. This is the case of association. In case of association, I value will be less than one, right? I value will be less than one. So find the exact value of I, which will be absolutely less than one, and put that value of I over here, right? And get the value of alpha. Yeah. Perfect. Right, people. Okay. Look at one more question. Look at one more question. Look at one more question. We have got two solutions. One is potassium iodide solution. One is sucrose solution. Well, sucrose it is a non-electrolyte. It neither dissociates nor associates, right? It neither dissociates nor associates. Potassium iodide. Potassium iodide will dissociate for sure into what? K positive plus I negative. So here n value is equal to two. Here n value is equal to two. Sucrose it doesn't it. It neither associates nor dissociates, right? It neither associates nor dissociates. Both are having same concentration, zero point one molar hair, zero point one molar hair. Both are having same concentration, right? We are given with their osmotic pressures as well. Osmotic pressures as well, right? Pi for potassium iodide is given to me as is given to me as zero point four six atm. And pi for sucrose. This is given to me as zero point two four five eight again. Correct? They have got same osmotic pressure. Sorry, they have not same osmotic pressure. They have got. They have got what? I mean, their osmotic pressures are given. Their osmotic pressures are given. Find the value of I and alpha for K I. Can you do it? Can you do this question? Can you do this question? Can you do this question? One thing which I would want to add over here, assuming temperature of both the solutions to be same, right? Assuming temperature and assuming temperature of both the solutions to be same. Now, if I talk about pi for Ki, pi for Ki is equal to C R and T. Correct. Pi is equal to C R N T. And people, pi for sucrose is given to me as zero point two four five. Ah, uh, just a second, just a second. Pi for sucrose is going to be equal to. Sorry, this is I multiplied. This is I for potassium iodide multiplied by C R T. This will be I for sucrose multiplied by C R N T. Perfect. no if i divide these two equations it's going to be pi for potassium iodide divided by pi for sucrose will be equal to i for potassium iodide divided by i for sucrose that's one correct rest all the other things will get cancelled because c is same r is same t is same okay well people from this particular expression what do i get i'll be getting i for potassium iodide is equal to pi for ki divided by pi for sucrose what is pi for ki Pi for K is zero point four six. Pi for sucrose is zero point two four five. Right? From here you'll be getting the value how much? Approximately zero point two something. No. How much is the value exactly? Approximately it'll be. It'll be one point something, one point eight something. Yeah. How much will be the value exactly? One point eight. So you got the first question. The I value, which is one point eight. If you got the I value, since you have to calculate alpha for this potassium iodide as well, since in case of dissociation I is equal to one plus n minus one into alpha, I value for potassium iodide is one point eight is equal to one plus n value is two minus one into alpha. So alpha value will come out to be zero point eight. Okay. So alpha for potassium iodide came out to be zero point eight. This sort of a question again you should be able to solve. Okay. One more type of the question. 
look at these four scenarios 0.1 molar urea 0.1 molar this 0.1 molar this 0.2 so concentration everywhere is same so leave the concentration part aside i want you guys to arrange them on the basis of their boiling points i want you guys to arrange them on the basis of their boiling points will you be able to do will you be able to arrange them on the basis of their boiling points you should be in a position to arrange them you should be see Van't Hoff factor for urea is one. Imagine hundred percent dissociation. Its Van't Hoff factor I will be equal. It will be giving three plus two five ions. This will be giving three ions. This will be giving two ions. Few minutes back only we have discussed. Few minutes back only we have discussed. Few minutes back only we have discussed. I've given you one simple statement. When the electrolyte undergoes dissociation at that point of time, I is directly proportional to boiling point of the solution. So more the ions generated, more is the boiling point. So maximum boiling point will be for B, followed by what? B will have maximum boiling point, followed by your C, followed by your D, and followed by your A. Followed by your A. This is the order of the boiling points, right? This is the order of the boiling point. So more the ions getting generated, right? More the elevation in boiling point. More the elevation in boiling point means more is the boiling point of the solution. Few minutes back only we have discussed when the concentration is same. When the concentration is same at that point of time, if you remove this particular slide, just have a look. Just have a look. This particular slide I am talking about. Boiling point of the solution is directly proportional to I, directly proportional to N in case of the electrolyte which undergoes dissociation. Right? Yeah? Similarly, people. Similarly, if you look at one more case, here the concentrations are different. Here the concentration was different. When the concentrations are different, at that point of time, you have to see I multiplied by C value. More the I multiplied by C value, you have to see I multiplied by C value. Vanto factor multiplied by concentration. I multiplied by C value, you have to see here. Right? And let me tell you, more the I multiplied by C value, do remember, more is going to be the elevation in boiling point. More is going to be the elevation in boiling point and if elevation in boiling point is more, what does that mean? That means TB solution, boiling point of solution minus boiling point of solvent is more. Right? When can be this term more? This term will be more only when boiling point of the solution will be more. So basically more the IC value, more will be the boiling point of solution. This answer of this question you can let me know in the charts. Arrange them on the base of their boiling points. Okay? Arrange them on the base of their boiling points. Similarly, questions can be asked based on the freezing points as well. And when the solute undergoes dissociation, at that point of time, freezing point of solution. Freezing point of solution. See, it is simple. You know, delta Tf is directly proportional to Van Hoff factor. And Van Hoff factor is directly proportional to number of ions. Right? Van Hoff factor is directly proportional to number of ions which gets generated during dissociation. Correct? So more the ions produced during dissociation, more is going to be the delta Tf. Delta Tf means freezing point of solvent minus freezing point of solution, right? More ions generated means more uh, depression freezing point. That means more is the difference between these two, right? When can be difference between these two more? When freezing point of the solution will be less, correct? So you can understand it like this. You can understand it like this. Freezing point of the solution here in case of dissociation will be inversely proportional to the Van Hoff factor or you can say the number of ions generated. This is correct for dissociation when the concentrations are same. When the concentrations are same. And if the concentrations are different, then you have to see I multiplied by C value. Right? So at that time, I multiplied by C will be inversely proportional to freezing point of solution. I multiplied by C will be inversely proportional to freezing point of solution. Right? And your in case of different concentration, I multiplied by C will be directly proportional to boiling point of solution. Right? I'm talking about the dissociation cases. Perfect. Sir, how did you find the I value for Na2SO3? It is Na2SO3, right? How does it dissociate? Two times Na positive plus SO3 di negative, right? So imagine 100% dissociation. So one particle is giving 2 plus 1, 3. So n value is equal to 3. I value will be 1 plus 
P minus 1 into alpha. So 2 plus 1 is 3. Correct? That's how I did it. Perfect. And people, with this, with this, your chapter solution is done and dusted. So these points are valid when the concentrations are given same and they are valid for dissociation purpose, right? When the electrolyte undergoes dissociation. If the concentration is different, then I multiplied by C value you have to check. Then, then instead of I here, you'll be writing IC. Then instead of I here, you'll be writing IC. Okay? Perfect. So with this, your one more chapter bites the dust. Right? I hope you got this chapter properly. Is it clear guys? Is it completely clear? Tell me in the chats quickly. All the things are completely clear. I hope whatever we have discussed today, I hope you remember all the things, right? I hope you remember all the things. I hope these sort of questions you can easily solve, yeah? These sort of questions you can easily solve now and these sort of questions are frequently asked guys. So you have to check the dissociation part, more the ions, right? More the ions, more is going to be elevation and boiling point, more is going to be the pressure and freezing point, more is going to be the relative lowering of vapor pressure, right? More is going to be the osmotic pressure because all the colligative properties, they are directly proportional to your Vanto factor, right? When the electrolyte undergoes dissociation. Uh, next chapter, oh, I think it is either going to be isomerism, either I'll be doing isomerism, the next chapter or thermodynamics or kinetics or ionic equilibrium, I'll see, I'll see, right, I'll see. Hello, do let me know in the comment section of this particular video, how you exactly liked it, was it beneficial or not, yeah, hello, take care guys, God bless you all, see you. See you guys, take care.